Block 1, Audiobook Title, Manifest Fantasy, Version 1, 01 to 53, by D. R. Doriazan. This work belongs to author D. R. Doriazan, Seuss, Wattpad.com. HTTPS colon slash slash www.wattpad.com slash story slash 22503 Manifest Fantasy Version 1, Chapter 1, Prologue. Author's Note. I will be completely rewriting this story in the future. Unfortunately, I don't have an expected time frame for this. If you want something much more professional, see Summoning America, my other work. Manifest Fantasy is my very first attempt at writing, so the quality is not on par with that of my current work in C. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw. Captain Henry Doniger opened his eyes to find himself standing up, facing a door. He looked around. The room was small, without any decorations or furniture. The only thing that stood out from the gray walls of the room were the light bulb overhead and the blood red door ahead. He walked toward the door and opened it. He emerged on the other side into a vast throne room. The tapestries that adorned the dark walls all bore a simple yet elegant insignia. Five white stars upon a blue flag, arranged in a chevron formation. Sitting on the throne was a man obscured in darkness. The man stood, having noticed Doniger, and walked to him. As he got closer, it seemed as if the light around him dimmed, as if the man was emanating darkness. Doniger frowned, unnerved by the dark undertones of this place. The two men stood face to face. Doniger stared into the face of the man, or rather where he believed its face should be. Although he couldn't tell for certain, he felt the mysterious being's gaze piercing into his eyes. Then, it spoke. You have doomed us all. The man pointed his finger. Following its direction, Doniger turned around to see that the door behind him was no longer. Instead, it was replaced by a window. He walked to it and stared into the cityscape beyond. He recognized this place. It was Manhattan. He looked down and saw Central Park. Slightly to the left, he identified a set of residential complexes. That's where he grew up. Puzzled by this vision, he turned to the man behind him. Why are you showing me this? The mysterious figure remained silent, giving nothing at all in response to his question. After a few seconds, he returned to the window. The scene changed. He was no longer in Manhattan, not was he in a skyscraper. He stared out of the window of a bombed-out building, seeing a large circular stadium. Donetsk. Donetsk. Ukraine was the site of his final mission before he was transferred to Area 51. Hearing the sound of a jet, he looked up into the sky, and Su-34 whizzed past before igniting into a ball of flame, a missile scoring a direct hit on its engines. Doniger remembered this. He took out several jets that were stolen from the Russian military by a rogue general, General Zhukov. His own jet flew overhead, an F-22 Raptor, which quickly disappeared out of sight. Within a minute, he saw it return. No. I put this in the past already. He turned around to demand answers from the man, but he was gone. He looked back toward the burning plane, which had just been hit and was now spiraling down, shrieking as it grew closer. It was going to crash in his building. He started running from the window, attempting to put distance between himself and the crashing jet, but it was too late. You didn't finish the mission, a harsh voice echoed seemingly coming from everywhere at once. Captain Henry Doniger opened his eyes to find himself on the floor, with the same mysterious man above him. He quickly got up and looked out of the window. It was Manhattan once again. This time, fires raged throughout the city, tracer rounds lighting up the twilight sky in the distance. The sky was dotted with squadrons of jets and helicopters. A unit from a formation flying right above him was hit and slammed into his old home. His eyes widened. He remained silent as the fighting raged on, until a crippled helicopter began falling toward his position. He turned back in order to run. This time, the man hadn't disappeared, and instead was beckoning him towards a shimmering portal. He could attempt to find this building's stairway, but there wouldn't be enough time for him to escape. The only way out was this shimmering portal. He ran to it and let himself be pulled into its event horizon. Captain Henry Doniger opened his eyes to find himself on his bed. He looked to his right. The clock read 5.55 a.m. He groaned, knowing he would have to go to work soon. As he initiated his morning routine, the thought of the dream lingered in his mind. North Grandin Plains, 40 miles from Fort Sewell, Sonaran Federation, continent of ENF, 
Planet Gay Era, 2 p.m. local time, month 5, day 17, year 237, by an interesting looking flag that depicted a multitude of stars upon a blue background. Two men converse with each other. The forces of the Nubian Empire will be converging on these grounds by daybreak tomorrow, Master Kalmethis. Are you certain your strategy will work? A man asked, his clothing defining him as someone of importance. Indeed, General. How are the beacons? The old wizard replied, sparing a glance at the field of obelisk-like constructs. They are ready to activate on your command. The mages are on standby to assist you. Kalmethis stroked his grand beard. Excellent. At the least, this plan should be able to delay long enough for reinforcements to reach the fort. The general nodded solemnly. I pray your sacrifice will not be in vain. May Sola's light guide you. And you as well. The two men concluded their conversation and directed their troops to rest as tomorrow will be a fateful day. Several nations were curious about Kalmethis plan's strategy. Consequently, observers watched from a camp nearly a mile away from the battlefield. Master Kalmethis, are you sure this will work? The enemy has a force of 20,000, including 200 wyvern riders. To reassure the general, Kalmethis explained the logic behind this magic. Truly. It matters not how many people I face. It only matters the volume of which is transported. As long as the enemy formation is not spread out tremendously, my spell can envelop and transport all of them. The general sighed, eyeing the few thousand brave soldiers under his command. Reinforcements are three days worth of travel away, and I fear we may not hold on for long. Kalmethis clutched his staff and smiled at the general, attempting to radiate confidence. Worry not, dear friend. I shall see to it that we so Nerans shine light upon these wretches. The dire situation posed by the oncoming enemy invasion resulted in desperation, and thus Kalmethis would cast a spell that the world has not seen for millennia. Kalmethis, noticing that his hand was shaking, drove his staff into the ground. With his chest held high and his beard majestically flowing in the wind, he closed his eyes, uttering a silent prayer to Sola. When he finished his prayer, he took time to survey his mages. They were prepared, calm, even. His rallying speech several days ago convinced them of an easy victory, and their assigned jobs required little more than channeling their magic energies one of the most simple of magical tasks. However, only Kalmethis and the Sonaran general knew of the truth. Unbeknownst to anyone else, Kalmethis was planning to replicate a lost art of magic recently rediscovered in a mildewing stack of ancient scrolls. This type of magic became lost for a good cause. It was incredibly risky, posing a magnitude of danger that could potentially threaten the existence of the entire world. In the face of possible annihilation, Kalmethis determined that this was a risk worth taking. After all, the other nations have been able to develop super weapons. Why couldn't the Sonarans? Month 5 Day 18. The peaceful silence of the plains was interrupted by the sound of marching, before coming to a halt. An army flying a black flag, with a silver crescent in the middle, stared eastward, toward the sight of multiple plumes of smoke originating from campfires. As the troops of this army began to establish a camp for the night, a man grabbed their attention. A gaunt man stood before his comrades, preparing to give a speech. His graying hair and wrinkles were in stark contrast to his youthful determination and overall physique. Tomorrow, we begin the first incursion into the Sonaran heartland. After almost a year of grueling battle with their tributaries, we shall finally bask in the glory we have long sought. Before dawn, we shall march on to their positions and annihilate the enemy, and open the floodgates for our torrential wrath. For Nubia, the general said, for Nubia, his soldiers echoed. As the Nubians marched toward the outnumbered defenders, Kalmethis began his incantations. The magical beacons he placed began to pulse with light, as his mages channeled their mana through to the master wizard. With an abundant supply of mana at his disposal, he was able to cast his spell surrounding himself and all of the enemy forces in a transparent purple bubble. The Nabian mages, sensing the powerful magics in the atmosphere, began to tremble. They realized what Kalmethis was attempting, causing goosebumps to form as they yelled at the enemy wizard. Quickly, brothers of Nabia, we must stop this fool before he undoes our progress. The Nabian soldiers closed the distance between them and Kalmethis as fast as they could with the Dragon Knights taking the lead. Despite their fearsome capabilities, the distance proved to be too vast, 
and Kelmathus was able to complete his incantation, Senorinimus Grinisus Traverium, upon his command. The bubble and everything enclosed within vanished. In the place of a bubble, a space-time anomaly that resembled a portal remained. Tumultuous winds rushed in to fill the vacuum that the spell left behind. Spectating the event, the Sonaran troops stared in awe, mouths agape at the incredible feat of arcane prowess. May Sola's light guide you, Master Kelmethus. It was an honor to serve alongside you, the Sonaran general whispered. Sir Mran Duberinia stood from his seat. Watching from the observer tent, he scanned the battlefield, from the Sonaran side to the Nabean side, or rather, what used to be the Nabean side. His eyes grew wide and his jaw dropped, incapable of fathoming the incredulous scene that had just occurred before him. Observers from other nations reacted similarly, although he was too stupefied to notice them. The spell was successful, and exceeded expectations so tremendously that the battlefield fell silent for nearly a minute men standing and looking around as if they had just woken up. Suddenly, the silence was broken by shouting and horns coming from Nibian command tents. The Nibian commanders, seeing their forces vanish, ordered a retreat for the remaining command staff. As they fled the scene, observers sent from various nations began to converse amongst each other. I have never seen such magic in my life. How is this possible? Sir Duberinia asked. A haughty man named Senior Mage Josac Callan, hailing from the Divinian Empire, replied, his eyes displaying a wisdom far surpassing that of most people. Ah, you Mechanese, your people are so ignorant in the history of magic. The man then paused, seeming to display fear before returning to his previous demeanor. I never anticipated any of the younger civilizations to come across such spellcasting, but it appears I am mistaken. Knowledge of spatial manipulation was sealed thousands of years ago. He shook his head and sighed. Are you familiar with the accents? The Mechanese observer shook his head. No. With your relatively recent arrival to this world, I suppose I understand. Several thousand years ago, humanity discovered how to influence space and time with magic. There are many variations of the story, but they all tell the same tale. Empires in search of riches and lands to conquer opened a portal into other lands, likely on different worlds. For a time, they rejoiced in their discoveries, endless resources and exotic species to enhance their palate. Medicine advanced with the application of new herbs and some nations had even begun to industrialize because of tremendous riches and advancement. Of course, that didn't last very long. Eventually they came across other conquerors much more powerful than they. These otherworldly conquerors came to be known as the Axon Empire, and spread from South Obag, nearly dominating the central continents. They wielded magical weapons beyond our understanding, but the gods of lore graced us with heroes who pushed them back into their own world. Since the banishment of the Axons, the knowledge of portal magic became forbidden, sealed away. Sir Duberinius scoffed. Evidently some scrolls managed to get away. Yes. Unfortunately, I pray that the accents are not able to somehow detect the magical signatures of these portals. I fear for their prophesied return, Alan muttered. Well, perhaps it is unlikely that they will return at all, Duberinia suggested. Surely the likelihood of the Sonarans opening a gateway into the realm of the banished empire is astronomically small. That isn't the issue. Such magic is traceable, and can lead the banished enemies back to our home. Imagine villages in the forest. There are many, but we cannot find them because of the dense vegetation. However, if one of these villages lights a fire, everyone in the surrounding area can see the smoke, and can locate the village. What the Sonarans just did is light up a signaling fire. Well, then why didn't you stop them? Alan nearly chuckled at the Mechanese man's ridiculous statement. Anticipating their use of long-lost magic is not something that can be foreseen. Duberinia nodded in understanding. Then, how long would it be before the banished empire returns? We can start preparing now. Alan gave the proposition some thought, tapping his chin as he spoke. It might be a futile endeavor if they have advanced more than our civilizations. Still, there is a possibility that they suffered greatly from the war, and have advanced at the same rate as us. The only difference now is that we do not have heroes to call upon. Sir Duberinia gave the Divinian a quizzical look. Do the gods not answer your offerings? The gods have not surfaced in centuries, nor have their heralds, unless a miracle is to surface. We face this new threat alone. Our rivalries must end here and now should we survive the coming ordeal. Duberinia smiled 
hiding his suspicions. And so we shall. Chapter 2, Turning the Tides. Author's Note, This is the first revision of Chapter 2. I have over doubled the length and added many more details regarding the initial Nabian incursion into Earth. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Somewhere in the Nevada desert 10 a.m. local time May 18, 2019 Henry looked down at the desert below as he banked his F-35A to the right Damn, it's real hot out here I can see the heat wave Man Trailing behind him Lieutenant Ron Owens responded Sure is Sir, makes me wish we were back in Germany. Yup. See that over there? Towards Bald Mountain? Henry angled his craft to get a better view of the shimmering, distorted view of the landscape. Ron followed Henry's plane in formation. Gotta be a mirage, sir. Henry shook his head. Well I've never seen a mirage look like that. I mean, we've only been here in the desert for a few months, but still. Maybe we should ask the base. Sir, could be that they've got some experiment down there. A small smile grew on Ron's face. Maybe they're finally testing out one of those alien ships, he said. Hey, is that an attempt at humor, Lieutenant? Perhaps, sir. Ho ho, I am proud of you Owens. I'll check in with command, Henry replied as he switched frequencies. Groom Lake Command, this is Valkyrie 1. We're seeing an unusual phenomenon toward Bald Mountain. Is there anything scheduled there? Valkyrie 1. Uh, I don't think there's anything planned for today near the mountain ranges. Let me go get some confirmation. Solid copy. We'll be on standby. Roger. While they waited for a reply from Area 51, Henry and Ron moved their jets in for a closer look. The spherical anomaly looked like a distortion of the environment, similar to a botched panorama. From the jet canopy, it was hard to see the distortion itself, but it was certainly moving, as if building up in intensity. The region shimmered glowing brighter as time passed. Groom Lake Command, this is Valkyrie 1. Do you read? Valk 1, again? Henry frowned, switching to internal comms. He said, what's going on with the comms? Ron shrugged and glanced at his canopy. If I had to guess, that thing down there's causing the interference. Henry nodded. Let's get closer to base and try again. With that, the two F-35s turned around and headed back toward Area 51, hoping to get a clearer signal. They turned on their afterburners, sensing the danger posed by the increasing intensity of the phenomena below. In a minute, their jets were clear of most interference and they received a communication from Area 51. Valkyrie, do you copy? The transmission was slightly garbled, but coherent. We read you, Groom Lake Command. What's going on? Sir, there is no scheduled experiment. The base is now on high alert and I've got some of the techs here along with General Harding. With all this interference, you won't be able to send us the data in your camera pods. Can you describe the situation? It's some sort of mirage ball. It's been getting brighter and Henry recoiled as his ears were filled with a sharp cracking noise. The heads-up display in the cockpit went offline, alongside most of the electronic controls, thankfully. Both he and Ron didn't lose control of their wings and fins, so they continued to glide. They angled their planes so that they could see Bald Mountain and noticed a bright flash of light over the valley in the area. Henry hurriedly activated his jet's electronic countermeasures. As his plane's systems rebooted, he stared in awe at the valley down below. Seemingly out of nowhere, a division's worth of metal-clad warriors appeared, bearing great resemblance to knights. The warriors stumbled around, visibly disoriented before quickly regaining their senses and rallying around a more ornately dressed individual. Dozens of dragons flew around the small army, each one carrying a knight. Suddenly, they looked up at him and with a hefty flap of their wings, soared upward to give chase to a strange new type of target. 4th Invasion Detachment, Nabian Army, 10 a.m. local time. Expert Nerlin was blinded by a light as he and his comrades were transported by Kalmethis. The transportation was disorienting. He staggered for a few seconds, his vision blurry and head dizzy. He knelt on the ground, regaining his focus as he looked around. His comrades were similarly dazed, some of them sprawled on the ground. Their wyverns and wyvern knights landed with minimal casualties, with most injuries sustained from crash landings. Nrillin curled his fist and stood up defiantly, fighting the feelings of dizziness. He casted a minor restoration spell on himself in order to collect his thoughts faster. As an expert-ranked wizard, 
He was the highest ranking mage in the Snobian force. He thus assumed the position of commanding officer. He grounded himself back to reality and went to check the body of Kalmethus. It appears he still has a heartbeat. He will most likely wake up within a few hours. An officer approached him. What shall we do with him? Sir, Merlin looked at the Sonaran wizard in disgust. He waved his hand dismissively and said, Leave him. We will be gone before he wakes, and he shall be stranded here. I laugh at the irony of his predicament. This barren land where there is nothing but the scorch of Sola will be his deathbed. Sola's light will indeed guide him to his demise. With Kalmathus unconscious, the Nibians began to reorganize and strategize. Merlin looked around. His forces were transported to a small mountain range in a vast desert. Damn it, he muttered. Is there no way back home? His thoughts were interrupted by a roaring that came from the skies. He looked up and spotted two peculiar objects, shaped somewhat like arrowheads. The sun's glare glinted off these objects as they flew about leaving a white trail. He commanded two wyvern knights to chase after the metal dragons, reasoning that the objects were of artificial origin and likely meant that there's civilization nearby. He then turned to face the rest of his men, who had organized themselves. Mages, we must survey the area. Cast clarity spells and report to me once you have discovered anything of interest. The mages convened and discussed their plans before creating ethereal birds and sending them in predetermined directions. After a few minutes of scouring the lands, Nerlin was informed that a group of mages discovered a strange town about 10 miles south, populated by metal beasts and strangely clothed men. Because of these metal beasts, they assumed the territory to be one of the Sonarans, with their famed sun forges. Sir, a mage reported, we have also taken notice of the flag design that is present throughout the site. The design does not match any of the known Sonaran member states, but shares the overall design choice of stars upon a blue background. Merlin tapped the ground with his boot. Maybe it is a design for one of their secret forces? Regardless, the utilization of stars upon a blue background is something no other state does, aside from the Sonaran Federation. Therefore, this village must also be treated as the enemy. He pointed in the direction of the discovered town. Send another party of summoned scouts, and glean as much information as possible. Soon enough, the Nabian mages determined that the town had about a thousand souls, so they pressed forth with the planned attack sourcing confidence from their numerical advantage. Skies above Area 51. Owens. Henry fidgeted with his helmet. Most of his plane's systems were operational again, except for communications. Owens. He called out again. A garbled transmission replied, Sir, comms are back, thank goodness. Owens. We have two bogies rising up to meet us. He analyzed the winged reptilians soaring upward. Dragons looks like. And the guys down below are also starting to move. We need to gun it back to base and report what's happening. Roger that, sir. Henry and Ron hit their afterburners, speeding off at speeds unimaginable to the surprised wyvern knights behind them. Despite the immense distance the two jets put between themselves and the anomaly, communications were still difficult to establish. Only when the jets were essentially on top of the base can they achieve a connection. Hurriedly. Henry informed the base of the incoming army. Outskirts of Area 51. Be wary of the metal contraptions. The Mechanese may have allowed the Sonarans to use some of their mechanical weapons. Merlin's orders were received by his forces through a magical channel created by the mages. Heeding his caution, they sent a couple of wyvern knights to scout the base and test the capabilities of their opponents. As the dragon knights approached, they heard a loud roar that split the skies. Paying attention to their flanks. They noticed that the two metal dragons from before had taken up a position near them, trailing them as a hunter would to a deer. The mysterious metal beasts matched their speed. They maintained their distance, but they were close enough for the knights to notice the humans sitting inside, much to their bewilderment. Sensing no hostility from the metal dragons and reasoning that they were too far to attack them, the knights pressed onward toward the base. As they approached, a slightly distorted but immensely loud voice thundered. This area is restricted by order of the United States military. Turn back now or you will be shot. Lanos looked to his partner. That doesn't sound like the Sonaran language. What could it mean? It's probably another Sonaran war chant. Lanos surmised. The dragon knights ventured further, trying to catch a glimpse of large dragon stables that house the metal dragons. Unfortunately, 
they ventured too far into restricted airspace. A Patriot missile system locked onto its targets and fired. Lanos, what's that light over there? It looks like an arrow. Evade. Eva. Lanos watched in horror as he caught a glimpse of the sizable metallic arrow that obliterated his partner. How? One question was all Lanos was able to contemplate before his ability to think was terminated by the unforgiving MIM-104 missile. Nerlin, seeing the explosions in the sky attempted to re-establish contact with his scouts. Sir, we cannot contact them. It's likely they were killed in those explosions. Nerlin could not fathom that a force as powerful as the Dragon Knight could be decimated so quickly, and seemingly with such ease. His subordinates couldn't believe it either, but their side told no lies. Nerlin shook his fist at the defenders. We must avenge them. Push in formation and leave no survivors. The orders were relayed by war horns and flags. As the Nabians approached the strange wall, they were again met with a thundering voice. Drop your weapons and surrender now. This is your final warning. The Nabians figured this was some sort of warning, but emboldened by their sheer numbers and history of victories. They pushed onward. Merlin raised his staff. All mages, initiate standard defensive shielding. A translucent bluish dome covered the attackers. The Nubians began to close the distance, pushing forth with a wedge formation. The same thundering voice now directed its messages toward the defenders, no longer content with providing warnings to the Nubians. Engage. About 200 meters from the fencing, flashes of light began to spark throughout the lines of the defenders emanating from their dark staffs. Grim expressions of realization plagued the charging Nubians as time seemed to stand still. The defenders were waiting for their moment to cull. Thunder filled the atmosphere as the Nubians faced a hail of lead. The Nubian shield was able to hold against about a hundred rounds before the kinetic energy of continuous impacts overpowered the defenses of the Nubians. The mages were almost depleted of mana and the bluish dome faltered, becoming more transparent. The mysterious defenders, Sensing victory, intensified their barrage as they started shooting large metal arrows and strange shapes that all exploded. Indeed, the Nubians faced 40 mm high explosive rounds, hand grenades, and rocket propelled grenades. The Nubian forces were torn apart. Shield bearers in the front of the formation died with looks of shock on their faces and holes strewn throughout their shields and armor. With their defenses gone, the Nubians charged. Archers let loose their volleys only to see the arrows harmlessly bounce off the metallic constructs of the defenders. The mages who hadn't collapsed from mana exhaustion were few and far between. They attempted to lob fireballs at the defending forces, but were quickly picked off by unseen assassins from afar, their heads exploding into bloody roses. Merlin was terrified. He looked around in a daze his ears ringing from the seemingly infinite number of thunderclaps and explosions that the enemy was capable of unleashing. The tightly packed formation of his army was disastrous, as each explosion killed dozens. Body parts and pieces of smoldering armor flew into the air, puncturing and hindering his other forces. He witnessed a slaughtering of his men. Many were screaming for salvation, for their mothers but their prayers would go unanswered as their bodies were ripped apart by metal and fire. This was not glorious combat. This was void of honor. The hellish destruction he faced was horrible. It was an efficient extermination rather than a battle. In the skies above, his wyvern knights fared no better. Without the protection provided by magical shields, they were wiped out almost immediately. A swarm of metal dragons in the distance let loose their unavoidable weapons. Like the arrows of light that decimated the two scouting wyverns, they followed their targets. Merlin took his eyes off the sky, having seen enough of the merciless elimination of his most powerful troops. Having lost much of his infantry and all of his wyvern knights to metal dragons and light arrows, he gave the order to surrender. Several messengers ran to the back lines, where trumpeters, drummers, and flag carriers awaited. Fortunately, the enemy did not target these harmless units. As soon as the messengers relayed Norman's orders, Harns blared out and the flag carriers hoisted plain white flags. Across the battlefield, Nabian soldiers dropped their weapons and raised their hands. Thankfully, the act of surrendering was a method of communication that easily transferred between worlds. The defenders with the dark staffs ceased fire, and began to round up survivors. 
immediately administering medical care to the wounded. To his surprise, Nerlin could not find a single injured defender. His troops could not even reach the gate. Hanging his head down in defeat, Nerlin could only mutter in surprise, where did the Sonarans get access to this kind of power? Are they in league with demons? His thoughts were interrupted by a soldier wearing a sand-colored uniform, who brought him to a group with other Nubian officers, who were distinguished by their more ornate armor. After securing all the prisoners with handcuffs, the desert men directed him and his officers into a peculiar building, made of hardened rock. The majority of his troops were left outside with the wounded being ferried toward a group of tents emblazoned with a large red cross. As he followed the desert men, he took a moment to analyze the infrastructure. To his left and right, he saw several large stables aligned in neat rows the ones that housed the metal dragons which annihilated his wyvern knights. His gawking was interrupted by a shove on the back. He continued walking. As the desert men opened the door to their abode, Nerlin was met with a cool breeze originating from within. Although he wanted to relay his surprise to his comrades, he dared not utter a word because everyone else was walking silently. The construct they entered was illuminated in an arcane fashion, by bright white lights hanging from the ceiling. Thinking back to his time in the Emperor's palace, he assumed these must have been some sort of magical lighting. They walked through numerous hallways without seeing much else, as all of the doors were closed. Some had windows but they could not stop to peer through them, only catching glimpses of furniture and peculiar screens mounted on tabletops. Eventually, they reached their destination. Merlin was led to a plain room with a mirror, table, and two chairs. Left alone, he put his head down on the table in solitary reflection. Chapter 3 the Sands of Space Time. Area 51. Interrogation Room. 11 a.m. Local Time. Nerlin waited in the room for a few minutes before a man came in, carrying two bottles of water. He placed the bottle in front of Nerlin and gestured for him to drink, which Nerlin did. What is your name? Nerlin, confused by this unfamiliar language, mentally cast a communication spell. He was uncertain if it would work, but if it could work with animals, then it could certainly work with other humans. Sorry. Could you repeat that? I cast a communication spell on myself. What is your name? Gnerlin, expert wizard of the Nubian army. Are you Sonaran? No, I'm American. Nubian? That's interesting. Tell me more. He doesn't know about the Nubian Empire? Perhaps that blasted wizard brought us to another world. My country is situated in the continent of Enif. We are warring with the Sonaran Federation. How did you come here? A Sonaran wizard cast a transportation spell that transferred us here. That's all I need to know from you. Thank you. My colleagues will ask you additional questions later. But for now, would you mind casting this communication spell on your soldiers? Merlin directed the surviving mages of his force and cast communication spells. Some men dressed in white clothes, who appeared to be scholars, began questioning the survivors about their culture and language. The survivors, who had never seen an enemy force who treated their prisoners well, relented and surrendered all the information they had. Meanwhile, two miles south of Area 51, Zone Alpha, Code name SG1. 12 p.m. local time. Having pinpointed the source of the electromagnetic anomaly, the base commanders requested orders from the president, who directed them to send a research team, designated Alpha Team, to investigate. This research team consists of the following members scientific, physicist Dr. Alan Oppenheimer, physicist Dr. Nikita Tesla, biologist, medic Dr. Lacey Darwin, security. Master Sergeant John Owens, Captain Henry Doniger. As the research team arrived at Ground Zero, they found the unconscious body of Kelmethus, next to a small portal, about the size of a man. He's alive, Lacey declared. It appears he's starting to wake up. Tesla, pass me some water. Uh, where am I? It's okay, you're safe now. You're in the United States of America. I'm Lacey. What's your name? Kelmethus. Thank you for saving me. The United States? I have never heard of a country with that name before. I suppose this means my plan was successful. What happened to the Nubian army? They surrendered to us after sustaining significant losses. Surrender? The prideful Nubians rarely surrender. I see. Did you come all the way here to rescue me? Ah. Not quite. The objective of this mission was to analyze the anomaly here. Is there anything you can tell me about this? Kelmethus began his lengthy explanation of what had occurred, 
Starting from the advancement of the Nabian army along the plains, the team was shocked upon learning of the existence of magic. I don't believe it. Show us some magic. What kind of savage world is this, where magic doesn't exist? Kelmethus pondered the implications of this, but dropped the thought as he conjured a fireball and launched it at a nearby rock. The fireball dissipated on impact, leaving behind a black surface upon the unfortunate rock. That is, Truly incredible, remarked Oppenheimer, as he pondered the potential applications of magic. Where does this portal lead to? Having been unconscious, Kelmethus was too disoriented to realize that there was a portal before him. Now, as he gazed upon its glory, his heart pounded with joy. He could return home. It leads to my home planet, Gay Era. Well, I hope you're not having any thoughts about returning immediately. We've got orders to take you in for questioning. Owens reminded, These people seem to be nice enough, and they defeated the Nubians for me. I also did open a portal into their universe without their consent. I suppose I could answer some questions they may have, I can go with you. There is much I would love to learn about this world, Kelmethus offered. The team returned, viewing drones passing by as they entered a structure. Area 51, 2 p.m. local time. It's magnificent. It's like this portal is an Einstein Rosen bridge. It's a wormhole, Tesla proclaimed. It's like any sci fi and fantasy fan's dream. Oh, I hope I can go on an adventure and study the properties of this new existence, Oppenheimer voiced. Perfect. You're in luck, gentlemen. I'm sending your research team through the portal after our drones finish collecting data. This meeting will serve as your debriefing for this mission. Additionally, this fine gentleman, Dr. Illinois Jones, over there is an anthropologist that the president requested I attach to the group. I have already secured the assistance of the wizard to provide you with amenities and guides. Team Alpha and a diplomatic convoy will be transported. After diplomatic relations are secured, we hope to establish a base by the portal. The wizard will direct you to his apprentices, who may assist in your research. Afterward, the wizard will be accompanying the convoy to the Sonaran capital, General Harding explained. Anything we should know. Sir, Donager inquired. We've gathered some details on this world from the prisoners. All relevant information is included in this information packet, including a map of the continent and information on the factions of this world, Harding answered. The information packet, which was about 10 pages in length, was full of data sourced from the prisoners. The known continents of the planet Gay Era included Dianif, Fien, Arthi, North Obag, and South Obag. On the continent of Dianif, which is roughly the size of Africa, there are three major countries, the Sonaran Federation, the Nubian Empire, and the Ianif Imperium, which was the superpower of Ianif. The Sonaran Federation prefers diplomacy when interacting with neighboring countries, whereas the Nubian Empire is expansionist, conquering their neighbors. Tensions between both countries were already bad enough, due to the cultural differences between them, but the situation escalated as the Nubians conquered an important trade partner of the Sonarans. Little was known about the Ianif Imperium. This section of the information packet would be useful for the diplomatic delegation that the president was planning to send to the Sonaran Federation. The goal of Research Team Alpha is to verify the validity of this information, scout for resources, and document various properties about the planet. Their mission will take about a week. Good luck on your mission. Dismissed. Chapter 4, Izkai. SG-1, North Grandin Plains. Sonaran Federation. Ianif, Gay Era. Month 5, Day 20, Year 237. 10 a.m. local time. Team Alpha and the diplomatic convoy emerged on the other side of the portal, with Kelmethus taking the lead so as to not startle any local inhabitants. The Americans brought several vehicles, including Humvees, Bradley IFVs, and Jeeps. Thanks to Kelmethus, it was revealed that the portal, despite only man-sized, could accommodate larger objects, such as the Americans' metal carriages, as long as the object touched the portal. Once all members of the expeditionary groups were on the other side of the portal, Kelmethus climbed into the lead jeep. The region had already been mapped by several drones, and the route was pre-planned, but Kelmethus was requested to help with navigation, to ensure that nothing went wrong. This metal carriage, car, is quite comfortable. It's similar to the Mechanis cars but these American vehicles are faster and have smoother rides, thought Kelmethus. If it's true that the Americans did not even receive a single injury in their battle with the Nubians, 
then they may be as powerful as the Mechanese at the very least, perhaps even the Divinians. I should report this to His Majesty. Confused with something mentioned earlier, Kalmethus posed a question. 200 miles in 3 hours? You say the trip will only take 3 hours? Normally it would take a couple days to complete this trip, even with the fastest horses and the lightest of cargoes. In response, Tesla explained, the average cars back in America have top speeds close to 100 miles per hour. Our convoy will be traveling at 70 miles per hour for this journey. Kalmethus and the scientists in the vehicle continued their discussion regarding Earth technologies and magic. To the scientists, it was like an incredible dream. They couldn't believe that everything occurring was real. As for Kalmethus, he was less concerned with the existence of other worlds as he himself had been doing research on the topic for a while now. Rather, Kalmethus was concerned about the impossible feats that Americans and their machines are able to accomplish, the speeds their vehicles could reach, the productivity of their factories, the amount of food they produce, all baffled Kalmethus. Even the Divinians couldn't compare. Such thoughts lingered as the trip progressed. Sonris, Sonaran Federation Capital 12.50 p.m. Local time. The convoy reached its destination safely, as curious onlookers came out from their shops and homes to study the strange middle carriages that appeared before them. Now, many of these citizens knew of the mechanical vehicles of the Mechanese, so it was assumed that the convoy was Meccan in origin. Some who were more knowledgeable, who had actually visited Meccan in recent times, realized that the vehicles were in fact alien to the world, deducing this from the odd designs and unique flag that adorned vehicles' structures. The Americans were notified that the city streets would become much more crowded the further they ventured. Accordingly, the convoy parked near Kalmathus Wizard Academy, which was conveniently next to an extravagant hotel. As the Americans climbed out of their vehicles, they were met with a beautiful scene. The architecture of the Sonarans resembled Italian architecture during the Renaissance period, with a variety of intriguing angles and sources attached to the designs. The Sonarans were fond of curvilinear triangles, incorporating these peculiar shapes into the designs of their domes, which were glistening in the light, thanks to a special reflective material they are made of. This reflective material coated many other important buildings including landmarks such as museums and wizard academies, with shining spires, as if it were a fantasy movie. Truly, the cityscape seemed like a city of gold, with the Sola's glory being displayed in each tower and dome. To the Americans, some of the shining towers reminded them of home, as the scene was similar to sunsets in Manhattan, with the skyscrapers glowing a beautiful golden hue due to the setting orange sun. Kalmethus smiled proudly seeing the impressed expressions upon the faces of his guests. Wow, this reminds me of New York. Yeah maybe even Dubai. A the buildings aren't as tall though. Kalmethus, intrigued by this latter comment, questioned the Americans. How tall are the buildings where you come from? The soldiers who made this remark replied, Our skyscrapers are several hundred feet tall, with the tallest buildings in the US of A being over a thousand feet in height. In comparison to the buildings of Earth, the structures in gay air could only reach a maximum of about 600 feet, with the tallest buildings in the territories of the Divinian Empire and Meccan. The Sonarans were able to boast buildings as tall as 100 feet or so, and spires almost 200 feet tall. Buildings so tall that they are called skyscrapers. Their technological capacity must be astounding. How can their buildings not collapse under their own weight? Their buildings are even taller than the Divinians? Oh. Wow. Kalmethus was too awestruck to formulate a coherent reply besides a mere expression of his surprise. As one scholar to another, Tesla interjected, explaining the science behind the construction of such tall buildings. He described materials sciences as simply as he could, highlighting the importance of tensile strength in design and constructing tall buildings. Such factors help to accommodate and mitigate, respectively the stress placed on various components of the structure. We use a variety of designs that are similar to the columns that your people have here in Sonris, Oppenheimer added. Remembering the mission, Owens inquired about their stay. Kalmethus elaborated their schedule and various details. Team Alpha and the diplomatic convoy will be staying at the nearby hotel. For the rest of today, the Americans would be able to explore the city. Tour guides would be provided by the hotel along with currency exchanged for the pure gold that the Americans had brought. At the hotel lobby, 
Kalmethis modified the communication spell that was casted upon the Americans earlier, allowing them to read and write gay errant standard. With time off for the rest of the day, the Americans enjoyed the beautiful sights and the peculiar food available to them, as the Sonarans had access to a unique type of spice grown only in their lands. Additionally, Gay Era was home to new types of flora and fauna, with the delicious meat of calves being quite the delicacy amongst the locals. Of course, the day would not be complete without beautiful pictures. The Americans became popular as rumors of their instant painters, or cameras, spread. The Americans also took drone pictures of the area, which amazed some lucky tour guides who got to witness powerful clairvoyance magic. As the day turned to night, the Americans returned home having been restricted from visiting bars or getting drunk, due to the sensitivity of their mission. As the citizens of Sonara went to bed, a shadowy cloaked figure, who was watching the hotel, disappeared into an alleyway. The moon overhead became obscured with clouds. Chapter 5, The Science of Magic Kelmethus Wizard Academy 10 a.m. Local Time Month 5, Day 21, Year 237 Alpha Team Now, I must journey with your colleagues to the royal castle, so I shall leave your needs in the hands of my apprentices, Aramithis and Skarnmethis. Call me Aaron. Call me Skarn. With introductions out of the way, Alpha Team began to discuss the history of Gay Era. Alpha Team was provided with books on magic and history, which excited the academics of the group. Jones in particular was interested in the various legendary items of this world including mana diamonds and ancient weapons. It was revealed that many of these rare artifacts were once owned by the Axons, who left behind various ruins as their mainland was transported to another plane of existence. Advanced magical technologies were lost as the Axons were banished. This situation is akin to the loss of Earth technologies in the past such as Damascus steel which required thousands of years of technological development to produce a viable counterpart. As for the physicists of the group, they questioned Aaron and Skarn about topics regarding magic. Evidently, the magic of this universe abided by a particular set of laws, much like the science of the Earth universe. The major difference between the laws of science and magic was the amount of laws. Magic was less restricted than science, although some outputs of magic were restricted by scientific properties. For example, a mage can conjure fire out of thin air, violating thermodynamics. But once he has released the fireball, the fire must adhere to scientific laws including those of thermodynamics and basic physics. Such abilities are powered by mana, which can be siphoned from mana gems. These gems essentially acted as batteries for magic users, allowing them to draw energy from the rocks and cast spells using this stored energy. Some mana gems are more powerful than others, with the rarest and most powerful having been excavated from Axon ruins. However, these are carefully stored and are only used for study, as it is a top priority for many wizards across the globe to reverse engineer the techniques used in the refinement of these Axon gems. Monogems undergo a process of refinement that is similar to uranium enrichment. Like their scientific counterparts, monogems have varying levels of stability and power output. Unlike the trend of atomic elements, where stability decreases as the atomic mass increases, Monogems become more stable as the density of magical particles increase. Mono refinement produces high quality gems, up to grade 20 in the Divinion Empire, which can convert up to 20% of the mass of the gem into pure energy. When Oppenheimer and Tesla learned of this, they were dreadfully shocked. Thankfully, Aranmethus explained the energy equation of his universe, which is similar to Einstein's famous equation, but weaker by a factor of 1000. So, Compared to atomic mass, the Divinions were only able to convert up to 0.02% of an atom's mass into energy. Still, this was troubling as it essentially meant that the Divinions were capable of producing weapons that were a tenth as powerful as fission weapons on Earth. Indeed, such capabilities were enough to rival the most powerful modern conventional weapons. Thankfully, the efficiency of the process was awful and the bomb mechanism that the Divinions have developed was not automated. Essentially, Divinion mages had to cast a long-range spell to manually detonate the bomb. This feat required an insane degree of coordination between Divinion bombers and mages, in order to detonate the weapon at the optimized altitude. As such, this weapon was rarely ever used, and only used against monsters such as epic dragons and the skitters 
which were a peculiar bug race. When asked about the capabilities of the Axons, Aaron informed the scientists that the Axons were much more advanced than the Davinians. The only comparison he gave was that of the technology disparity between both sides during the ancient wars. Over 5,000 years ago, the Axon continent was located in a stretch of ocean to the far east of Ianif, isolated from the continents of the human and orc civilizations. The Axons were a race of bluish humanoids with peculiar mandibles, similar to that of a beetle. Having conquered and unified their mainland, they proceeded to invade the orc and human continents. Ianif was the first to fall followed by the orc continents of the Oaks. The Axons ruthlessly cut through their enemies with mithril weapons, imbued with powerful enchantments. On top of this advantage, the Axons had a natural magical attunement rate of about 80%, which granted the Axon warriors considerable mastery over magic. The defending force was meek in comparison, armed only with iron weapons and struggling with a magical attunement rate of less than 40%. Of course, some outliers did exist, and these outliers were known as the legendary heroes of the time. These outliers boasted perfect magical attunement, and this single advantage allowed the heroes to pioneer a dangerous new spell, one that went down in the history books as the spell that banished the Axon Empire. Without reinforcements from their mainland, the Axons on the remaining continents were slowly eradicated. Given this information, Oppenheimer and Tesla deduced that the Axons were most likely on par with modern levels of technology using the technological levels of the Divinian Empire as a comparison. According to the information provided by the apprentices, the Divinian Empire has military capabilities akin to the late 19th century to the early 20th century. Without automated systems and advanced scientific knowledge, their vehicles performed as well as vehicles from World War II, but their weapons capabilities were lacking, as firepower was reliant on magic. On the other hand, the Meccans seem to have respectable computing capabilities, similar to the 1950s. This led the scientists to estimate that the Axons had a technological capacity equivalent to that of early 2000s American technology. The Axons were most likely nuclear capable, and could potentially create grain 100 monogems with ease. With 5,000 years of development, American undercover operatives in Meccan and the Divinian Empire would later corroborate these claims. Meanwhile, Chapter 6, The Sonaran Revelation Sonaran Royal Castle 10 a.m. Local Time Month 5, Day 21, Year 237 According to Kelmethus reports, Your Majesty, these Americans have been able to defeat the transported Nubian army with ease. They have not suffered a single casualty. One of the generals at the meeting objected. That's preposterous. Not even the Divinians could easily defeat a force that powerful. A colleague of Kalmethus, another master wizard, interjected. It makes sense when you consider the alleged capabilities of these people. Vehicles with greater performance and functionality than the Mechanese. Skyships that are multitudes faster than those of the Divinians or Mechanese, structures that are significantly taller than even the tallest buildings in the Divinian Empire. Surely, their military capabilities can be discerned from just their civilian technologies alone, which vastly outperform those of any civilization in the central continents. After further discussion, King Celius shamed his generals for their ignorance, and decreed that his diplomats should attempt to secure, at the very least, a non-aggression treaty with the Americans. Furthermore, any trade agreements would be useful in solidifying their relationship between the United States. Sonar and Royal Castle, Guest Lobby 1 p.m. Local Time Diplomat John Perry was the assigned representative for the mission. A skillful negotiator back on Earth, he was selected for his strategic excellence and his ability to see through unfavorable terms. With Alpha Team catching up on the magic and history of this world, Perry would be debriefed on the politics of gay era while he waited for the meeting to start. After complimenting the food, Perry and his team were taught about the various relationships between countries on gay era. Although Sonara was a federation, the king held most of the power, but could easily be dethroned by a consensus amongst the Sonaran parliament. Understandably, this threat resulted in wise kings, who perform as excellent leaders. King Celius reflected this ideology as he has been able to successfully withstand Nubian assaults. Tell me about the war. Kalmethus enlightened the Americans, skillfully exaggerating some details in order to appeal to their sympathy. There were some details he didn't even have to exaggerate, 
such as the wholesale slaughter of entire Sonaran villages at the hand of the Nabians. The merciless Nabians sought to wipe out the sun-worshipping heretics off of Enif, and to the Americans, it seemed like an ethnic cleansing. The horrified Americans would carry their sympathetic feelings into the meeting later on. After learning about the war between the Sonarans and Nabians, the diplomatic team also learned of the relationship between the five great powers of the central continents, the Divinian Empire, Meccan, the Eanif Imperium, the Quad Republic, and the Auric Horde. The Divinian Empire and Meccan had a sour relationship, with the Divinians looking down on the magically inept Meccanese, even going so far as seizing territory from Meccanese allied states, who had magically inept inhabitants. Kelmethus surmised that this would provoke a war between these two powers sometime in the future. The Eanif Imperium was a secretive superpower, concentrated in the northern half of the continent. They boasted military strength that was slightly subpar compared to the Meccanese, being able to field biplanes and this world's version of Maxim guns. The Quad Republic was situated in North Obag, with unknown capabilities. It is known, however, that they have been at war with the Ark Horde for centuries at this point. As guardians of the human lands, they have received assistance from the Divinians and Meccanese in the form of equipment, technology, and monogems. As for the Orc Horde, they were considered a nuisance by the surrounding human continents. To the Americans, the Orcs shared similar traits to the Mongol Horde of Earth history, albeit more brutal. Unlike the Orcs of many fictional tales, these Orcs were described to be fairly intelligent and magically formidable. Apparently, they were capable of creating war machines and had a magical attunement of about 30%. Although not as developed as the human nations, they had an advantage over human counterparts, brute strength. The orcs constantly raids nearby human settlements every few decades in order to replenish their numbers. Since orcs reproduce through human females, those who are captured are kept as slaves in the orcs and kept alive until infertile, at which point they are executed. How barbaric! Sonaran Royal Castle, Diplomatic Offices 2 p.m. local time. The meeting between Perry and his counterpart, Foreign Affairs Advisor Sindas, commenced. Sindas was as skilled as Beery, and at times used her alluring appearance to gain a tactical advantage. Beery, however, was trained well enough. He was a professional and conducted his actions as such. The two first discussed trade. The food your royal chefs served me earlier was quite delicious. My people would love to have these food items exported to my country. Perry handed Sindas a list of food items, selected based on the Americans' research the day prior. 5 million tons total. How can we even fit this much cargo through that tiny portal? Our scientists, with the help of Kelmethus Research and some students at his academy, were able to find a way to enlarge the portal. In exchange for these food items, we can provide infrastructure and food items of our own, which we believe did not exist in this world. Perry provided schematics for roads, highways, and railways alongside advertisement quality pictures of tomatoes, cinnamon, steak, and honey. Wow, so delicious, remembering her orders from King Celia's, Sindas replied. We accept. You can begin construction at any time, and we will allot you 100 square miles of land around the portal so you may build your facilities. This will be a 10 miles by 10 miles plot of land around the portal itself, which you may use as you wish. In addition, we will provide a square mile of land in Sonaris for the construction of an embassy. Consider this a reward for defeating the Nabian advance force. However, please note that this land may be under threat of attack by the Nabians, as your land is in between them and Sewell Fort. The United States, having anticipated a situation like this, had already dispatched a diplomatic team to the Nabian Empire. Their meeting will begin tomorrow. With land secured and a trade agreement finalized, Barry asked for some standard materials, alongside some unusual items. We have mithril lures that we can sell to you, but glowing green rocks and burning black liquids and rocks? I don't see why anyone would want those. The Mechanese contacted us last year about burning black rocks, so we gave them access to a mine near one of our mountain ranges. As for the glowing green rocks, I must ask about that first. Sindas proceeded to question a subordinate asking her to contact some surveyors. After a few minutes, Sindas received her answer. We have some glowing green rocks in a cave system by the South Grandin Plains, but all of the miners who have been sent to that area returned sick. They might be cursed. Oh, 
That's all right. We know how to ward off curses and evil spirits. Well, I suppose this agreement can be tentative. Can we survey for resources in your lens before we finalize this section on materials and resources? Yes, of course. You may survey whatever open territories you wish. Excellent. On top of all this, we will provide a discount to all Sonarans for the various stores and restaurants we plan to open near the portal. You will be able to travel there and use our services after we establish a dollar Sodar exchange rate. As the meeting concluded, Sindas had a final request for Perry. King Celia's, noticing the cannon mounted atop the M2 Bradley, asked for a demonstration. Perry, not wishing to displease the king, asked command for permission which was granted. Outskirts of Sonaries. 4 p.m. local time. The M2 Bradley IFVs that escorted the diplomatic convoy were brought to some planes outside of the capital. The Sonaran king was accompanied by his cabinet and his highest-ranking military officials. Placed about 500 meters away from the IFVs were solid rock constructs, summoned by the mages as targets. The king and his acquaintances eagerly awaited the show, discussing potential outcomes. That cannon is very lengthy. It must be very accurate and powerful. I've seen larger cannons in the Divinion Empire. The Mechanies also have larger cannons, like the Americans they don't use magic in their weapons. I wonder how the Americans compare. I remember seeing a vehicle like this amongst the Mechanies arsenal. They called it a tank. Discussion continued further until it was time for the demonstration. The first portion of the demonstration involved firing the main cannon of the IFV, the head of the Bradley housing the 25mm Otto cannon, swiveled toward its targets on the field. Boom boom boom. In quick succession, all three rock targets were obliterated, drawing various gasps from the crowd. The king himself raised an eyebrow. The second test was a demonstration of firing on moving targets. The mages were instructed to move a rock golem around the field. To truly impress the onlookers, the Americans decided to move the vehicle as it was firing. Boom. The fire control system of the M2 Bradley compensated for the movement of the vehicle, adjusting the barrel of the 25mm gun to remain on target, and to the surprise of the audience, the rock golem was destroyed. To the Sonarans, who had only been recently informed of the Divinion and Mechanese tanks, this feat seemed like it required intense magical focus. Not even the best armor mages of the Divinions or the most trained tank crews of the Mechanese could hit a moving target so far away, while their own weapon was on unstable ground. The sheer amount of calculations that had to be done in order to predict the position of the target and angle the weapon properly was nothing the world had before seen. It was theorized that only the Axons would be capable of such a feat by this time. After 5,000 years of development, for the final demonstration, the mages were instructed to summon a cluster of five rock golems. Whoosh! Suddenly, smoke appeared from a component of the M2 Bradley. To the onlookers, it may have seemed like the vehicle suffered an equipment malfunction and was smoking. This thought was immediately erased as the crowd saw a trail of light emerge from a compartment headed toward the rock golems. A BGM-71 tow missile streaked toward the golems reaching its target in just seconds due to its terrifying speed of about 300 meters per second. Boom! An explosion erupted near the target, and when the smoke dissipated, nothing was left except for small rock fragments that littered the ground. We need the Americans as our allies against the Nubians, King Celia's reflected. We have almost nothing in our arsenal that can defeat this metal monster. We must never fight against the Americans. And thus, the demonstration concluded. The diplomatic convoy began their journey home, toward the portal. As the moon rose and the skies darkened, a shadowy individual could be seen in the background, casting a communication spell. Chapter 7, Ambush. 100 miles from Sonris. 7 p.m. local time. Month 5, Day 21, Year 237. It was dusk, and the sun began to set. Unfortunately for the diplomatic team, they were not able to stick around Sonri's long enough to view the beautiful scene, of the golden sun striking the shimmering city. The team had orders to return to the portal after they had concluded the diplomatic mission. As they rode back, Perry thought of the warning that the Sonaran officials gave him, be wary of the night. The unscrupulous Nubians tended to stalk their targets from the shadows, and were known for their expert assassins and stealth techniques. According to the intel procured from the prisoners back at Area 51, the Nubians fielded an elite assassin organization, the Dark Shadow. The secretive members of this elite group were supposedly at least expert wizards, 
and were additionally proficient in swordsmanship. Grassy fields, 7.30 p.m. The vehicles are approaching. Remember our objective, and remain silent. American diplomatic convoy, 7.30 p.m. Considering the firepower of the M2 Bradleys, Perry dismissed the slight sense of unease. Suddenly, the vehicle in front of him veered to the left, crashing into a tree. The body of a strange bug-like critter, which would be later known to the Americans as a skitter, blocked the road. The frightening appearance caused the driver of the lead vehicle to swerve away. After ensuring that the strange monster was dead, the security personnel began removing the corpse from the road. Before they were able to get back in their vehicles, cloaked individuals began to rise from the grass surrounding the road, wearing an Abian ghillie suit and amplifying their camouflage with light refraction magic. The assassins slowly creeped toward their targets. Ga'a, a soldier had his respiratory tract blocked by cold steel. He was stabbed by a knife and was unable to warn his allies. One by one, the security personnel fell, as they had not anticipated such an attack and therefore were not equipped with any night vision or thermal gear. Why aren't they back yet? Simmons, Brown, Dawson, and Whitman aren't on comms. Something must be going on Sarge. Roger that. I'll check it out. Barry. We believe something may be going on outside. Stay inside. The driver of Perry's Humvee exited in order to assist his fellow soldiers in their investigation, as they scoured the surrounding area with flashlights. The assassins remained silent, although in their minds they were laughing at the ignorance of these inferior humans, who were magically inept. This vain attempt at a search led to inevitable failure, and the convoy decided to regroup instead. With the corpse now off the road, the lead Bradley was instructed to move back in formation. Unbeknownst to the soldiers, this occurred too late. With the four soldiers handling the bait corpse now eliminated, the Dark Shadow assassins began to surround the convoy and prepare an attack on the remaining guards. With bright lights coming from the vehicles, the assassins deemed it impossible to silently kill any near the center of the convoy. As such, they planned to execute a chain magic attack using a powerful lightning spell. Deactivating their cloaks, the assassins began to charge their spell, their hands crackling with lightning. Visual on enemy targets. They're casting some sort of spell. I've got the one toward the tree. I got the one toward the corpse. Dittatata. The soldiers at the convoy realized that they were under attack, and began to fire their weapons at the sources of light. All of a sudden, the sources of light intensified in luminosity releasing the charge stored within the mages. Despite managing to incapacitate two of the targets, the soldiers ultimately reacted too late. The remaining assassins had completed their spell and unleashed lightning upon the remaining guards, immediately frying their internal organs. Although the Bradley crews were still safe inside their vehicles, danger close prevented them from firing upon the enemies as their fire control systems clearly displayed them next to friendly vehicles. They decided to report to command and request for backup. While the Bradley crews hurriedly contacted their superiors, the Nabian assassins were able to break into the Humvee that contained Perry. As masters of stealth, the assassins were able to unlock the door without rattling it at all, thereby leaving Perry unalerted as they quickly opened it. Perry, with his sidearm ready, attempted to search for targets, but found none as they were skillfully cloaked. A split second later, Perry fell asleep, having been afflicted by a sleep spell. His sidearm fell on the seat as he was carried away by the assassins, who disappeared into the night. Unknown location. Sometime later, Perry awoke in a cell, finding his hands shackled. His shuffling as he got up from the bed alerted the guard outside, who hurried off to report the situation. A few minutes later, a barbaric man entered the room adorned with extravagant pieces of jewelry. He identified himself as a bandit leader, who informed Barry of his predicament. Don't give me trouble and you'll make it out here alive. Well, ha, if I get my money actually. Who do you think will pay your ransom for me? I'm sure the Mechanese government can scrounge up some cash for your release. Mechanese? I'm American. Mechanese? American? It doesn't matter. I've left a note for your friends, the bandit chided. I'll get my money either way. He declared as he plucked Perry's wedding ring from his finger. How dare he? Seething with anger, Barry managed to contain his emotions, preferring to avoid irking his captor in order to prolong his lifespan. The bandit also stole Perry's Rolex, but thankfully he neglected to take the American flag pin from his suit, 
as this pen housed a small tracking device. Perry breathed a sigh of relief as the bandit exited the room. Despite this elaborate facade, Barry was able to sense an inconsistency with this situation. After defeating a professionally trained army of 20,000 Nubian troops, there was no way some bandits could boast greater proficiency in magic and stealth operations. He suspected the involvement of the Dark Shadow, and his suspicions were indeed correct. With the disappearance of the entire 4th Invasion Detachment, the Nubian Emperor called a meeting to discuss strategies. An advisor from the Dark Shadow suggested clandestine operations in order to raise funds, as the Nubian Empire could face an economic crisis if the war against the Sonarans dragged out longer, without any significant gains. One such operation was kidnapping. Nubian spies discovered that a mysterious convoy arrived at Sonaris. Believing this to be a Mechanese diplomatic convoy, due to the presence of mechanical vehicles, the Emperor authorized a kidnapping operation of the supposed Mechanese diplomat. The funds secured from this ransom by bandits would be used to help replenish the ranks lost from the disappearance of the 4th Invasion Detachment. This operation would prove to be the beginning of the end for the Nubian Empire, as the bandits' prisoner was not only American, but also suspicious of the involvement of the Nubians. Chapter 8, Hostage Rescue Part 1 President's Office White House, Washington, D.C., United States, 10 p.m. local time, May 21, 2019. President Keener was reviewing the results of the diplomatic talks with the Sonaran Federation. 100 square miles for us, how generous. That will provide us with an excellent foothold in this new world. This will mark the next chapter in our manifest destiny. Keener was pleased with the deals that Perry made on behalf of the United States. The export of various technological trinkets and cheap items, which could be sourced from the same providers that dollar stores rely on, could commence immediately. The team sent to the Eanif Imperium was still a few days away from their destination, so Keener reviewed the report on the Nubian Empire. The Nubian Empire was contacted through one of the prisoners secured at the Battle of Area 51. The prisoner relayed the U.S. request for diplomatic talks, which would include details on the transfer of POWs over to the Nubian Empire. In the transcript the prisoner read, the U.S. made sure to exemplify that the whole situation was just a misunderstanding. The Nubians soon granted the request and a diplomatic team was sent to the Nubian Empire. The team arrived at the Nubian capital, Nor, without any issue. The diplomatic talks were unsuccessful, however, as the Nubians did not desire anything that the Americans could offer. Additionally, American staff reported receiving cold stares from the Nubians. The unsettling demeanor of the Nubians was most likely a result of the coincidental similarities between the American flag and the Sonaran flag, which was blue with white stars dotting the surface, each representing the territories controlled by the Sonarans. Essentially, it looked like the top left portion of the American flag, without the stripes that represented the original 13 colonies and with fewer stars. Another factor in the poor reception of the American team, unknown to Keener, were rumors that circulated of the 4th Invasion Detachment's ruthless defeat. Someone from the Nubian Emperor's inner circle, who was listening to the American communication, had exaggerated the defeat of the small Nubian army. This person was in fact a spy from the Sonaran Federation, implanted within the Nubian High Command in order to collect intelligence and sow chaos within the administrative network of the Nubians. With a deep understanding of the Nubian culture and its extremely proud attitude, this Sonaran agent decided to fan the flames, directing the anger of the Nubian peoples toward the Americans. This was an ingenious strategy on part of the Sonarans, who had determined, based on reports from Kelmethus, that the Americans must become an ally. By inciting resentment amongst the Nubians, the Sonarans could effectively force the United States to fight on their side. As Keener finished his review of the report on the Nubian diplomatic talks, he began filing the documents away, placing them to the side of his desk. Suddenly, the phone next to him rang. The origin of the call was Area 51. Keener reasoned that General Harding had an emergency situation, and thus he answered the phone. Mr. President, we have an emergency. Ambassador Perry has been abducted. What unfortunate timing. Keener was looking forward to a stress-free night of fun with his wife. His expression soured as he was told the details of the situation. According to Harding, Perry's convoy was ambushed by unknown assailants who were well-versed with stealth operations. The assailants left a note with an address. At 12 p.m. noon tomorrow, meet me at the Soren's Best Bar, 
across from the Sorn Museum, come alone. There was a bit of good news. Thankfully, Perry's tracking device was able to be located, somewhere in the Sonaran city of Sorn. He was being held in an underground complex about a mile away from the bar, so General Harding, with the approval of President Keener, launched a rescue operation. This rescue operation by the Americans would require utmost care. General Harding determined that given the technological level of the natives, they would most likely have no knowledge of tracking technology, and the rescue team can therefore expect minimal resistance. The team however may expect booby traps, similar to those found in ancient tombs in action movies. With this in mind, preparations began. The operation would be split between three teams. Two would be participating in the rescue operation, while the third would be providing support for the agent at the bar. Of the two rescue teams, one would provide overwatch. Equipped with M107.50 BMG anti-material rifles and reconnaissance drones, the breaching team, composed of experienced members from Navy SEAL teams, would be performing the actual rescue tomorrow morning. They would be equipped with suppressed close-quarters weapons, including the MK-18 CQBR and the HK MP5N. Satisfied with the plan, Keener went to bed while Harding directed his intelligence teams to scan the target building in order to construct a map for the rescue team. In less than 12 hours, the United States will make history with the first extraterrestrial hostage rescue. Chapter 9, Hostage Rescue Part 2 Somewhere in Sorn, a mile from Sorn's best bar, 11.30 a.m. Local Time, Month 5, Day 22, Year 237, 30 minutes till the op, Thermal picked up two hostels guarding the entrance and eight more scattered throughout the building. They won't be expecting us, but keep an eye out for traps and trip wires. Having seen the grotesque consequences of homemade booby traps in the Middle East, the members of the rescue team would be more than cautious when infiltrating the target structure. As with operations back on Earth, the identities of the team were kept secret. The operatives were given code names instead, designated Terras 1 through 6. The team leader, Terra 1, reviewed the plan with his squad mates. Sorn's Best Bar 12 p.m. Luna 1 sat at a lone table in Sorn's Best Bar. As the clock hit noon, a man from a nearby table got up and sat at his. The bandit leader got straight into business, demanding 10 million soda errors for the release of the hostage. You have 24 hours to make your decision. To the Americans, that was a relief, since their mission would be over well within 24 hours. The objective for Luna's squad was to capture the bandit leader. Give me a moment to communicate with my superiors, requested Luna 1. This was a strategy to stall for time. Luna's squad needed confirmation from Terra Squad. The Americans believe that the bandit leader may simply order the hostage's execution if he is under threat. On the side of the bandit leader, he was surprised to see the device that the strangely clothed man had produced from a pocket. This flat-looking box caught the eye of the bandit leader, distracting him from the American's elaborate ruse. Luna once stalled for a few minutes, rehearsing the script he had practiced, before he finally got confirmation from Terra Squad. Meanwhile, Back at the hostage building. 11.59 a.m. Pop. Pop. Two suppressed shots from M107 anti-material rifles hit their marks, leaving the two guards posted by the entrance headless, and the wall behind them painted red. Above, two surveillance drones monitored the situation, feeding information regarding the position of hostiles into the networked helmets of the terrorist squad operatives. On their HUDs, heads-up display. They could see indicators displaying enemy positions, assisted by augmented reality systems within the helmets. Such technology was generally relegated to the realm of fiction, popular in video games like Call of Duty or Battlefield. In reality, these systems had been under development for a while, and the Pentagon saw this hostage situation as a perfect opportunity to test their new equipment, without having to worry about the prying eyes of Chinese or Russian spies. Two bandits. Still unaware of the presence of the American team, lazily guarded the entrance to the basement. Wish I could have more fun. That night on the road was such a thrill. Oh yeah, sure was. Reminds me of the good old days of our missions against Sonaran generals. Director Tempos should have had some apprentices do this shit. Why? Tata. Two calculated headshots from Terra Squad prematurely ended the conversation between the two guards. All rooms in this corridor are clear. Two additional tangos were eliminated. Proceeding to the basement, six bandits were left, 
with two in the hostages holding cell. As the American forces descended the stairs, their heads alerted them to the presence of four hostiles, waiting for them on the other side of the door at the end of the hallway. The special forces unit was caught in a dangerous choke point. The bandits on the other side were armed with crossbows, according to the positioning of their bodies. One, who had additional readings as seen on the drone's infrared sensors, appeared to be a fire mage ready to cast a dangerous spell. The members of Terra Squad crept up to the two rooms adjacent to the room at the end of the hallway. Silently, Terra 1 ready to flashbang. Terra 2, in the room opposite, opened the door slightly, allowing Terra 1 to throw his flashbang. Bang. Ah, I can't see. What is this sorcery? Terra 2 slammed open the door before retreating back to his room. The bandits, having been blinded, fired haphazardly toward the direction of the door. Having wasted their readied ammunition, Terra Squad quickly entered and eliminated the three bandits. Tatata, the mage, abandoning his offensive spell casting, summoned a defensive shield, similar to the one used by the Nubians during the Battle of Area 51. A blue light flickered around the disoriented mage, encapsulating him in a bubble. Switch to full auto. Terra 1 did not know the full capabilities of gay air and shield magic as the American scientists from Alpha Team and Area 51 have yet to fully understand it. The order to fire their weapons on the fully automatic setting may have seemed like overkill, but to Terra 1, underestimating his enemies could lead to the unnecessary deaths of his squad mates. The torrential rain of bullets quickly destroyed the shield, which dissipated after less than a second of firing. The mage within the shield perished. His body riddled with holes. Four hostiles neutralized. Proceeding to holding cells. Thanks to the work of Alpha Team, back at Kalmathus Wizard Academy, Terra Squad was assigned a modified DA6B, which was now able to jam magical signals. Evidently, Alpha Team discovered that magical waves had similar properties to electromagnetic waves. In particular, magical communication was similar to radio. The final two Dark Shadow members, having lost communication with their comrades, were desperate. After each set of peculiar popping sounds, a group of Nubians fell. With no way to contact their leader, all they could do was wait for the signal to execute the hostage. Desperately, one of the bandits held a knife to Perry's neck, waiting for the intruders to enter. The drones buzzing around the building detected this, and alerted the rescue team. This reaction by the bandits was expected, and Terra Squad approached the door with Terra 1 readying another flashbang. This time, Terra 1 vocalized his action, letting Perry know what he was about to do. Tossing a flashbang in 3, 2, 1. Perry understood how a flashbang worked, and as the cylindrical instrument rolled into the room, he closed his eyes and opened his mouth in order to minimize the effects of the flashbang. The bandits did not do the same and instead stared at the peculiar device that had rolled into the room. The bandits were allowed to have curious thoughts for a split second before they were blinded and deafened by the M84 stun grenade. Bang! What in the name of no? Terra Squad immediately breached the room, their movements fluid. The disoriented bandits proved to be easy targets, and were easily neutralized. The bandit holding the knife to Perry's neck was unable to commit to his threatening intentions as he lost control of his hand when his brain ceased to send electrical signals, thanks to an intrusion of lead. Tata, hostage is secure, we are ready for extraction. Terra Squad, having secured Ambassador Perry, exited the building and rendezvoused with their Overwatch team toward the designated extraction point. Sorn's best bar, 12.08 p.m. We don't negotiate with terrorists replied Luna 1. Is that so? I suppose then that you don't value the life of your colleague, then. The bandit leader attempted to contact his subordinates back at his hideout, but received no response. In the background, unscrupulous looking men could be seen, being dragged out of the store. Luna 1 drew his firearm, knowing full well that the mission's success was now guaranteed. You're under arrest. Please don't resist. At this point, the bandit leader attempted to cast some sort of spell. But the American Special Forces team, having anticipated this, quickly incapacitated the man via taser. Area 51, 4 p.m. Thank you for rescuing me. That's our job. And speaking of yours, as compensation for your unfortunate circumstances, the President has allowed you to take paid leave for up to a month. Ah, that is very generous, but I think I'll have to decline that offer. I'm living out my dreams. Being able to explore this new fantasy world. Haha, <laughs> yeah, 
that's understandable. Well, since you're back on the team, be sure to contact the higher-ups for debriefing, of course. Oh, and by the way, about those bandits, I feel like there's something suspicious about them. I believe they may have ties to the Nubians. The attack on my convoy is consistent with descriptions of dark shadow operations. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you Mr. Perry. Area 51 Interrogation Room, 6 p.m. As the bandit leader, now identified as Norga, sat in the interrogation room. Two men discussed their options behind the room's one-way mirror. A Quinn, looks like the good cop deal ain't working. Let me try the bad cop business. Ah, just give me a bit more time man. He's being cooperative now. Cooperative? He still refuses to talk about the Nubian weapons we found on him. You know? I just remembered something. I just got intel from the general. He said that international law doesn't apply around these parts. Oh? What are you implying? No Geneva Convention. No human rights laws. We are authorized to use suggestibility drugs and torture to source information. In fact, we've just received a care package from the big wigs. A new truth serum the nerds have been working on for those terrorists we've got in Guantanamo. Well shit. I guess I can't really compete with that. You can take over from me if you'd like. I could use a break anyway. Thanks Quinn. I'll make sure this fucker gets what he deserves for what he's done to our brothers in that convoy. Later that day, screams could be heard coming from an undisclosed room within the base. Chapter 10, The Nubian Emperor's Folly. Nubian Throne Room. Month 6, Day 5, Year 237. Emperor Novus was in a meeting with his high command discussing the recent failures of the Dark Shadow. The Dark Shadow director was protesting his budget cut. Silence. Fearing for their lives, everyone in the throne room heeded the Emperor's command. It became so quiet that even ambient buzzing of the magical lights could be heard. Finally, the Emperor spoke. The Dark Shadow shall not engage in any further activities for the procurement of funds. Your failure at the hands of these Americans has cost us valuable time and effort that could have been delegated to the assassination of a Sonaran target. The Dark Shadow director hung his head, staring meekly at the floor. Additionally, we are running low on resources. Our offensive on Sewell Ford was intended to capture the resources beneath the North Grandin Plains. We desperately need resources in order to continue our war against the Sonarans. My generals, have you any thoughts? One of the generals spoke up. He was tall and had graying hair. Although his demeanor reflected the semblances of loyalty. His eyes revealed his true intentions. This was the same man who had spread rumors about the Americans. He was the Sonaran agent. We can send a larger force. The Sonaran Federation expended most of their high-grade monocrystals on their space-time manipulation spell. Our spies have reported that their defenses at Sul have grown only by 10,000, leaving the fort with 50,000 defenders. If we send five detachments and supporting units from our Dragon Corps, we can easily crush the defenders. And what of the newcomers who have created an establishment around the portal? The general, consumed by loyalty to his mission, was about to convince Emperor Novus to give an order that would result in the collapse of the Nubian Empire. Then we shall double our forces and crush their magically incapable troops. The Pentagon, Washington DC, 1028 AM, June 7, 2019. A collection of generals were present in the room, conducting a meeting. The President and Secretary of Defense Richard Lee were also here, as the situation unfolding was deemed to be an urgent matter. The meeting began with Lee's announcement of the completion of Fort Washington on the other side of the portal. The completion of the fort came in a timely matter, as numerous RQ-4B surveillance aircraft had just detected a large force massing by the North Grendon Plains. Nabian in origin. A rough estimate placed the troop count at about 200,000 strong, and they're approximately five days away from our position. We don't have an alliance with the Sonaran Federation but I think we should still notify them of the situation, President Keener suggested. Perhaps we can contact the Nabian forces using the magical communication devices in Sewell Fort, to ensure that they don't mistake us for enemy troops. General Eisenhower added, Have the embassy get King Celia's on the line, Keener ordered a staffer. Within a few minutes, the U.S. Embassy in Sonrees was able to get a hold of King Celia's. Upon hearing the news of the Nubians massing, Celia's was grateful, and immediately put Sewell Ford on high alert. King Celia's, 
Is it alright if you have your troops in Seoul Fort magically contact the Nabian forces? We want to make sure that they won't mistake us for an enemy and attack us. Of course, President Keener. Give me a moment. After about a minute, Celia's returned to his telephone. President, the Nabians are ignoring our hails. I anticipate that they will leave you alone, but you must prepare for the worst. May Sola's light guide you. After the call ended, the meeting room erupted into a cacophony of suggestions. We need to ready our defenses and deploy everything we have. We will ensure peace through power. What is the current armament of the fort? The airfield has about 6 8 ns 15 F 15 S, 20 F 15 S, 40 F A 18s, 4 F 22 S, and 4 modified F 35 S, which are currently testing experimental point defense systems. We also have 10 M 1 A 2 tanks, 3 M 1 A 3 prototypes, 20 LAV 25 S, 20 Bradleys, 20 M 777 units, and 10 M 270 units. Although, it's probably worth noting that the M1A3 railgun systems aren't really functional at this point, but we can still use the onboard machine gun platform for anti-infantry. Additionally, we have about 5,000 combat personnel at Fort Washington. General Harding analyzed the situation. This armament is sufficient to annihilate the Nabian forces. But how long would it take? Our aircraft can drop bombs that can each kill hundreds of enemy soldiers, and their dragons can easily be wiped out by our anti-air systems. The real concern is this, what will prevent them from streaming into the base? If they close the distance with most of their forces still intact, then our defenses won't be able to maximize their damage output due risk of friendly fire. General Eisenhower proposed a potential solution. Perhaps we can merely send a helicopter to warn the Nubians. We will establish a firm boundary, and articulate the consequences for intruding in our territory. This will allow time for our combined arms forces to whittle down the enemy force as they approach Fort Washington. Harding added onto this. If need be, we can supply reinforcements from Area 51. The President, wary of the General's discussion, reminded them of the potential political nightmare that may result from such massive troop movements. I'd rather not have to send too many troops and risk alerting Russian or Chinese spies to our discovery. The more people we involve, the harder it will be to keep a secret. We need to learn more about this world and find allies before we can reveal our secrets to the American people and the rest of the world. Our manifest destiny is at hand. Chapter 11 the Battle of Fort Washington Part 1 North Grandin Plains 50 miles west of Fort Washington 8 a.m. Month 6, Day 8, Year 237 The Nabian encampment began bustling with activity, as soldiers awoke and began their morning activities. Two soldiers in particular were chatting about the upcoming battle. Can't wait to experience my first battle, Gentro. I am beyond excited. For I relish the possibility of glory. Ah, calm down there Julmas, we don't even know what our new foes are capable of. The Americans? I've never heard of them in my life, so they must be an upstart country. Yeah, I heard rumors about their country only being just over 200 years old. Must be extremely weak in that case. Yeah, and the commander tells us there's not even 5,000 Americans at their base. They don't even have walls. He says they've got puny fences. Well. In any case I am hoping they aren't secretly a Mechanese expeditionary force. I hear they got similar vehicles to them. Hey do you hear that? The conversation between the two soldiers was interrupted by a peculiar sound, as if the air itself was being beat. To the Nabians, who had never heard a helicopter, it sounded like an extremely large dragonfly, flapping its wings at incredible speeds and with greater bass to the sounds this flapping produced. The soldiers scoured the skies for the source of this noise, finally discovering a flying machine, similar to the ones from Meccan, but with the rotors on top rather than in front. In addition, this weirdly shaped flying device had a tail with a smaller rotor. The curious thoughts of the soldiers were cut short by a booming voice, originating from the machine. It spoke to them in their native language, rather than gay errant standard, thanks to the assistance of communication magic. This is the United States military. This is a warning to halt your advancement. You are prohibited from moving your troops within 30 miles of Fort Washington. If you wish to proceed to Sewell Fort you must go around our base. We will open fire if you trespass on our property. Again, 
This is the United States. The machine's announcement was cut short after a Dragon Rider from the Nabian Army Air Corps shot a fireball in the direction of the machine, which easily dodged the projectile and flew off in the direction from which it came. That was odd. I've never seen any machine like that before. The lieutenant of the two soldiers' squad then made an announcement, relayed from the generals in their command tent. Ignore whatever the machine said. We are advancing to the portal and we will eliminate the Americans before advancing on to Sewell Fort. For Nubia. For Nubia. 10 miles from Fort Washington. 8 a.m. Month 6, Day 10. Like yesterday, another flying machine visited the Nubian encampment. It gave the same message, this time asking the approaching Nubians to turn back immediately or risk annihilation. Two particular soldiers pondered this message. Jomas, I have a strange feeling in my gut. As if something may turn out wrong. Agentero. That is what we call excitement. We have an unstoppable army, Jomas exclaimed, gesturing toward the fleet of dragon riders in the air. Dragon riders are the most powerful weapons available to either the Nubians or Sonarans. It is said that they are even capable of holding their own against the mechanical aircraft of the Mechanese and the hybrid aircraft of the Divinian Empire. They have average top speeds of up to 350 miles per hour with the most genetically gifted dragons being capable of up to 450 miles per hour. This speed, coupled with their armor, put them on even footing with Mechanese aircraft. The scales of the dragons are even resistant to the powerful muskets of the Eanif Imperium, suggesting that these dragons are resistant to small arms fire from calibers smaller than 762 by 39 Gentro felt reassured by Juma's extravagant declaration. This feeling however, was cut disappointingly short by a seemingly random explosion that vaporized a dragon rider and fatally injured three more around it. Ah, my dragon is falling out of the sky. What in the moons was that? They got y'all. No, I don't want to die. I thought this was supposed to be glorious. The arrows are follow. A volley of 40 AIM-120 missiles had been launched from 10 F-15 fighters, who were over 20 miles away. Having expended their ammunition, they returned to base for resupply. Within a minute, three dozen more explosions had occurred, decimating almost half of the dragon fleet. Eighty dragons and their respective riders were killed in this initial volley. The Nabian Army Air Corps, having been attacked by an unseen force, began to panic. The surviving forces relayed their engagement back to the Nabian generals. Nabian Imperial War Room 8.15 AM Your Majesty my commanders from the front lines have suggested a temporary retreat. We haven't ventured too far into the machine's designated territories. If we pull back slightly, we will be able to analyze the attack and create a new plan in safety. You have my permission. Report back to me once you have worked out a new plan. 8.30 AM The Nabian generals argue amongst themselves in the war room. Their attacks seemingly come from nowhere. And they are very powerful when it comes to explosive weaponry. We need to make sure our troops are scattered on the next offensive. We should send mages and armonogem carriages so they can produce shields and push forth. This idea came from Lon. No, the Sonaran agent. Having seen American firepower during one of his vacations, he knew the shields would not fare well against the extraordinary capabilities of American weapons. He hoped to deplete the Nubian army's mage count, and also test the true power of the newcomer's otherworldly weapons. Although many members of the Nubian high command were more than willing to support such an aggressive strategy. A few more logical generals saw through the plan's flaws. One of these few quickly interjected. What if the enemy performs multiple attack runs? How many attack runs can our mage's shields hold against? Channeling all that energy into shields and for what? Just to make it to their front gate, where our forces will have no mana and thus no mage support. Lano, struggling to formulate an idea to support his aggressive ploy abandoned the idea and remained silent. An infamous general from the upper ranks of high command spoke. It was no other than Nash himself, the man who perfected the Nash ambush. These enemies are not to be underestimated. We must employ stealth tactics in order to surprise and confuse the enemy. Our forces are too large to sneak up on the enemies with invisibility spells but we can spare enough monogems to make a group of mages invisible. These mages will sneak toward the base, surrounded, and summon earth golems and illusions in order to distract the enemy force. Meanwhile, the 7th, 8th, and 9th detachments can push forth, 
While the fifth and sixth can flank opposing sides, Nash's elaborate plan was visually supplemented by pieces on a table, which he moved around to represent the configuration of his formations. Having caught the intrigue of all commanders within the room, Nash continued, As a precaution, mages still attached to our primary forces can summon illusions ahead of them in order to divert enemy attacks. The enemy will wish to attack large clusters of troops, and may target artillery pieces. So our mages should summon illusions of these valuable targets, while our main forces maintain distance. The enemy will waste ammunition on valuable targets that don't even exist. This tactic may only work for the duration of one attack run, so we must act expediently. Lano, wanting to decipher the mind of this brilliant tactician, asked a question. When should we begin the offensive? Nosh replied, his answer unsurprising due to his heritage. We begin at nightfall. Chapter 12 the Battle of Fort Washington Part 2 Fort Washington Command Room 8 p.m. Sir, Hawk 3 is picking up some movement by the Nubian encampment. Owl 2 is confirming this. They're picking up large block formations of troops and artillery marching on our position. Have our fighters begin their sorties on the enemy forces. Target their artillery pieces and the larger troop clusters. Save the 18s and Apaches until they get closer and have our ground forces ready to engage. They are within range of Rumalaras and Howitzer units, so we should commence bombardment of the enemy positions once our fighters complete their first attack run. Yes sir. 8 miles from Fort Washington, 8.20 p.m. The Nabian troops marched in their specified formations, trailing behind the decoys created by their mage's illusionary magic. Quickly moving through the plains. The Nubians halted as they heard a thunderous noise shatter the skies. The objects were difficult to see in the dark, but based on the blinking lights on the flying objects, the Nubians could discern an outline that resembled an arrowhead. The otherworldly contraptions reminded the Nubians of Mechanese planes, but these were far louder and faster in comparison. The American jets flew overhead, before abruptly ascending at incredible speeds unmatched by even the most powerful of dragons. The Nubians could only stare in incredulity. So fast. What kind of magic are they capable of? Ridiculous. Impossible. What are those things that are falling? Those look like bombs. They're targeting the decoys. Boom. Boom. Flashes of light erupted in front of the marching soldiers engulfing the illusions in flames and debris. The resulting explosions from the various bombs dropped from the thunderous arrowheads were massive, stunning the advancing Nubians. Each bomb was capable of obliterating a whole company's worth of soldiers, leaving craters where the illusions once were. If it weren't for General Nosh's brilliance, we would have all been dead, a commander remarked. Keep pushing. We can't waste the time the illusions have bought us. Mages, Conjure additional forces. Blue light shined from the monogem carriages as the cargo was activated by the mages. In an instant, several more decoy companies fizzled into existence in front of the Nubian forces. Hoping the flying monsters weren't fooled, the Nubians pushed forth. Meanwhile, at Fort Washington, the expertly cloaked ambush team snuck into the base, using short-range teleportation spells. Luckily for the Nubians. The section of the American perimeter that they had snuck into had no thermal imaging equipment. The active cloaking of the mages could not be detected by night vision systems. Now behind enemy lines, the mages began summoning earth golems in front of the defensive perimeter. Sir, enemies detected at the western gate. Wipe them out. We can't detect them on our thermal equipment. Launch flares. Miniature suns began to illuminate the sky providing clear targets for the defenders. D -d 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 -tada. Overwhelming noises from machine guns began to fill the atmosphere as the station defenders unleashed their firepower upon the enemy. Due to the natural properties of the earth golems, they were able to withstand tens of bullet impacts. Shooting the earth golems was no different than shooting a sandbag. The defenders quickly discovered that destroying the limbs to incapacitate the golems was the most efficient method of eliminating the threats. They're killing the earth golems too fast. What should we do? The leader of the ambush squad pondered for a few seconds before giving his answer. Considering the squad's limited available mana and natural mana regeneration rates, the squad would run out of energy before reinforcements arrived. Therefore, Mana consumption must be staggered. We will send waves of golems every two minutes. Additionally, we will summon more mirages in place of actual golems to conserve mana. And with this command, the fighting continued. Four miles from Fort Washington. 8.40 PM. The Nabian forces closed the distance as fast as possible, 
receiving assistance from their mage's rejuvenation magic in order to boost their speed and stamina. The three detachments involved in the frontal assault could see the lights of Fort Washington in the distance propelling them to greater speeds as they yearned for the glory of combat. This motivational factor, in reality, was just a mask for the true motivating factor of the army's charge, the longer they wore out of range of the base, the greater the risk of annihilation. Having rearmed and resupplied, the enemy flying monsters returned to the battle. This time, they were accompanied by slower monsters that flew at a low altitude, and rotary-winged aircraft similar to the strange beast with the booming voices that they had encountered the past few days. The faster planes performed an attack run similar to the previous one, dropping bombs on high-value targets. This time, however, the bombs completely avoided the mirages of companies and artillery placed in front of the main force. Instead, the explosives flew toward the scattered lines of the Nubian troops. Good thing we scattered our forces. Wait, why aren't the bombs exploding? The bombs released from the American jets seemingly went silent, with the Nubians desperately searching the skies. One of the soldiers, who had good eyesight in the dark, spotted hundreds of smaller objects falling from the sky. This realization would be his last thought as his consciousness and those of his comrades were instantly erased by the explosive power of the weapons. The unfortunate souls who died in this bombing run were annihilated by CBU-type cluster bombs. The commanders, further back in the formation, witnessed the destruction of half of a detachment. The scene that unfolded was monstrous. To the primitive Nubians, it was as if a volcano had erupted beneath their troops, with miniature explosions swarming the immense swath of land that these troops once occupied. Where 5,000 men and carriages once stood, only a blackened surface littered with smoldering debris and charred body parts remained. What just happened? Are they in league with the Heralds of Sola? How did they know to avoid the decoys? Keep moving forward. Unbeknownst to the Nubians, the lack of thermal signatures on the illusions alerted their enemy to their cunning decoy strategy. Radar anomalies associated with the first attack run were analyzed, and new targets were designated. The Nubians barely had time to recover from their shock. Immediately after the bombings ceased, they encountered a twisted artist, who used the ground as his canvas and the blood of Nubians as paint. B-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-
racking up thousands of kills in their terrifying assault. Among these casualties were the commanders of the 7th, 8th, and 9th detachments. Consequently, leadership fell upon Colonel Nor Novask, who was currently attempting to communicate with the 5th and 6th detachments. Sir, we've established a line with the 5th detachment but we can't get a hold of the 6th. Excellent, let me speak with them. Thank the moons. General Kanan? No, this is Colonel Novask. All the generals are dead, so I'm the acting commanding officer of the main advancement force. How is the situation on your front? We've lost almost 7,000 men. We are currently engaging the enemy force but our projectile weapons cannot pierce their metal hides, or reach their metal dragons. Our infantry is near useless, our mages are low on mana and our artillery units are almost gone. We still have 45,000 with us, hold on a little bit longer for reinforcements. Yes sir. And, have you heard anything from the 6th? They've surrendered. They encountered the enemy first, and met the brunt of the enemy attacks. They lost all their ranged fighters and surrendered to avoid a meaningless charge into death. Ah hell. Well, just hold on for about 20 more minutes, we will be there shortly. We will do our best. Sir, the somber tone of the 5th Detachment CO reflected their dire predicament, as the probability of the 5th Detachment even lasting an additional 5 minutes was akin to the probability of an electron spontaneously becoming a positron. It was ridiculously low, especially given the firepower the 5th Detachment faced. Dark Shadow, Fort Washington, 8.50 PM. Our distractions are doing nothing to protect our allies. We need to begin taking down the defenders. No. We cannot disobey our orders. Remember the last time we fought against the Americans? They couldn't see us at all. As long as we use the carnage of the battle as a mask for our movements, we can take down the defenders with our blades, one by one. The Dark Shadow Squad leader considered this, and looked out into the fields of the North Grandin Plains, where massive explosions erupted one after the other. Damn it. Alright. Just be sure to stay clear of those moving fortresses. 501st Infantry Division. Richards, we're running low on ammo. Get to the 2nd Armory. Yes see ya. Richards? Richards is down. We have hostiles in the base. The warning was broadcast to all defenders within the base, who began to deploy countermeasures in the form of IR sensors and claymores. McNeil, watch our flanks. Intel says they are invisible to night vision but they can be seen bright as day on thermals. As the order was given to McNeil, he heard a distinct rustling nearby. Aiming in toward the direction of the revealing noise, he discovered a cloaked hostile. Ag. A quick burst from McNeil's rifle quickly eliminated the threat. Fifth Invasion Detachment. Amidst the gunfire, the ominous sound of tank dreads could be heard. The moving fortresses are preparing for another attack. Damn. Everyone get down. Boom. Such range. The final artillery pieces of the 5th Detachment were obliterated by heat rounds from the enemy's M1A2 smoothbore cannons. Not a single projectile was fired from the 5th Detachment's artillery pieces. They were wiped out too quickly. At this point, the Nabians had no way to fight back. Despite this, and despite being still a mile away from enemy forces, the Nabians decided that they have come too far to give up, and thus charged toward the enemies. They killed our brethren. Vanquish them. They will face the might of the Nabian Empire. For Nabia, the war cries were drowned out by the slicing of air above them. Blinking lights could be seen in the air, attached to oddly shaped machines. These were the same type of beast with the booming voices, but this time, their 30mm auto cannons, Hellfire missiles, and Hydra rockets would be booming instead. Arrows of light filled the night sky, representing the tracer rounds and missiles of the AH-64 Apache attack helicopters armaments. The unrelenting bombardments of the helicopters, combined with canister rounds from the M1 tanks and various projectiles from Strikers and M2 Bradleys, easily mopped up the 5th Detachment. The unwavering loyalty and apparent fanaticism of these particular Nibians led them to a gruesome demise as massive explosions produced enough light to reveal the decimation that had been brought upon the attackers. Sir, no targets left on the thermals. Launch a flare. A bright light illuminated the battlefield, revealing the horrors of war. Normally, soldiers would be sent to retrieve any injured enemies, but given that the main Nabian force was still advancing on their position, a rescue operation could not take place. The Americans felt truly sorry for the Nabians they were killing as the Nubians had not done anything to them aside from charging at them. The scene before the defenders was horrific, 
dismembered bodies dotted the landscape, and the plains were now disfigured by hundreds of craters. This shocking depiction was interrupted by a single helicopter, flying overhead. Two miles from Fort Washington, 9 p.m. We have lost contact with the 5th Detachment, sir. It seems they were wiped out. Surely that's impossible. 20,000 men gone in an instant? No such thing is capable of doing that, unless it be a powerful natural disaster, divine intervention. Or demons. Not even the divinions have this capability. Thup 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 thup. The metal beast with a booming voice returned, once again imploring the Nabians to cease their assault, or face annihilation. Some of the grunts amongst the infantry became anxious, and asked, What should we do? Colonel Novask gave an answer that was reflective of his loyalty, yet aware of his soldiers' concerns. Many of you have families, loved ones. Our war against the Sonarans is not as important as the prosperity of our peoples. Therefore, I grant any who wishes to do so permission to retreat back to our encampment, while I lead our forces toward the enemy. If you wish to return, do it now. A few hundred soldiers began walking back toward the Nabian base, 10 miles from Fort Washington. Most of them were worried about providing for their families, who had no members capable of work besides them. The rest were older soldiers near the end of their contracts. They did not want to die right before retirement. Despite his reasonable concerns regarding the firepower of the Americans, he couldn't surrender. He knew he would be leading over 40,000 men to their graves, but surrender wasn't an option as his men would view him as a traitor and charge toward the enemy regardless. In order to save as many of his men as he could, he placed the most loyal troops in front, to face the brunt of the enemy assault. The rest of his men, with lower morale, were placed at the back to maximize their survival. Only with the loyal fanatics gone could he surrender and save the lives of his men. He relayed his troop formation orders to his men, wording it in such a way so as to not arouse the suspicions of his troops. The most loyal soldiers were more than glad to accept these orders, as they believed that this would allow them to experience most of the glory. Sacrifice is a part of war. The lives of the few for the lives of the many, Novask muttered. As the Nabian soldiers got into their assigned formations, the metal beast above flew away, back toward the enemy base. Be advised, hostiles are reassembling into a wedge formation. The tip of the formation appears to be the most clustered. All right, then that'll be our target for the artillery units. Such a shame that they haven't surrendered. Tens of M270 MLRS and M777 howitzer units began their target acquisition processes angling their weapons so that the trajectory of their projectiles would hit the center mass of the enemy's formation. Shoom, 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 boom, boom, boom. The scene was terrifyingly beautiful. The howitzers pounded in unison as they fired in sync. Following this opening tune, volleys of missiles began erupting from the MLRS systems, equipped with cluster munitions and high-explosive munitions for maximum effect on the lightly armored enemy infantry. Search toes 18220mm MLRS or M270 MLRS on YouTube to get a picture of how powerful these weapons are. I recommend the first one because the Russian videos always seem to have a more clear representation of firepower. A massive thundering could be heard in the distance as the Nabian forces charged at the enemy. I begged the moons to forgive me. The trails of light above grew closer, following a parabolic arc until suddenly, they winked out of existence, spawning thousands of smaller explosives. The most loyal of soldiers, placed in the tightly packed tip of the formation, suddenly became enveloped in light and smoke. Ten thousand were in this component of the formation, and as the ground blazed with the intensity of the American bombardment, the souls of these ten thousand departed gay era. Novas watched in horror as such a powerful force was instantly annihilated by demonic weapons. By Luno, the charge immediately stopped, as the remaining troops were shell-shocked by this unholy massacre. Novask, recovering from his own disorientation, gave an order to his magical communications officers. Tell our remaining forces to surrender. Sir. It looks like they're surrendering. They've stopped their charge and are now waving a flag. All units, cease fire. Launch some flares to verify. Upon witnessing the destructive power of the Americans' artillery, no one questioned Novask's orders. Within minutes, American soldiers arrived at the battlefield to process the surrendering Nabian troops and tend to the injured. Seeing that the force they were supposed to support had all but disintegrated, the remaining Dark Shadow operatives who had ceased their attacks on the American defenders following their failed attempts, 
retreated. The Dark Shadow operatives would be the only Nibians to return to their homeland from this one-sided massacre. Due to the actions of Novask, he would later be remembered as a hero who saved the lives of 35,000 men. In months to come, his novel, Choices in War, would become a bestseller amongst Nobians and Sonarans alike. Chapter 14, The Scepter of Axniel, Nibian Throne Room, 8 a.m. Month 6, Day 11. The enemy has proven to be formidable. We have lost all five detachments, my lord. Wapt. W. We have lost all. I don't want you to repeat what you just said, imbecile. S. Sorry, my lord. Only 11 survivors. How many of them did we kill? Uh. 4. Your Majesty. The Dark Shadow Squad leader, Tempos, who had escaped from Fort Washington feared he had escaped only to face death once more. He looked meekly at the floor trying to maintain his composition. Fuur, Tempos felt sweat run down his back. If he couldn't find a way to calm the Emperor down, he would end up headless. Ah, well on the bright side our attack diverted a large portion of the Sonaran army. We can sneak into their capital with greater ease and land a decisive blow to their leadership. The Sonarans are getting bold because of the American victory. I need you to make them fear the Nibian Empire again. Ah. I just remembered. Our spies in the city of Sophius have reported the emergence of a magical artifact, from the ancient Axon Empire. They say it is a scepter that allows the wielder to command a near-infinite mana pool and grant magical powers upon even the magically inept. I want you to retrieve it for me. If you can't do this discreetly, you may take as much assistance as is necessary from our armies. Yes, your majesty. Holy shit, I thought he would have my head. I should probably just call upon the armies so I am guaranteed to retrieve the item. 20 miles from Fort Washington. 12 p.m. Month 6, Day 12. Three Humvees are traveling in a convoy as part of Alpha Team. The objective of this mission was to investigate the mysterious signals coming from the town of Sophias, about 160 miles south of Fort Washington. The signal began its emission about a week ago. But the mission was put on hold due to the concerns regarding the Nabian troops. With these concerns gone for the time being, this adventure was authorized. Kalmethus surmised that the signal may originate from a magical artifact, and thus he was added into the group. Captain Henry Downerger sat in the lead Humvee, driving with the two physicists and Kalmethus. Kalmethus, on the other hand, was busy pondering the mathematics of constructing such a vehicle. Over the past couple of weeks, Kalmethus and the two physicists have come to grow close as friends, which makes sense because of their academic backgrounds and similar senses of humor. Currently, the academics were sharing anecdotes about their students, and there was this one kid, Abraham Johnson, I will never forget his name, ha ha, well anyway his project was a powerful electromagnet, but the thing is, he forgot that he had metal keys in his pocket. Kalmethus and Nukita listened on, smiling in anticipation. So when he turned on his machine, he went flying. And in order to get unstuck, he had to slide his pants off. I was trying so hard not to laugh that I turned red. Ah ha 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 ha. Oh my gosh I'm tearing up. The rest of the group found this hilarious as well. And Kalmethus began with his story. You remember Ran Mythos? Yeah. Yes. Yesteryear. He was in the midst of an experiment while working with me. He was working on a new potion that can disguise people into different types of animals and sentient traces, and he was quite confident in his abilities. When he began testing, he tried it on himself and lo and behold, he had turned bright pink for a week. No amount of bathing could wash it off and he turned out to be pink and wrinkly from all his time in the bath. The scholars continued their storytelling, periodically earning laughs out of their driver. Meanwhile. In the second vehicle, Master Sergeant Tron Owens drove with Dr. Lacey Darwin and Dr. Illinois Jones. Jones was in the middle of describing his adventures in the forests of Brazil, searching for El Dorado, the lost city of gold. And then, boom, I accidentally activated a trap, which sent a large boulder hurtling after me. Luckily, I remembered the pathways of the labyrinth and I saw the locked door from earlier. Apparently the trap also opened the doorway, so I went in a second before the boulder crushed the ground where I was. So here I am, in this mysterious room, and what do I see? Gold, everywhere. And that's how I became a multimillionaire. Wow, just like the Indiana Jones movies, Lacey remarked. Ha ha, well, those movies are actually loosely based on true stories, Jones bragged, pointing a thumb at himself while smirking. 
Lacey blushed at this action. Wow, what a hero. Jones continued to tell tales of his past adventures as they forged along. The third vehicle was occupied by four new members of the group, Sergeants Ryan Williams, Richard Yu, Alex Gutierrez, and Sarah Hayes. Ryan was the team's original leader before being transferred to Alpha Team. Richard was the medic, Alex was the sniper, and Sarah was the mysterious newcomer and communications expert. The boys of this group were attempting to guess Sarah's origins, but she remained elusive. Maybe she's special forces, Ryan proposed. Sarah simply smiled, giving a classic reply. I cannot confirm nor deny that. Oh secret agent? Richard guessed. Ha ha. Sarah smirked and gave a wink to that guess. Maybe one day I'll tell you boys. The teams in the vehicles continued their bantering and storytelling for two more hours until they arrived at their destination. 160 miles from Fort Washington, City of Sophias, City Gates. 3 p.m. Man. That was a long drive, Alan complained. Indeed, my ass is currently sore. Nikita agreed. Henry laughed, as he was used to riding hours in uncomfortable vehicles as part of his time in the army. Hey, what is all that smoke coming from the city? Where are the guards? I don't know, I've visited Sophia's many times, but I have never sensed a feeling like this before. I hope Sari is safe. You three stay put. There are some recon drones in the third vehicle. We're gonna check it out. The soldiers of Alpha Team got out, greeting their commanding officer, Sir. At ease. Gutierrez, grab a recon drone from the back and check out the situation. Complying with the order, Alex flew a drone over the city walls. Holy shit. The scene he witnessed was terrible. The city had been attacked with the western and southern walls almost completely destroyed, and multiple buildings burning. What the hell happened? Sir, it looks like the city was attacked. Judging from the fires it seems like it happened not too long ago, perhaps yesterday. Alright, let's move in to investigate. As the convoy carefully navigated the city streets, they encountered a group of people piling some bodies. The convoy stopped allowing Calmethus and Henry to step out of their vehicle and inspect the situation. What happened here? Calmethus inquired. A ragged man from the group, his eyes devoid of light. He introduced himself as the governor's assistant. The Nubians attacked us. We had no warning and our defenses were overwhelmed by their massive army. Almost all of our defenders were killed, and the Nubians went to the Academy of Sophias. Calmethus eyes widened. He then turned to Henry. Quickly. Captain, we must get to the academy. I have heard that this artifact is the scepter of Axneel. As the convoy quickly sped off toward the academy, about a mile into the city, Kalmethus explained the properties of this scepter. The further they traveled, the more carnage they saw. Additional bodies littered the grounds, mostly guards. It seems that the Nibians had a deadline, and thus spared the civilians of this city from their wrath in order to capture the artifact. The academy is just around this corner. To the right, as the convoy turned the corner, they saw dozens of guards outside, catching their attention. Oh shit. All units, we've got hostiles inbound, 60 meters out. Get someone on the 50 calories. Not anticipating any combat, the Alpha team was organized into weird groups. As such, Tesla and Jones had to operate their respective vehicles so that the professionals could man the gunner turrets. Back up the vehicles to that open field over there. We're going to set up a concave there, using the city streets as a choke point. As the vehicles backed up, Henry sprayed at the incoming enemy soldiers, targeting the knights first. At last, the group backed up to Sophia's Park. As Nabian troops emerged from the street from which the Humvees came, they were ripped apart by .50 and 5.56 rounds. Concentrate fire on the street. Gutierrez, get a bird in the air and watch our flanks. Hayes, contact command and update them about our situation. Request reinforcements if possible. We need to get the artifact before the Nabians do. Da-da-da-da-da-da. Ag, what the hell? So our defeat wasn't just a rumor. So powerful. Curious residents, shocked by the strange noise erupting from the... 50 calories mounted guns, went to their windows to investigate. Witnessing the Nibians getting gunned down, they cheered. Moons damn it. We need to fall back to the academy. We cannot stay in this choke point any longer. We will use the close quarters environment of the academy to our advantage. The security personnel of Alpha Team managed to eliminate 43 Nibian hostiles before they retreated back to the academy. Despite their overwhelming firepower, 
they were still vulnerable to ambushes and surprise attacks. Due to this, Henry ordered the unit to wait for reinforcements. Kalmethus voiced his concerns. The presence of guards most likely means they are still attempting to crack whatever vault the scepter is kept in. Most likely, it is a matter of time before they do so. They will bring more wizards in order to overpower the magical safeguards of the vault, so we need to get your reinforcements as soon as possible. Tell your commanders that the scepter is a powerful artifact that can destroy entire cities if used by an enemy who is able to pair with it. Bear? Yes, the scepter and other magical artifacts have minds of their own and usually bear with those they deem worthy or powerful enough. The scepter in particular is known to prefer adventurous individuals, pure in their intentions. Okay, Hayes, inform command. Tell them we may have additional hostile reinforcements inbound, numbering in the thousands, alongside a hundred possibly holed up within the academy. Request granted. We will be dispatching six Apaches from the 49th Airborne Division alongside three platoons for defense against hostile reinforcements. We will send Luna and Terra squads to support your team with the extraction. ETA, 90 minutes. Chapter 15, The Scepter of Axneo Part 2 Ambassador Perry's Office, American Embassy, Sonris. 3.05 p.m. Ambassador Perry has just received word of the situation unfolding in Sophias, and contacted his Sonaran counterpart to relay the news. Ah, Ambassador Perry. Nice to hear from you again. Sind is greeted, still amazed by the technology given to her by the Americans. Hello Miss Sinders, I wanted to talk to you about two things. First of all, you must know that our team that we sent to Sophia's encountered Nabian soldiers within the city. What? Sindas exclaimed, flabbergasted. We believe the city was attacked by Nabian forces within the past 24 hours. According to reports from my team, the defenders were nearly wiped out but the civilian population was spared. The remaining Nubians are occupying the Academy of Sophias, Perry explained. Civilians? Ah, the villagers and residents of the city. Okay, that is a relief to hear, yet peculiar. The Nubians tend to enjoy executing and torturing the residents of our towns. And you say they are at the Academy of Sophias? Signed as pondered the implication of this. She recalled that the Academy was known for housing numerous artifacts and was famous for its archaeological research. Kalmethus says the Nibians are searching for a powerful magical artifact, which brings me to my second topic. I would be glad to extend our offer of friendship with your people and begin an alliance against the Nibians. Academy of Sophias 4.53 p.m. The sound of helicopter blades filled the air as curious locals came out of their homes to investigate. To their surprise, these tube-shaped flying machines contained people, who exited as similar machines flew overhead. The strangely clothed men who emerged from these floating wagons identified themselves as Americans, and informed the citizens of Sophias that they were here to fight the Nubians. These American soldiers wore strange uniforms that displayed an ugly pattern of greens and browns. What kind of soldier uniform is that? It looks so ugly, Tyron whispered. I have never seen a uniform like that in my life. I have heard that the soldiers of Meccan use green uniforms to blend in with their surroundings. Maybe these Americans are doing the same? Morta suggested. These other worlders seem strange indeed. Look at their flying machines and the teeth on them. How terrifying, Tyron commented. This Sonaran civilian was in fact referring to the paint job on some of the Apache helicopters, which depicted the teeth of Apex predators back on Earth. The locals of Sophias continued to discuss this amongst themselves and gaze at the other worlders in awe as the Americans prepared for their mission. The security personnel of Alpha Team Alongside Jones and Kelmethus walked up to a landed Chinook that contained Terra and Luna squads. The teams began introducing each other and their members. The leader of Terra squad and Luna squad identified themselves respectively as Master Chief Petty Officers Adam Wilkes and Brian Amada. Wilkes and Hamada gave salutes as they introduced themselves to Alpha Team. Nice to see you again Wilkes. Likewise, Sitrap, Wilkes inquired. We've got an unknown number of hostels inside the academy with the possibility of trapped civilians inside, Henry informed. Unlike the extraction in Sorn, the current mission at hand gave little time to prepare. The reinforcements arrived with scanning equipment and sensors, but creating a map of the academy would take too long. As such, Kalmethus would be a necessary member of the extraction team, 
consisting of Terra Squad and Alpha Team. Luna Squad on the other hand would evacuate any civilians trapped in the Academy and deal with any potential hostage situations. Alright, let's get our birds in the air. Hernandez, scan the building for heat signatures. Sir, looks like we've got about 60 total inside the building. There's a section of the building with 20 grouped inside. Looks like they're civvies. The rest are hostiles. The sensors can't penetrate the walls further into the compound. We should expect reinforcements to come from the depths of the facilities. Okay, here's the plan. Luna Squad will conduct a rescue operation for the 20 civvies. The rest of us will secure the package. We are going to be bringing two civilians on this mission. I'm sure you're already familiar with them. Master Wizard Kelmethus will act as our guide. Dr. Jones is here because of his expertise in navigating unfamiliar territory. Be advised, the hostiles may have teleportation capabilities so we absolutely cannot allow them to get to the package before us. Any questions? Alright good. Let's gear up and move out. Clear the West Wing. Luna 1. Left hallway clear. Right hallway clear. The tactical network between Luna Squad and the forward operations base came to life, with Sergeant Hernandez updating the team. Four guards on the next right. Secure that area and proceed down the hallway. The hostages are past the door at the end. Roger. All right. Kowalski, throw a flashbang around the corner. Three, two, one. Bang. The sounds of suppressed MP5 shots filled the room as each Nubian guard received four bullets to the chest and head. Hey, hope they're paying the custodians here well, Jacobs joked. Focus on the mission Luna 3. Let's get these civvies out of here before more guards show up. Luna squad rushed toward the door and unlocked it. They were greeted by terrified and confused faces which quickly turned into relieved ones as Luna's squad revealed their intentions. With the hostages secured, all they had to do was get to the extraction point outside the front gates. All right, hostages secured. Moving to extraction point, Hamada informed. Be advised, hostile mages pouring into the left wing. I can count six mages and ten infantrymen waiting for you outside that door. Damn, we can take them easily but we can't risk losing any of our hostages. We should make our own exit. I'll let the higher-ups deal with any damage expenses. O'Neill, get your C4 charges on that wall over there. Yes sir. Once the C4 charges were set, Luna Squad made sure the blast zone was clear before activating the explosives. Boom. That hole is only big enough for two people at a time. Jacobs, take these civvies and lead them to the extraction point. Hernandez will guide you. The rest of us. We need to protect them as they exit. Hold this hallway. The remaining Luna squad members switched their weapons to full auto, seeing that mages were included in the hostile force. They fired their weapons in excellent coordination, focusing down the mages first. Sir, shouldn't their shields go down faster? Despite having emptied two, 30 round, magazines worth of rounds into the mages' shields, the opacity of the shields only decreased by about 50%. Normally, a mage could withstand about 10 bullets before losing shields. These mages had double the shield strength of previous mages since the Nubians, having analyzed past battles, figured out that focusing their shielding into a specific area would amplify the durability of the shield. These mages left their backs unprotected in order to strengthen their frontal shielding. Keep shooting. Kowalski, another flash. As Luna 2 prepares another flash. He suddenly heard a teammate scream. I can't see, yelled O'Neill. The Nabian mages casted a flare spell down the hallway, blinding Luna 4 as he attempted to take down the shields. Evidently, the Nabians picked up some tactics from their encounters with the Americans, learning to use flare spells as primitive magical flashbangs, albeit without the bang. Banks, Taylor, cover fire. Kowalski, throw the stun once the shields are down. With the shields at less than 30% power, it didn't take long before the Americans were able to destroy the shields and kill three Nubian infantrymen. With the shields down, the remaining Nubian forces attempted to escape into the surrounding rooms, but were quickly incapacitated by a well-timed stun grenade. The blinded and deafened mages began to attack randomly, hoping to score a lucky hit, but they were required to restrain themselves to avoid friendly fire. Seeing they were out of options, they surrendered. Huh. Didn't expect them to surrender. Alright let's disarm them and take them to the extraction point. Still got those handcuffs? Yeah, 
but only enough for the mages. A good enough. Let's move out. Intel says they've got about 20 guards at the entrance to Mythos Hall. Past that, sensors don't work, so we're going in blind. Wilkes informed. Of the 20 guards, the team identified five to be mages. In order to take out the hostile forces, both teams planned a surprise attack, with the mages designated as priority targets. At the moment, the mages were vulnerable, and the American teams deemed it necessary to eliminate the magical threat before they could conjure any spells or shields. Five well-placed shots were followed by the sounds of bodies dropping and guards screaming. The remaining Nubians however were unable to communicate with their brethren as they were quickly mowed down by automatic fire, shortly after the mages were killed. With the guards outside dead, the American teams moved in. These operatives were experienced reflected by their calculated movements. Without saying any words, the men were able to cover all angles and clear the rooms. Eventually, they stumbled onto a Nubian team looting some magical devices. Unfortunately for the Nubians, not a single member of their guard was paying attention. All Nubians present were scrambling to plunder the facility. Consequently, they were gunned down with relative ease. No more hostiles around here. Man I'm starting to feel sorry for these guys. Alex said. Richard looked over to Alex, agreeing with him. Yeah, why don't they just surrender? Sarah scoffed, evidently seeing the answer. Because men have such big egos. Ha <laughs> ha. The members of Terra Squad on the other hand remain silent. Alright, cut the chatter. Henry ordered. The vault is right past these research quarters. Explained Kalmethis. Slowly, the American teams crept up toward the vault and waited as Kalmethis prepared his unlock spell. This will take about five minutes. MMMPH. Quiet. Ah, damn it, what do I do? They're going to bust in here any moment. The Nubian mage within the vault thought aloud. Panicking, he struggled to make decisions. He had two choices to abandon his mission and leave the scepter, or to quickly attempt to unlock the sealed container holding the scepter. So far, his hostage was not complying with any of his commands, refusing to open the container. Unfortunately for the Nubian mage, he did not have any experience in interrogation techniques, nor did he have any suggestibility helmets to help make his prisoner follow his orders. He had no incentive for his prisoner to unlock the container, and most importantly, he had no time. If he abandoned the mission and went back to his Nubian commanders, he would surely be executed for his failures. Suddenly. He had a realization. He decided to threaten the hostage in order to force the people outside the door to open the container. The Sonarans wouldn't dare risk the life of one of their most talented mages, and any Americans here would also adhere to the same principles as the Sonarans. With no time left, he grabbed the hostage and summoned a shadowy object near her neck. At this point, the vault door began to glow, signifying the completion of the unlock process and swung open. American forces streamed through the doorway, accompanied by Kalmethus and Jones. They kept their guns trained on the Nubian mage in the hostage, unsure what to do. Stand back. Any step closer and I will kill her, the Nubian commanded. His eyes darted around the room, attempting to keep track of the other worlders' threat. Sorry. Kalmethus exclaimed. You there, the Nubian said, acknowledging Kalmethus with his eyes. Release the scepter to me, and the girl will live. Kalmethus. Frustrated with himself due to his inner conflict, was given two options, serve his nation with loyalty, or save the life of his treasure daughter. Now, the Nubian yelled. Kalmethus began to move toward the container and initiate the unlock process. Hey, what are you doing? Get back here. Wilkes ordered. I'm sorry, but I can't lose sorry, Kalmethus replied. Damn it. Command, we have a hostage situation. So Naran Asset is giving in to the Nubian demands. Orders? Asked Henry. After a short silence, the orders were spread throughout the team's tactical network. After a minute, Kalmethus opened the container, and the Nubian moved toward it in order to grab the scepter. If he could simply touch it, he would gain access to its powers, although not to the fullest extent as this requires a pairing. Still, he would have enough mana to summon a shield invulnerable to the other worlders' weapons. As he approached the container, he made a fatal mistake by letting his guard down and allowing his grip on the hostage to slip. Bang! A flashbang went off, blinding the Nubian. Instinctively, he put his hands over his eyes, effectively releasing the hostage, who was secured by an American operative. The Nubian on the other hand, was instantly reduced to a lifeless bloody heap. Well, good job folks, Wilkes sighed. 
Relieved that yet another hostage rescue mission was over, Kalmethis proceeded to untie Sari before embracing her, glad that she was relatively unharmed. Their father-daughter reunion however was abruptly cut short as Jones approached the scepter, basking in its glory. He stepped a little bit too close, and suddenly the scepter glowed before zooming toward his hand. What the hell? Pulses of bluish light began to emanate from the scepter as the frequency of these pulses intensified becoming constant. The American units stepped back as they witnessed Dr. Jones being engulfed in this light, his eyes glowing. Some had incredibly baffled expressions while others were ready to engage a possible new threat. Suddenly, the light dimmed and Jones dropped to his knees, only muttering one phrase. Holy shit. Chapter 16, Siege of Sophias Part 1. Author's Note I'm going to updating more regularly soon. One of my finals was cancelled so that'll give me more time to work on my story. Thank you all for your continued support. Join my Discord using the following code, NTBNW. Edits. Change timeline to 10 years instead of 5. Academy of Sophias. 5.09 PM. My essence to your mind. My thoughts to your thoughts. You will see my experiences from the perspective of previous partners and understand your mission. Greater than. All of a sudden, the world around Jones faded away, as he entered a trance. What he saw was like a surreal virtual reality movie. It all started at the beginning, with the creation of the scepter. It was forged in the lost Axon continent, to be used by one of the Axon's most esteemed generals in their war against the races of the world. The scepter contained an ancient crystal, even by the Axon's standards left behind by a technologically and magically advanced precursor race. This source of power complemented the natural abilities of the Axons well, but required a host that was pure of mind. The first wielder of the scepter, Grand General Avis, was indeed pure of mind, but toward the evil side of the spectrum. He only had one goal, the extermination of all other sentient species in the world. The scepter itself abhorred this goal and as such granted Avis only a fraction of its power. Still, this power was enough for Avis to summon unstoppable armies and cataclysmic magics. It was only after a daring raid by Alliance heroes that the survivors of the Central Continents were able to begin fighting back. Now under the possession of a great human hero, the Scepter unleashed its power as the Alliance casted a spell that rid the world of the entire Axon Continent. Deeming the powers of the Scepter too great for any one man to hold. The scepter was stored in vaults and transferred to various nations as a gift, or for research purposes. With visions of the past now complete, the scepter gave a mission to Jones. Space-time is now unstable. I will give you my memories and my powers to help defend against them, but we cannot risk attempting another mass teleportation. You must inform your scientist friends and your government, the Axon Empire will return. You have ten years to prepare. Greater than. Jones felt his legs collapse, his body tired from the event that had just occurred. He fell to his knees before looking up at his worried comrades. Holy shit. After confirming his well-being, the team moved to continue extraction. While exiting the academy, Jones informed his team members about his visions, and the dire warning provided by the scepter, which could apparently communicate telepathically with him and grant him powers. Really? Do a magic trick for us. Alex requested. He was smiling like a kid, true to his personality. The other team members watched on, smirking and raising their eyebrows in curiosity. I'm not a tool for magic tricks. You can't see me doing this but I'll have you know that I am shaking my head right now. Greater than. Ah. Come on. I'd like to see what I'm capable of now as well. Very well. You have access to my database. Greater than. So I can download memories just like the Matrix? Ah, let me see. I am currently scanning your memories for any such terms. Yes, my original creators, Homo Magus Sapiens, had technologies similar to what I see in your mind. Greater than. Jones gave a surprised expression confusing the other members of the team. What's wrong? Wilkes asked. All right, I'm just talking to the crystal inside the scepter. Oh my apologies. He wants to be called Omnis. Well anyway, Omnis here says he originated from a precursor race of humans. Magically and technologically advanced humans. According to him, these humans were involved in a galactic disaster that forced them to abandon this galaxy millions of years ago. Jones explained. Interesting. 
Camethus remarked, Our own legends say that humans came to this world by a portal that opened up in what is now the Divinian homeland. It all makes sense now, seeing how Divinian science and magic function together. They are possibly the descendants of these ancient humans. The team continued to discuss amongst themselves the implications of such findings. What happens to the theory of evolution? Jones decided to talk to Lacey about this later. Hey, what about the magic trick? Alex reminded. Ah. Right, Jones sighed. Sorting through Omnis database, he found a simple summoning spell, and after channeling the magic of the scepter, summoned fire in his free hand. You have access to my mana pool, and although it is unlimited, it is only as good as your stamina and creativity. You still need to train your capabilities in order to avoid fatigue. The spell you chose has the same energy equivalent of walking a few steps. But the mages in this world can help you increase the efficiency of your casting. Greater than. Right, I'll remember to do that. Good thing I have excellent stamina from my seal training. The members of the team were astounded, with some even clapping. I bet Command would love to find out more about this. Anyone from DARPA would probably get an orgasm haha. <laughs> Richard commented. Academy outskirts, extraction point. 5.24 p.m. As the rescuers from Terra Squad and Alpha Team rushed toward the sounds of the Chinooks, they received communication from a drone operator back at Fort Washington. The Nubians, having received no messages from their garrison within the academy, were beginning to amass outside the crumbling western walls. They were preparing to send scouting parties to determine the status of their own extraction team and command has relayed the order to evacuate the hostages on the Chinooks. Meanwhile, all combat-capable personnel would help defend the city, as per Sindas and Perry's requests. The forces outside Sophias amounted to 3,000 warriors, but the forces of the Sonaran defenders stationed in the city were whittled down to less than 100. As such, the American forces currently in Sophias would need to hold the line against the Nubian attackers. Currently, there were four platoons and six AH-64 Apache attack helicopters available to defend the city. The platoons are already engaging the enemy at the western gate. It's a mile out, but there shouldn't be any significant obstacles on the road so we're going to take our vehicles to support them. Luna Squad already secured the hostages and departed. Let's move out. I only saw four of those flying wagons and each one had around 20 people. If my time at the academy was worthwhile, then that means there are any other worlders here to defend, not counting the six scary-looking machines, Tyron analyzed. The Nabians started off with about 5,000 but we did manage to put up a fight. 80 against 3,000 doesn't look like a fair mashup. Well, I did hear rumors about their achievements near the Grandin Plains. Apparently only a couple thousand defenders took on a whole Nubian army with 100,000 soldiers. Plus they were able to ground the entire Nubian Air Corps. And that's a ratio of... I, I cannot remember how to do these calculations. That's unfortunate. I need to study again since I've got an examination in a few months. Hopefully they'll push it back because of this ordeal. Ha ha, of course. Well. I can't wait to see what these other worlders have in store for the Nubians. Chapter 17, Siege of Sophias Part 2, Sophias Western Gate, 5.10 PM. Commander Vola, I am Lieutenant Colonel Ava Keys with the United States Army. I am the commanding officer of the American forces here. Commander Vola raised an eyebrow, intrigued that this attractive blonde woman was not only in the army, but also served as an officer. He had many questions he wanted to ask her and much judgment he wished to pass on to the Americans. However, considering that the Americans had far superior firepower, he decided to keep his mouth shut and just go along with it. Perhaps these foreigners saw something in their women that the natives of Gay Era couldn't. What is your strategy, ma'am? Keys pondered for a bit, with her hand on her chin, before answering. I was thinking, we can use some of the debris as cover against arrows. Your footmen can help defend our ranged attackers using their shields, while your mages cast wind spells to blow enemy arrows away. And make sure your troops don't stand directly in front of mine, our weapons require precise aiming. That will just delay the inevitable. We are outnumbered 150 to 1. Perhaps we must retreat? Vola suggested. And let the Nabians slaughter the fine residents of this city? Keys asked. Vola looked down ashamed in himself that a woman could show more courage than him. He began to speak again but was promptly interrupted by Keys. Look, we just need to hold for 10 minutes, 
until reinforcements arrive. Let my soldiers do their job, and make sure your soldiers do theirs. If everything goes according to plan, we won't lose a single man. Very well. I will direct my forces according to your strategy. We have a man down. We need a medic. Don't pull out the arrow yet, we don't want to cause too much bleeding. The Sonaran soldier nodded, and allowed himself to be pulled back to safety. Davis. Take his shield just in case. The American soldiers fought ferociously, their weapons tearing through the armor of the Nubian infantry. The Nubians, learning from this, began to use the environment to their advantage, lying behind rocks for cover and using flare spells to create an opening to push through. The Nubians forgoed the implementation of large shield spells and instead used speed spells in order to move to other pieces of cover more quickly, alongside making themselves harder targets to hit. Because of this, and the generous amount of cover that the ruined walls provided, the Nubians were able to close the distance without too many losses. The defending forces countered this by pinning down the rushing Nubians behind cover, then using projectiles with a parabolic trajectory in order to hit the Nubians. The Sonarans used their arrows to do this whereas the American soldiers cleared out groups of Nubians with their grenades, launchers and XM-25 air burst systems. Run! They threw another exploding rock. Boom! Five Nubians were skewered by an M-67 fragmentation grenade that landed by their piece of cover. A few meters away, the same scenario almost happened with another Nubian group but a mage there was able to cast a shield, which the grenade bounced off. The resulting explosion in the air was able to slightly deplete the shields, but not by much. In an attempt to conserve energy, the mage only casted his shield spells whenever he saw an exploding rock thrown at him. However, he never anticipated an exploding bullet. The angle from which the XM-25 projected arrived was low enough that it could not be detected by the mage's line of sight. By the time he saw the projectile, everyone below it was showered with the instruments of death. High explosive grenades detonated all over hiding Nubians, killing many. Despite their efforts in learning from the enemy, the technological difference was simply too vast for the enemies to truly understand the capabilities of the American weapons, thus leading to misunderstandings. They simply could not counter the sheer firepower and mind-shattering mechanics of the otherworlders' weapons. Despite their unrelenting fire, the Nubians pushed ever closer, forcing the American troops to pull back slightly as they performed a tactical retreat. We need air support. Requesting close air support from Hunter 3. Request confirmed. A volley of Hydra 70 unguided rockets flew towards a large formation of Nubian infantry hiding behind some rubble. The onslaught resulted in the complete annihilation of this particular clump of troops, boosting the morale of the American and Sonaran defenders considerably. The Sonarans stood in awe at the marvelous sight, believing that gods have descended to aid them in their battle. Vola himself was speechless. This is Hunter 3. Armaments depleted. We're RTB for resupply. The last of the AH-64 Apache attack helicopters left the scene, all having expended their ammunition. The attack helicopters alone were able to decimate nearly a thousand enemy soldiers, but as they retreated to rearm, the Nubians pushed further. Shit, are we all out of air support? Commands bringing us some fighter support, but they're still about 20 minutes out. Amidst the shouts of combat, the sound of a vehicle pulling up could be heard. Hope we're not late to the party, joked Alex. The combatants from Alpha Team, Terra Squad, and Luna Squad disembarked from their vehicles, ready to join the fight. The Humvees in which they arrived were strategically spread out, in order to provide maximum coverage for the .50 caliber turrets mounted on the vehicles. The other civilian scientists from Alpha Team were directed to the Chinooks earlier on, Aside from Kelmethus and Jones since they were deemed to be important assets in the battlefield. Seeing a master wizard in their ranks now, the Sonaran defenders cheered. The American soldiers also cheered, seeing the arrival of highly experienced special forces members. The reinforcements joined the battle, pinning down some incoming Nubians using grenades and machine gun fire. Two tangos behind a wooden cart. One o'clock. Got em. Six hostiles neutralized to the left. Hey! What is that flickering coming from over there, behind those rocks? Kelmethus saw this, and immediately cast a shield, blocking an incoming lightning strike from a pair of Nubian mages, who were promptly turned into headless bodies. Jones took cover behind a Humvee, trying to navigate through Omnis data in order to learn spells. Considering the large amount of debris in the area, 
Jones summoned golems from pieces of the ruined walls that the Nubians hiding behind. Five stone golems began to terrorize the Nubian lines, distracting the opposing mages from the offensive and forcing them to scramble to destroy the golems. The battle raged on, but eventually the American soldiers began to run out of ammo. This was reflected in the decreasing frequency of weapons fire coming from the defenders, and the Nubians, having noticed this, seized the opportunity. They rushed into semi automatic fire hoping to overrun the defenders. The Sonaran footmen prepared for close quarters combat, and some of the Americans, now out of ammo on their primary weapons, pulled out their sidearms. In an attempt to buy time, Jones used his scepter to fire blasts of energy at the Nubians, scoring a kill for each hit he landed. The approaching forces were unfazed by this, as it was only a matter of time before he became exhausted. Jones, being a famed adventurer, could easily outrun and outmaneuver the Nubians, who had to run with at least 40 pounds of equipment. However, not all of the American and Sonaran defenders had his talents. Additionally, there were a few injured who were currently being transferred to the Humvees. The defenders slowly moved back east, toward a designated area. Almost halfway to the academy, this area was the second to last line of defense. The gate to the inner city received minor damage in the initial assault on Sophius and could be used as a key bottleneck. Before the defenders retreated to their fortifications behind the gate, they wanted to whittle down the enemy forces as much as possible. Charging Nubians tanked small arms fire, shrugging off the pain due to the adrenaline from this battle. The Sonaran defenders protected the American infantry behind them the best they could, engaging the enemy in melee combat. Clashes of steel continued until the Americans finally depleted their 5.56 and 50 calories ammunition stores. Jones and Kelmathus were also starting to get tired from casting so many spells. It was clear at this point that the defenders would be overrun, so they began a tactical retreat, leading the Nubians into a more defensible position with makeshift barricades. As the last of the defenders jumped behind the barricades, a peculiar sound deafened the soldiers on the battlefield. View The Americans looked up to the sky with smiles on their faces. While the Sonarans and Nubians looked up with confusion, as they had never seen a fighter jet before. The F 15 E jets zoomed past, shattering the glass on nearby windows, before abruptly ascending and disappearing out of sight. The only trace of their presence was a scattering of objects that fell toward the Nubian lines. My friend was a communications mage in the 7th Detachment. I heard that they were obliterated by flying swords in the sky. View. Like those? Yes and they dropped something on us that produced great explosions and tremors. The Nubians in this particular soldier's group looked up to the sky as the jets roared past, seeing dark objects getting larger as they came closer to the ground. Run. Those are the things my friend told me about. Run. Six Nubian soldiers fled the battlefield, running away from the choke point their brethren had piled up around. They sprinted with all their might getting about 40 meters from the blast zone before they finally landed and exploded, wiping out the large clump of Nubians gathered behind them. These were the last of the Nubians, numbering about 300. The intense fighting culminated in this final moment as precision-guided bombs rained down on the crowded Nubian formation, all of them trying to bust through the gate to the inner city. Consumed with bloodlust, these unfortunate souls didn't even realize that they would soon be annihilated by a force they had never seen before. Bodies flew through the air as the Nubian infantry was blown away by the bombs. The six Nubians who ran were showered with pieces of debris and charred body parts. To them, it seemed like a demonic occurrence. What the hell? One of them yelled, panting from the quick sprint. Are we the only ones left? His comrades could not respond. Shell shocked by the power of American jets. Fires raged around the six Nubians as black smoke filled the air. They looked toward the street that their brethren had been trying to pass through and saw only smoke. The staccato from the enemy weapons had ceased, signifying the deaths of their Nubian comrades. They looked at each other with worried faces, uncertain about their fate. If they ran, they would be unable to escape as the fields past the city walls were open ground. They could only surrender and accept their fate. The smoke cleared as American and Sonaran troops emerged from the inner gate. A gust of wind put out all the fires around the area, 
pushing the Nubians to the ground. Soon enough they were surrounded, and thus the six survivors dropped their weapons, putting their hands up. Secure the prisoners. The Sonarans are giving us jurisdiction because of our efforts here. Intel says there's no enemy movement around here for a hundred mile radius, so we're going to head back to Fort Washington. That was a hell of a mission, boys. Let's go home. Chapter 18 Defection. Author's note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. This chapter is my longest yet, at 3.5k words, which is twice the length of the average chapter. Do you all prefer longer chapters such as this? Please join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Somewhere in Sophias, in a room dark as night, a man peeked through curtains on a window, watching the celebrations on the street below. The citizens of Sophias were celebrating their recent victory against the Nubians, parading around the city and giving gifts to newly arrived American soldiers, who humbly refused most of them. Director Tempos sighed in frustration, he had failed Emperor Novus not once, with the North Grendon Plains massacre, but twice, with his failure at Sophias. Surely, if he reported back to his emperor he would promptly be executed for incompetence. For him, it felt as if the world was falling apart. He wanted to serve the Nubian Empire, but he had always felt that Emperor Novus was a subpar leader. Novus was way too obsessed with continuing his forefathers' work, to eliminate the Sonaran peoples. On the other hand, Tempos merely wished to see the prosperity of his fellow countrymen. The Sonarans, whether they existed or not were of no concern to this goal. Novus Ego led to great victories against the Sonarans in the opening months of the war, but his pride would be the downfall of his nation. Emboldened by these victories, Novus and his war hawk lackeys underestimated the American forces. Even with the massive defeat on the North Grendon Plains, they still would not reevaluate their strategies. Only when the Nubian people are dead would the Emperor finally see the error of his ways. Because of this, Tempos decided to put an end to this madness, the lives of his people were worth more than an insane emperor's pride. Tempos unveiled the curtains on the window before beginning to pack. The sunlight streamed through and lit up the room, freshening the atmosphere. This would mark a new chapter in the Nubian Empire's history. Tempos walked down a street, following a sand-colored metal carriage that was currently being surrounded by grateful Sonarans. As he walked, he inspected the metal carriage. It was similar to the ones reported by the subordinates who botched the ransom mission in Sorn. Thinking back, he remembered his time in Meccan, and remembered seeing the metal carriages there. The Meccans back then had just recently unveiled their machine, calling it an automobile or car. The American cars seemed to be larger and more effective in terms of transportation, although he did realize that the only American vehicles he had seen were ones designed for war. Still, the discrepancies between the American and Meccanese vehicles were wholly evident, and implied a greater understanding of science amongst the American engineers. He also remembered seeing the flying machines as they thundered past his hideout, and hearing the explosions off to the distance. The explosions created by these machines were so massive that they could rival even the most powerful weapons present in the Divinion arsenal, and maybe even surpass them. If the Nubians had no chance against even the Meccanese, then surely they would face similar circumstances against the Americans. As he continued to think about this, the crowd thinned out. Excuse me sir, but we are going to need you to step aside. You are blocking the road for our other vehicles. Tempos snapped out of his trance, and faced the dark-skinned soldier in front of him. How exotic, he thought. Ah, sorry about that. Are you the Americans? Yes. Oh. Good. Can you please take me to your commanding officer? I have important information about a Nubian attack. I'm a political refugee from Nubia, Tempos informed. The soldier then brought a dark box close to his face and began talking to it, confusing Tempos. To his astonishment, the box replied. Such communication was common in many places around Gay Era, but this was accomplished through magical means. What kind of magic are the Americans capable of? He wondered. After a short discussion with the box, the soldier turned toward Tempos. Okay, you can get in the car. We will take you to our base, the soldier said, gesturing toward the back door of the vehicle. Tempos stood there, staring at the vehicle. He did not know how to open the vehicle's door. The soldier, realizing that he was basically communicating with an alien, 
opened the door for the gay Aaron man. Tempos climbed inside, inspecting the various devices within. He looked outside the window to his left, watching soldiers setting up tents and strange devices. This must be a base of sorts or perhaps a checkpoint, he guessed. After they were finished with their tasks, some of them returned to the vehicle convoy in which he sat. With their mission complete, the convoy departed. The ride lasted about three hours, during which Tempos asked various questions about the Humvee and life on Earth. He carefully worded his questions so as to not seem suspicious. He did not want to be mistaken for a spy trying to glean intelligence on American technologies. While conversing with the Americans, his earlier prejudices about their peoples faded. The Americans seemed proud to be a nation founded on the principles of liberty and freedom, which confused him since he wondered how such an idealistic nation could exist. Their answer made absolute sense. As soldiers he was talking to quoted a great man from his nation's history. Speak softly and carry a big stick. The soldier explained to him that the Americans generally sought peaceful solutions but were always capable of defending themselves and others against the evils of the world. To him, the U.S. seemed like a benevolent god that protected the rights of the innocent. The soldier further elaborated on his nation's actions in the past, noting that while they weren't perfect, they hoped to be a good example for the rest of humanity, a shining city upon a hill. Indeed, Tempos was interested in the beacon of hope that the United States portrayed itself to be. In fact, Tempo's political ideologies were influenced by reformists, who had progressive views on the rights of people. Reformation philosophers were similar to 18th century Enlightenment thinkers in a way, although the movement didn't seem to be as popular in gay era as it was on Earth. He also learned that magic doesn't exist on Earth. Initially, he was quite surprised, but then he thought of the Mechanese. Their people had arrived through a portal on their continent before the portal disappeared and stranded them on Gay Era. Their civilization, like those of the Americans, had no magic and thus they advanced their scientific technology. For the case of the Mechanese, it was a case of survival. Surrounded by magic, the Mechanese had to develop new technologies at a feverish pace and eventually they surpassed the capabilities of many magic-capable nations, even catching up to the Divinian Empire. As Tempos learned more about the Americans, his fears for the fate of the Nibian Empire grew. The United States had a population of over 300 million people, which was as much as the Divinian Empire. If they had the same army population ratios as the Nibian Empire, then they would be outnumbered 20 to 1. To add to this, the immense firepower of the Americans would allow them to crush the Nubians, evident in the catastrophic results of the battles in the North Grendon Plains and Sophias. Tempos solidified his resolve, determined now more than ever to help put an end to this bloodshed. Fort Washington, please make yourself comfortable in the lounge. General Harding and Ambassador Perry will arrive shortly to discuss with you. The first thing he noticed while entering the American structure was the temperature. It was still relatively hot outside and the night was just beginning to cool the environment. In the lounge however, Tempos was greeted by a pleasant breeze that circulated the room, maintaining a constant, cool temperature. What kind of power allows these people to make a room comfortably cool like this? He wondered. While waiting, Tempos admired the design of the room itself, particularly mesmerized by the fluorescent lights above. He walked over to a switch that he had seen the soldier interact with earlier figuring that this was connected to the lights somehow. The switch was currently angled upward, and Tempos pushed it down, turning off the lights. How fascinating, Tempos thought to himself, mouth slightly agape. He continued to play with the lights until he heard someone cough. Ahem, General Harding coughed, attracting the attention of Tempos. Like a child caught red-handed, Tempos immediately stopped touching the switch and hid his hands behind his back. Ah. Hello there. I see that you've discovered how our lights work. I'm General Harding and this man here, he said, gesturing towards Perry, is Ambassador Perry. Perry simply asked to make this quick, tired from his trip back to the base. Perry was in the process of being reassigned to handle negotiations with the Nubians, following the previous battles against them. Since he was on a break, he was requested by General Harding to have a discussion with an apparent Nubian political refugee. I am Tempos. Director he said before stopping and correcting himself. Well, 
I am the former director of the Dark Shadow Agency. I have escaped from the Nubian Empire because Emperor Novus is a madman who has ruined my agency. It won't be long before he ruins the country at this point. I seek your aid in restoring dignity to the Nubian throne. Should your negotiations fail, how do you propose restoring this dignity? General Harding asked, curious about his wording. Tempos explained that he wanted to plan a coup against the Emperor. I have a few assets in the Dark Shadow who are loyal to me. They know the location of the Emperor's imprisoned son, Lonad Novus, who I believe can be installed as the new Emperor. The problem is that I cannot trust the rest of the Dark Shadow and therefore I cannot stage a rescue operation for Lonad. I am aware of your achievements in the town of Sorn and in the Academy of Sophias in rescuing those hostages, so I have come to you otherworlders for help. How popular are Lonad Novus and the Emperor himself? Perry questioned. He thought back to the events of the Iranian Revolution. If the selected heir was not popular, then the public may choose to overthrow him, especially if they loved the Emperor. Even if the Emperor was disposed of, he still may have loyal followers such as generals or other nobles who may rally the public against the new ruler. During the Iranian Revolution, Ruhala, Aitola, Khomeini led the Iranian people against the Shah, and successfully overthrew him, becoming supreme leader. In the process, he abolished the monarchy and the last Shah was exiled from the country. If Lanad harbored strong political views that don't align with those of the general public, then a more moderate leader would have to be selected, which presents a problem because Lanad is next in line for succession, as per royal traditions. Lanad Novus was imprisoned because he threatened the throne with his popular support. Normally, this wouldn't be an issue and instead would be preferred by the emperor. The thing is, Lonad had a lot of reformist ideals. He called for greater individuality and power to the people, rather than the concentration of power for the emperor. He also wanted to establish a senate so that the voices of the public could be heard. The most offensive of all, though, was his call to end the war against the Sonarans. A lot of our people were starting to wake up as Lonad spread his messages, dismantling the propaganda that the emperor had instilled into our populace. The people used to hate the Sonarans because of this propaganda, but thanks to Lonad, the people began to realize that our war against the Sonarans was unjustified. The Sonarans were branded as heretics for worshipping the sun, but why? The sun and moons coexist to bring life to gay era. With only the sun, the whole planet would be scorched. With only the moons, the whole planet would be frozen over. Perry nodded at this, admiring Tempo's logic and open-mindedness. As he listened to Tempo's, though, he realized something about the Sonarans. Ending the war and reconciling with the Sonarans would be preferable, yes. But, how can they, after all the destruction and death they've suffered through? Perry asked. Tempo's remained silent for a few seconds. Not sure how to answer the question. Then, he conceded. We started the war for unjust reasons. We created this evil when there was once none. Because of this, we need to atone for our sins, but without further bloodshed. Tempos sighed. To be truthful, I do not know what we can do. Perry nodded in understanding. That's okay. That'll be the job of Lonad anyway. And I'm sure he's got something in minutes since he wanted to end the war in the first place. General Harding then interrupted. Remembering Tempo's reason for being here, an impending attack. Addressing Tempo's, he asked, You said you wanted to inform us of an attack. Can you tell me anything you know about that? Ah, right. The Nubian Empire is currently short on resources. The North Grandin Plains must be secured in order to access the resources underneath the ground, so as you know, an invasion force was dispatched. Since you were able to defeat the invasion force so easily, the Emperor is now wary about fighting you otherworlders and he wishes to avoid you. Tempos saw the two Americans relax a little bit once he said this. This brings me to my next point. I came to you as a refugee because I thought you were neutral in the conflict between us and the Sonarans, but I have just learned that you have entered an alliance with the Sonarans. The Emperor does not know of this yet. I do not know the specific terms of your alliance. But I assume you will help the Sonarans defend against attacks in some way. Since no one in the Nubian Empire is currently aware of this, they decided to launch an offensive in the South Grandin Plains, about 100 miles southwest of Sophias. They want to access the Ovine Mountains in order to secure mineral resources for weapons manufacturing. I see. Thank you for letting me know. I'll contact the Sonarans and develop a strategy with them. 
General Harding said, My people are not monsters, they are just guided. Please do not massacre them, Tempos pleaded. I will do what I can, Harding reassured. But if they do not want to surrender, then that's on them. Tempos nodded, understanding that there would be nothing else that could be done in such a situation. With nothing else left to say, the American general thanked Tempos for his information and left. Perry stayed behind for a few moments informing Tempos of his situation. Since you're a refugee, and we're not allowed to bring any natives back to our world yet, you may stay here until we finish construction on the town by the base, or until it's safe to go back to the Nubian Empire. Someone will come in shortly to bring you to your new quarters. You may visit the cafeteria and explore the base, but just be sure to not bother any soldiers if they're busy. Thank you for your hospitality, Ambassador Perry. Upon hearing this, Perry left, wishing the Nabian refugee a good night. Tempos, now all alone, stared at the light switch. He fought the urge to go over to it, instead thinking about the recent discussion. He needed to make contact with his few loyal assets in order to inform them of the situation, and protect them from Novus should they be targeted. While preparing plans to contact one of his assets in Sonris, his thoughts were interrupted by a woman who came into the room. Director Tempos, I shall guide you to your quarters. Tempos left the room with the woman, who brought him to a small room before wishing him a good night and leaving. Not very spacious, as he was accustomed to as nobility, but comfortable. The bedding was indubitably of the highest quality, and was arguably better than anything available to even the upper classes of the Nubian Empire. The room was plain, having a desk near the bed and a smaller room with a handle. Curious, Tempos went to inspect the miniature house and upon opening its door, was startled by the freezing air being emitted from it. Immediately, he closed it, but then reopened it to inspect its contents. He was amazed, finding ice-cold drinks. It was the season of Sola, yet these Americans were able to control the weather with their science. He still couldn't believe that these people had no magic at all. After analyzing the contents of the mini-fridge, Tempos selected a redkin with swirling designs on it. They seemed to form characters from the language that these otherworlders speak. For a while, he struggled to open the can, but realized that he had to use the lever on the can in order to break open a seal. Having done so, he took a sip of the drink. His eyes widened as carbonated goodness flowed down his throat. This is incredible, he whispered to himself. Tempos made a mental note to ask someone about this drink tomorrow. Enjoying the can of Coca Cola, Tempos looked over to the light switch. This night would be fun. Ina, Eanif Imperium Capital. Imperial Archive. Emperor Vox of Valian sat next to a desk, stroking his beard. He was about to retire for the night, but had received important news from a spy in the Sonaran city of Sophias. The war between the Sonarans and Nubians was going well, with both sides weakening each other. The spy reported a loss of a few thousand soldiers on both sides in Sophias. But there was something interesting about the Nabian losses. According to the spy, strange men with ugly green clothing, assumed to be otherworlders, came to the aid of the Sonarans and annihilated the Nabian forces. What's more interesting is the circumstances of the battle. Apparently, less than a hundred of these otherworlders, backed by a few metal dragons of varying shapes and a man wielding the scepter of Axneel, were able to decimate almost 3,000 Nubian soldiers. The spy could not confirm any losses on the side of the otherworlders, although some were injured. This was troubling, Emperor Vox thought to himself. His plans of continental unification now lay in uncertain waters, since he had not expected the emergence of a powerful foe. It is true that his own armies could accomplish similar feats, wiping out Nubian or Sonaran forces with little losses. But the fact that the Americans suffered zero losses was worrying. To add to this, the presence of metal dragons suggested Mechanese influences. Perhaps the Mechanese were testing new weapons? They did outsource production to Sonaran forges, after all. Worst of all, this report corroborated the data sent by an observer from the battle in the North Grandin Plains. Emperor Vox walked over to a pedestal and retrieved an item placed on it. It was a recording device smuggled out of the Divinion Empire, called a magic screen. He fiddled around with the controls until the screen displayed a scene from the Nubian's point of view during the Battle of Fort Washington. It began with a recording of flashing lights erupting the distance while a cacophony of popping sounds filled the air. Although the quality of the video and audio were bad, 
Vox was grateful for what he had. He made a mental note to try to acquire better variants of this device from the Divinion Merchant Guilds. Eventually, the flashing lights in the distance ceased and a Nubian by the name of Colonel Novas Crowley the main force for a charge. The Eanish observer stayed back, not wanting to ruin a video by running. His decision to get a clear shot of the scene saved his life, as brilliant explosions popped up in front of the formation vaporizing thousands of warriors in one volley. Careful analysis of the video with the top scholars of the Imperium have all led to the same conclusion, because the attackers could not be seen, the explosions must have come from artillery miles away. The implications of this were disastrous. Sure, the Eanish armies could accomplish the same tasks, but being able to accurately hit enemies in the dark was something else entirely perhaps even something demonic. The video ended as the observer was surrounded by other worlder soldiers who aimed their rifles at him as others restrained him. Vox sighed. Why would the gods throw in such a curveball this far into his plans? Did they not wish to see a united Eanif? Did they not wish to see the inferior beast peoples wiped off the continent? He did not know what the gods could be thinking of now, but he realized that they had sent a clear message. His operations must be sped up. Chapter 19 Careful planning. Author's note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. Please join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw. The White House. June 13, 9 a.m. President Ryan Keener took a sip of his coffee, looking over some documents regarding the New World. A meeting was underway with the president and his cabinet discussing the potential implications of the portal to gay era, and their plans for the new world moving forward. The members of this meeting included the following, Secretary of Agriculture Alex Perdue, Attorney General Gabriel Carr, Director of the Central Intelligence Agency Samantha Gray, Secretary of Commerce Bernard Rose, Secretary of Defense Richard Lee, Secretary of Education Tyler Hernandez, Secretary of Energy Jane Ross, Administrator of the EPA Jarvis Nielsen, Secretary of Health and Human Services Grant Granger, Secretary of Homeland Security Nathaniel Fury, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Daniel Carson, Secretary of Labor Victor Reese, Secretary of State Alexander Madison, Secretary of Treasury James Hamilton, Press Secretary Lena Green, Vice President Mike Adams. All members present were very active in the discussion of the New World. Alex Perdue was interested in the new crop and livestock that the other world had to offer, Lee, Hernandez, and Ross were interested in the mana gems, and all were excited to open up new trade channels in the new world. The abundance of resources would solve many issues present today, such as the depletion of fossil fuel supplies and the monopoly that China has over certain rare metals. Despite these treasures, the United Stars still had a glaring issue. How would foreign affairs work out in such a situation? Every country in the world would want access to the riches beyond the portal, and the United States would not be able to keep it a secret forever. Eventually, we will have information leaks. Madison flipped to the next slide in the presentation, gesturing. He emphasized, we need to release information before September at the latest. What you see here are plans to raid Area 51 this September. With the event known to millions, at least some will come and we absolutely cannot risk any conflict with civilians. Even beside this, we still have the issue of spy satellites catching a glimpse of the dome around the portal, and there's even a possibility of our own soldiers saying a bit too much. As the Secretary of State, it was Alexander Madison's job to manage relations between the United States and other countries, essentially acting as the chief foreign affairs advisor. If the U.S. kept the portal a secret and other nations found out on their own, then relations between those countries would deteriorate. Even U.S. allies would begin to lose trust. Yes, I agree with Alexander's worries, voiced Vice President Adams. We need to carefully coordinate our press releases. There is also the issue of Congress. Though not official, our war against the Nubians would require oversight from Congress. If we were to continue our efforts and perhaps even secure land or economic rights in gay era, Congress would need to know about the details. Well, good thing there ain't any laws about portals and aliens from the UN. Attorney General Carr added, the president pondered the situation for a bit. Alexander and Mike both have very good points, and I am supposing that nations like Russia and China would be the most outspoken against our endeavors. Especially China, 
seeing that we've got access to resources and cheap labor on the other side. Let me think. We can release some basic information about the portal for now. We can have Lena and her team handle all the details. Right. So we want to release things like the data about the planet, the presence of a habitable atmosphere, and some properties about the portal. Lena asked. The president agreed alongside other members of the cabinet. Should we mention anything about sentient life or magic? This was certainly a tough question. Everyone present in the meeting looked at each other while President Keener placed his hand on his chin. In deep thought, the world would find out eventually, but would it be wise to give out such information now? UN member nations might see this as a reason to let them in, wanting to demonstrate a united front when greeting these aliens. However, Putting the focus on aliens rather than on the gold mine of resources that the United States has access to would grant more time for the U.S. to solidify its position on the other side of the portal. In order to mitigate the first worry of UN member nations, the U.S. can try to appease some of them, particularly those allied with the United States, in order to bring them closer to its sphere of influence. How about this? We can come clean to our allies about this and tell them about the resources we have access to and the presence of sentient life on the planet. Our official announcement will just have basic details, but talks with our allies will occur behind the scenes. We will give them some deals. We can grant access to scientific teams and in the future, companies and trade rights, in exchange for some economic concessions. President Keener looked to his left, seeing Secretary of Commerce Bernard Rose nodding his head. Bernard agreed. Expanding on President Keener's idea, we can ask our allies to bring tariffs down to our level. This has been an issue for a while now, with some of our European allies having unequal vehicle tariffs, which defeats the premise of free trade. Bringing our allies and some neutral countries closer will be excellent, especially considering some are already falling for Chinese influences. Of course, we would also have to present offers to our adversaries. Russia and China. It may even be possible to bring Russia into Western influences, if we present the right deal. I'm sure they'd prefer access to a whole new world full of wealth rather than invading Eastern European countries, Madison added. Okay, sounds good folks. I can already see my approval rate skyrocketing, ha <laughs> ha. Everyone laughed or smirked. If no one has anything else to add, then this meeting is hereby dismissed. As everyone got up from their chairs, President Keener suddenly put his hand up. Hold on, Alex, Grant, see what you guys can do about getting new livestock and crops into our farms. Make sure they're clear of any unknown diseases and parasites. Upon receiving these orders, the two men nodded and exited the room. Bernard and Daniel, stay here please. Samantha, Richard, and Alexander, we will talk later about our newly acquired intel on the Nubian political situation. The room was vacated except for the president himself, the vice president, the secretary of commerce, and the secretary of housing and urban development. The president wanted to discuss with them about the new economic options available to them. President Keener then clicked a button on a remote, activating a screen which displayed the figure of Ambassador Perry. With regards to Perry's connection, it was just fine as he was transferred to Area 51 for this conference call. The scientists were still working on wireless communication through the portal. All right, can everyone see and hear me? Perry asked. Loud and clear, Mike confirmed. All right, now let's get down to business. We want to establish a town near the base for the purpose of cultural exchanges. I hear the PX is already set up? Keener asked. It is. Mr. President, some local merchants have already begun submitting orders for various merchandise. In particular, they seem to like our snack items, stationery, cleaning supplies, and cookware. Rose answered. He then stopped to look at a document on his desk, before continuing. We have also had reports of some locals wanting to set up shop, but we had to turn them away for now. We inform them that we are currently busy with construction and they are free to lease when construction is finished. Excellent. Daniel, you still okay with the current residential plans? Indeed I am, Mr. President. I'm thinking about partitioning a section of our territory in order to allow locals to build their own community. There may be a case of extreme culture shock if they were to fully integrate with modern infrastructure and communities. I'm willing to bet almost all of them have never seen a shower before. That is right. I'll let you sort out the details of this partition. 
but we also should leave some room in our own residential areas to accommodate any natives who wish to live with modern amenities. We may also want some learning centers to help natives learn about our customs, and perhaps also vice versa. Will do, Mr. President. Also, I've already contacted some major corporations regarding the new world. We can accommodate a lot of their stores, but I'll have to confirm with Bernard once the mall and department stores are finished. Okay. Finalize those reports and get back to me. Very, about the Nubian Prince, when will you be available? I have to relay a message to King Celia's and handle Nubian negotiations, but I should be free around this time tomorrow. Excellent. I'll set up the meeting with the others. Oh and try to schedule a tour for the Sonarans. I hear that they want to visit the United States before formalizing our deals. We haven't yet released information about sentient aliens to the public yet, so hold off on the tour until at least July. Maybe an independent state tour would be fun? Right away, Mr. President. The group continued to discuss economic and residential matters regarding gay era hoping to develop plans to secure exclusive economic rights on the other side of the portal before opening it up to America's allies. U.S. Embassy, Sonris. Month 6, Day 13. Foreign Affairs Advisor Leah Sindes was reading a book from her office in the American Embassy. The book was one that caught her eye as she inspected the shelves. It was a history of World War I. At first, she was skeptical since global wars were on such a massive scale that they couldn't possibly be carried out with the exception of the war against the Axon Empire. As she continued to read, she realized that it wasn't truly a global war that spanned all nations, it was just a war between the most powerful of nations. Still, this did not take away from the shock as she saw the death toll. At almost 20 million, half were military personnel and the other half were civilians. Civilians? She remembered that word from her conversation with Perry earlier, he described the word to her as non-combatant villagers. Ten million innocent people perished in this war. Sindas wondered what that would be like for her own people. Her country's entire population would be wiped out in such a conflict. Well, it was a good thing she secured a military alliance with Barry. Suddenly, the phone in her office rang, startling her. Remembering her training from Perry, she picked up the phone and answered the call. Hello? Foreign Affairs Advisor Sindas speaking. Miss Sindas, I have an urgent message that you must relay to King Celia's. Perry then described details regarding a possible coup against the Nubian Emperor and Nubian plans in the South Grandin Plains. Sindas sighed. She was glad that there was a possibility of ending the war, but upset at the news of a potential attack in the South Grandin Plains. This area was home to the Ovine Mountains where the Sonaran Federation mined most of their mithril lores. Without these resources, the Sonaran forges would collapse and their economy would crumble. Additionally, their Sonaran troops would need to rely on older weapons and gear with questionable durability, creating a major disadvantage for their war efforts. Hopefully, the Americans would come to their aid once more, although it wouldn't be likely. Signed as reason that the Americans assisted in the defense of Sophias because they had personnel there and thus needed to secure an extraction for them. Ford Sogath, on the other hand, has no Americans that require saving, and therefore has no reason to receive American aid. Thank you for letting me know, Ambassador. I will relay this information to His Highness. Okay. That's all I called for. Have. Signed is interrupted Perry before he could end the call, suddenly having an idea. Wait. Sorry. Is it possible for you to assist us in our defense of the South Grandin Plains? We need the Ovine Mountains for mithril lore, and most of the ore from our trade deal will come from this area, signed as explained, hoping an economic incentive would be sufficient to necessitate military aid. Ah, don't worry about that. As per our mutual defense treaty, we are obligated to help defend your country, should your people be attacked, signed as side. Relieved that the Americans would be so generous as to undertake such a responsibility. In her world, such alliances were rare, as kingdoms generally practiced isolationist policies, preferring not to get involved with the disputes of others. For the alliances that did exist though, allies would usually remain as neutral as possible, sending only equipment and supplies, unless the enemy was a mutual one. The Americans, from what she has gathered, don't see the Nubians as an enemy but rather a misunderstood force, considering that they were attacked because of similarities between the national flags of the United States and the Sonaran Federation. Thank you, Ambassador. We are in your debt, 
signed is expressed with great gratitude. Ha ha don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. Ah it's one of the many phrases in our culture. Essentially it means don't worry about it. Well, I've gotta go now. Have a good day Miss Sindus. Sindus said goodbye and the call ended. What an interesting man, she thought, smiling. Remembering Perry's message, she quickly used her magical communication device to inform King Celia's Fort Washington. General Harding had just finished giving his report to the president, and was now relaxing in his office enjoying his coffee. He sorted through some reports given by the scientists and engineers of the base. Apparently, they had just finished setting up three satellites. There was a lot of math in the report so he just skimmed past a lot of those sections, and went straight to the summaries and conclusions. What's this? Preliminary analysis of planetary properties, conducted before satellite launches revealed the diameter of type and planet gate air to be approximately 11,200 miles, about 1.4 times the diameter of Earth. Despite this larger size, no differences in gravity were detected. Gravitational acceleration on this world is more or less equal to that of Earth, at 9.81 meters per second squared. The surface area of this planet is over double that of Earth. What the fuck? None of this makes sense. I took enough physics back in high school and West Point to know this shit doesn't make any sense at all. Harding thought aloud. He read further into the report, reaching some conclusions about these findings. Because of the difference in size, this planet would have a different curvature and thus the programming of missiles would have to be adjusted, if they were to encounter any civilizations with radar capabilities. The satellites would also need additional partners. In order to cover the vast surface area this world had to offer, the satellite data noted in this report included pictures of the land masses and a hastily developed, but extremely accurate compared to medieval cartography techniques, map of the world. The central continents were displayed clearly, and covered about the same area as the continents of Earth. The poles were massive, with icy regions that were at least twice the size of Antarctica. On the other side of the world, several more continents were discovered separated by a vast ocean whose size dwarfed the Pacific Ocean back on Earth. Interesting. The diplomatic teams may want to use this data for cultural exchanges. He then set aside the scientific reports and viewed the reconnaissance pictures taken by the satellites. Nabian troops were beginning to conglomerate around the Avian River, which separates the North and South Grandin Plains. Their base of operations was a fortress known as Fort Knox, causing General Harding to smile. Amused at the coincidence, Fort Knox is about 200 miles away from Fort Sunil, which guarded the passageways into the Ovine Mountains. Factoring the primitive modes of transportation that the Nibians have available to them, he surmised that it would take three weeks for them to reach their objective. It might take two if the Nibians did not bring any artillery pieces, but seeing that their objective was a fortress, it would be suicidal to attack without artillery. With lumbering artillery that the Nibians have to haul, they could probably travel about 8 to 10 miles a day. In short, he and the Sonarans have ample time to prepare. Harding didn't want to massacre the enemy soldiers, they were humans too and many were probably in the army just to feed their families. He did not want a repeat of the Battle of Fort Washington, but if it came to it, he would prefer the obliteration of the Nibians rather than the loss of even a single American soldier. As such, he wanted to wait until the Nubians were far along into their march before acting. He planned to send airborne units to take key forts and industrial centers, in order to take advantage of the enemy's concentration of forces. By taking these locations, Perry would have a significant bargaining chip during his negotiations with the Nubian Emperor. If his negotiations failed, then Harding would need to coordinate a rescue operation for the prince and help impose a stage a coup. With these thoughts in mind, he began drafting plans and making calls to the Pentagon. Chapter 20, Manifest Destiny Authors note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. Please join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash and June 17th, 956 AM and we're gonna see a low of about 53, 57 in lower Manhattan. Back to you, Emma. Thank you John. Now for the highlight of the day, the president will be making an important announcement in just a few minutes, at 10 AM Eastern. Behind Emma, a beautiful brunette newscaster wearing a red dress 
was a view of the Washington Monument. Scores of people were crowded up between the monument and the Capitol, as if today was an inauguration day. Wow, that's an incredible crowd, said Emma as she turned to face the masses. Some may wonder, what's the occasion? Well, earlier last night someone from the White House leaked information about an announcement relating to aliens. In just two more minutes. We are going to find out just what our president has in store for us. The screen switched to a different view, an aerial view of the National Mall, for the next minute until the president finally came up to the podium placed in front of the Capitol. The view then switched to the president himself. Around the world, over a billion people were viewing this event, having heard the rumors spread all over the internet. With the focused eyes of his countrymen and those around the world trained on him, the president began to speak. Good morning, my fellow Americans, and greetings to all else around the world. Many of you are wondering why we're here today, and I assure you all, it won't be disappointing. Keener smiled, quickly glancing at his teleprompter. Taking a breath, he continued. Exactly one month ago, on May 17, the year of 2019, the United States accomplished a significant first in human history. A portal had spontaneously opened in the deserts of Nevada, and we sent brave pioneers and explorers into the wormhole. Keener took another breath, watching as the crowd became more tense, excited for his next words. That day in history will be remembered as the first time that humanity stepped foot on an alien planet. As American astronaut Neil Armstrong once said, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Applause erupted from the crowd as screens displayed pictures taken from the New World, named Gay Era. Of course, Keener's press teams selected pictures that displayed only the environment, wanting to keep the existence of aliens a secret for a little while longer. The crowd was stunned by the beautiful pictures of pristine mountains and plains, untouched by mankind. President Keener placed a hand up after a minute of applause signaling to the crowd to quiet down before continuing. At the moment, we are still studying the properties of this planet. We know that the planet is similar to Earth in terms of mass and gravitational acceleration, but is larger, boasting double the surface area of our planet. The pictures on the screens were replaced with satellite images of the continents. We are taking every precaution with our exploration teams who are currently ensuring that this alien world is safe for humans to live in. Our scientists have put up satellites in orbit in order to assist them in their studies. Soon, we will open up this new world to the public, and to the rest of the world. This marks a new era of mankind, as we venture into the final frontier and claim our manifest destiny. Perfectly choreographed jets flew overhead, trailing a red, white, and blue smoke. The crowd went wild. Truly ecstatic from the president's epic speech. Fort Washington, month 6, day 17, 11 a.m. Captain Doniger and the rest of Alpha Team were currently being briefed by General Harding. They have been assigned an important mission, or rather quest, based on the details. Their job is to locate and secure ancient artifacts that can stabilize magical energies. Captain, I want you to take your team to a site known to the locals as the Amalan Ruins located in the Ovine Mountains. Apparently the entrance to the ruins have been sealed off, so I'll requisition an excavation team to go along with you. Check your packets for additional info. Get ready, you'll be heading out at 1300. Research teams on both sides of the portal had discovered that the portal was slowly dipping in opacity, becoming more and more transparent. While the reported 2% dip in opacity was not a big concern at the moment, it could spell disaster in the future if the portal was to disappear with Earth citizens trapped on the other side, or natives trapped on this side. The scientists studying the portal discovered that it was essentially an Einstein-Rosen bridge. Einstein-Rosen bridges are wormholes that have been theorized to exist popping into existence before disappearing almost immediately after appearing. Modern scientists think that a type of exotic matter is required to keep the wormholes open. This exotic matter has negative mass and hence, negative energy and negative pressure. Science lesson aside, this type of matter has been theoretical until now, as seen evidenced by the existence of a true wormhole, right in Area 51. Since magic was used to create the portal, Scientists on Earth theorize that magic was used to summon this exotic matter, or somehow imitate its effects. When questioned, Kalmethus revealed the truth about portal magic. Although it requires much energy to produce, portals are generally easily created, 
and many portals to many worlds once existed in the past. The species of this planet all arrived via these portals, with the exception of humans, who were already situated on the planet. None of these portals lasted long, though, at most, they lasted up to five years. That was, until a group of mages 500 years ago were able to find some ancient ruins that contained a circular gateway, with a large road leading to it. Hey, sounds like a stargate to me, joked Sergeant Alex Gutierrez. Stargate? asked Kelmethus, raising an eyebrow. Oh don't worry about that, Captain Henry Doniger informed, shooting Alex a glare. Please, continue with the story. Well, as I was saying, the mages who had first discovered it documented the layout of the chamber where the gateway was held. Kelmethus showed a scripture that he borrowed from a local academy. It depicted a sketch of the chamber, with clearly visible control terminals off to the side. Noticing these, Alpha Team became excited, discussing amongst themselves the possible implications of such a picture. Those look like computers. Very advanced ones at that. Nikita Tesla pointed out. Looks like a Star Trek ship bridge. Alan Oppenheimer muttered, I think we can use this to appeal to the general so that we may tag along with the others, he suggested towards Tesla and Darwin. I'll think about it, but that's not really my area of expertise, Lacey Darwin answered. After ending their conversation, the scientists asked Kelmethus to continue with the story. The mages analyzed the gateway, all failing to determine how to use it until they discovered a port on the side depicted in the scriptures. Some members of Alpha Team noted that it looked like a port that would be connected to an energy source, an assumption which Kelmethus confirmed. The mages then discovered a metallic object with a handle, and a circular chamber inside of it. Kelmethus then showed a depiction of this device to the Americans, who said it looked like a tokamak. Tokamak? Kelmethus inquired. It is a type of energy reactor, Oppenheimer answered reluctant to go into detail about fusion reactors. Yes, that makes sense. Anyway, the mages poked and prodded the device, until one had the bright idea of zapping it with lightning. Kelmethus surmised that the lightning symbol on the device had something to do with this idea. When the mages channeled lightning into the machine, it glowed, before becoming dormant shortly after. Eventually, these mages, while touching random things, somehow activated the device by pressing something that had a rune on it. The rune appeared to be a power symbol, based on its shape, which was comparable to those found on modern devices. The mages found a similar symbol on the gateway itself, and with both devices activated, machines that had lay dormant for eons began to come to life, glowing as they powered on. Not knowing how to operate the control terminals that had come to life, the mages simply summoned a portal inside the gateway. Unfortunately, the portal opened to a less than hospitable world. The mages who ventured into the portal discovered a wasteland filled with empty darkness, void of all life except for one species. These monstrosities were truly alien, and immediately charged after the mages, who were quickly torn apart. One, who was able to escape, buried the chamber along with himself in order to seal the horrors within and prevent them from ravaging the outside world. Some creatures escaped and came to be known as skitters. Imagine Zerg or Tyranids but with no hive mind and closer to Void born from League of Legends in terms of nature. Ever since this incident, all other ruins that contained gateways were sealed or blocked off in some way, and portal magic was forbidden. The Amelian ruins was one such site. Hence the requirement of an excavation team. Kelmethus reassured the Americans that this particular site would contain no aliens, pointing out that the original Skitter site was located in the Arahan Desert, secluded in the northeastern portion of Vienna. Having been debriefed, Alpha Team began to prepare for their mission. Ovine Mountains, 260 miles from Fort Washington, 7.32 p.m. Bro, my ass is so sore. Alex complained. Man. Why'd we have to crowd up in one car? Commands low on vehicles. They're sending out a lot of recon teams to help establish contact with some villages outside of Sonaran territory. Lucky them. I heard all they've got to do is mingle with the villagers, Doniger explained. PFFT. Sounds boring, sir. At least we get to go on a real fantasy quest. Ryan excitedly proclaimed. Doniger smirked. Well. It's not like the recon teams found any cat girls or anything. Hehe. <laughs> Ryan and Alex gasped, their eyes wide. Sir, 
Please don't play with my emotions like that, Ryan said incredulously. Maybe we'll get to go check out some villages once we're done here. Let's set up camp for the night. We begin our mission at 0900 tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. With the order given, Alpha team began setting up camp for themselves and the excavation team, while the excavation team prepared their equipment. Hey Kalmethis said Donager. Yes? What kind of threat do we need to worry about out here? Bandits? Monsters? Donager asked, thinking about various fantasy role-playing games. Bandits are always a threat. You need people to keep watch lest your throats get slit in your sleep. As for monsters, some feral goblins or other lesser monsters may show themselves, but given your weaponry, I do not think they will be an issue. Do monsters and bandits drop gold when we kill them? Alex asked enthusiastically. Sergeant, be realistic, Doniger said. Well, some monsters' materials may be worth their weight in gold. Wyvern scales make for excellent armor, and hogan tusks can be ground up for various purposes. Such items would sell for a lot, with many merchants more than willing to trade their goods for just one hogan tusk. Spider silk is also a very sought-after item. As for bandits, some may be carrying valuable weapons or looted goods. You might even come across different kinds of potions, Kelmethus explained. I certainly love acquiring myself some treasure. Jones smirked, happy that his treasure hunting days were supplemented by the vast opportunities available in this new world. That'll be good to know. We might want to bring back some of these items, so the nerds can analyze them. Donager suggested, especially those potions. The Biogym guys will be really interested in the medical applications of health potions and healing magic, Richard agreed. Indeed, Kelmethus said before biting into his meal. My, this food is quite delicious. What is this? Kelmethus questioned, surprised that such an excellent meal could come from a mere can. Spaghetti with meat sauce. The pasta is made from wheat and the sauce is tomato-based and includes small chunks of meat. Owens answered. Incredible, Kalmethis muttered. Sure is. Spaghetti is my favorite dish, Alex proclaimed. After finishing their meals, the members of Alpha Team worked on setting up a defensive perimeter for the next couple hours until the excavation team finished setting up their equipment. Weary of bandits and monsters, the Americans set up tripwires around their encampment as an early warning system. Claimers were also set up along with signs around the outer edges of the perimeter so that passing travelers would not accidentally activate the perimeter defenses. All right, excavation team is finished setting up. They're calling it a night. We should do the same. I'll take first watch, Doniger informed his team. Month 6, day 18, 1.43 a.m. PST. Hey wake up, Doniger whispered, shaking his teammates awake. All of the soldiers instantly became alert shaking off their drowsiness. The same happened with Jones, interestingly enough, but Doniger attributed it to Jones's past exploits as a special forces operative and an adventurer. Wah. Was going on? Kalmethus murmured. Someone activated the tripwires on the northeastern section of the camp, somewhere toward the base of the mountain. Get ready to fight, Doniger ordered as he helped Owens distribute equipment. Sir, I see movement in the area you just described. Eleven unknowns registering on the thermals, Owens informed. They're not moving like travelers, it looks like they're being as cautious as possible. Could be bandits, Alex added. We haven't confirmed hostile intent yet. They could be civilians trying not to wake any monsters in the forest, Doniger cautioned. I'll use the speaker system to warn them. After determining which wire led to the northeastern speaker, Doniger began talking into the corresponding device. Turn back now. You are trespassing on our camp. Watching through thermal and night vision sights, the combatants of Alpha Team saw the unknown group freeze once they heard the voice, frantically looking around for its source. After Doniger stopped talking, the unknown individuals began to move quickly toward the center of the camp. Sir. They're moving on us. Alex whispered. Orders? Owens asked. Well Doniger began before he was interrupted by an explosion in the distance followed by screams, it looks like two of them got their legs blown off by a claymore, and they're still coming towards us. All right squad, you're clear to engage. Weapons free. Light em up. Owens shouted. Don't hit the equipment. Someone from the excavation team yelled. Da -da 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 -da. The engagement was quick and brutal, lasting only a minute. The unknown hostile elements were mopped up by precise shooting from the American soldiers. As they walked to the bodies to identify them, 
the Americans found an insignia on each of the men they killed. Kelmethus, what is this? Doniger asked. Kelmethus walked over to Doniger, who was shining a flashlight on one of the bodies, holding up the clothing. Upon seeing it, he stepped back, his eyes wide. What's wrong? Sarah asked, worry visible on her face. These men, they belonged to the Bracton gang. Seeing the looks of confusion on his comrades' faces, he began explaining. The Bracton gang is a bandit group led by their leader, Amadil Bracton. He controls large swathes of territory past our southern borders, and his forces are large enough that he was able to seize our southern principalities from us. We eventually agreed to peace. Three years ago, we agreed to allow him and his forces safe passage through our lands, and in return, they would not raid our towns and villages. I know not why they have ventured this far past their territory, but I am afraid we have gained the ire of their leader. Donager sighed, damn. Let's report this to command. Sarah, tell them we were attacked by bandits and their leader might go to war because of all that treaty stuff. If possible, request for a surveillance drone and reinforcements. Some Apaches would do quite nicely if we were ever to be under attack. On it, sir. Command. This is Alpha Team. Okay everyone. Get some rest. Tomorrow's ah. Today's a big day. 10.13 a.m. The excavation team just finished their work, having cleared the rubble from the silvery blast door that guarded the base of the mountain. Holy shit, it's like Halo. Alex gasped. Now, I'm no anthropologist but even I can see that this is weighing too advanced for the civilizations we've encountered thus far, Oppenheimer remarked. Areas like this have been here since the dawn of our world. Even before the era of the Axon Empire, before the Divinions had built their first city. How interesting. Jones marveled at the architecture and design of the door. It resembled a blast door from a nuclear bunker inside a mountain, except it looked much more elegant. By the door, there was some sort of interface, upon which Jones placed his hand. Suddenly, the door began to open, two sides of the door retracting into their respective compartments, left and right as if they were sliding. The soldiers readied their rifles, unsure about the contents of this bunker. What did you just do? Doniger asked, analyzing for possible threats. A stern look on his face, Jones replied. I opened Pandora's box. Chapter 21, Site Beta 1 June 18, 1014 AM The groans of sliding metal ceased as the doorway was fully opened, a hallway inside illuminated only by the light of Sulla. Cold air rushed out of the chamber as the warmer atmosphere outside rushed in. The first visitors in perhaps millennia stood outside the doorway, almost all of them with their mouths agape, or displaying confusion in some manner. One, in particular, trembled more than the others. This man, an old wizard by the name of Kelmethus, expressed fear. You okay, Kelmethus? Doniger asked noticing the sweat trolling down the old wizard's forehead. Ah, of course, my good friend. It is merely that we sealed these ruins off for a reason. Kelmethus began to speak again, but Doniger cut him off. Don't worry about it. After all, you are the first man to dabble in the forbidden magics in centuries, when you created that portal to our world. Kelmethus, not knowing how to respond, merely nodded. Indeed. Snap. Everyone present turned to look at the source of this sound. It was Jones, who was taking pictures of the spectacle before them. In contrast to his other teammates, he was the only person smiling, in fact, he was grinning like a madman. Bro, what are you smelling about? We could have just been cursed by opening this gate. Alex pointed out. Ah, I wouldn't worry too much about that, son. Come on now, be excited. Jones enthusiastically said addressing his team members. This is the most astounding find that I have ever come across. Imagine the secrets this structure has to offer. Probably some flood type shit. Ryan muttered. All right cut the chatter. Our objective is to locate and retrieve artifacts that may be of use to us. This place has been abandoned by its original owners a long ass time ago, so we shouldn't be worrying about any curses. Sergeant Williams brings up a good point though. Keep your eyes peeled for any creepy crawlies that may have taken up residence here. The excavation team will be on standby, guarding the entrance. All right people, let's move. Alpha team moved into the mysterious chamber, their footsteps echoing off the walls of the structure the acoustic resonance of its architecture amplifying these sounds. Their flashlights turned on, members of the team inspected the silvery walls as they moved forward, marveling at the futuristic design of the building's infrastructure. Eventually, 
the team happened upon a smaller door with an interface similar to the one in front of the entrance. Jones placed his hand on it just like he did minutes ago. The door opened, revealing a chamber so large that the light from the Americans' devices could not even reach the end. Wow, this cavern is indeed massive, Kalmethis remarked. It sure is. If only we could somehow find a way to turn on the lights in this place. Tesla muttered. Hold on, the doorways must have been powered in order to receive a response from Jones. Unless they receive electricity from an internal battery unit, then that means the power is on. We just need to find the light switch, whatever that may look like, Oppenheimer deduced. And like this, Jones poked something on the wall, making it flash to life. Suddenly, lights around them began activating revealing a mostly empty room, aside from the building-sized circular gateway in the center and miscellaneous items lying about. The circular gateway was ancient, yet remained in pristine condition aside from the dust collecting on its surfaces. Suddenly, a radio crackled to life. See door read? The communication came from the excavation team outside. This is Alpha Lead Actual, Mountain is interfering with the comms, we can't read you, Doniger informed before he was interrupted by a loud slamming sound. Sir, that wasn't the door was it? Sarah asked. Aw shit bro we're trapped in here. Alex despaired. I spent many hours trapped in tombs and labyrinths during my adventures. It shouldn't be too hard to find a way out. Probably just some standard lockdown protocol. Jones was the only member of the team without worry on his face. What if we run out of air before then? Kelmethus asked. Hey, since they're so advanced, Maybe this place has those oxygen things that are on space stations. No need for a ventilation system if they've got those, suggested Ryan. True, but based on their technological achievements, one can surmise that the builders of this facility were race of science, and hence, efficient. A simple ventilation system that utilizes this planet's breathable atmosphere would be more efficient than installing an oxygen conversion unit. Tesla countered. As the members of Alpha Team discussed plans, Red lights began to glow, signifying an alarm. Intrusion detected in Section 4, initiating lockdown procedures. Damn it Jones, what the hell did you do? Owens hissed. Oh, he speaks. Well, I didn't do anything. Think about it. A good few minutes passed after I turned on the lights, before the alarm came on. It wouldn't make sense for the security of this facility to detect something so late especially considering their advanced technology. Wait, I remember seeing something outside, before we came in here. This isn't Section 4, Richard mentioned, confusion visible on his face. This is Section 1. If the sections are labeled based on their location, then Section 4 is deeper inside the facility. Sir, I don't like the vibe of this, man. Alex stated. Right. Any moment now some flood could come bursting out of the walls, Ryan said, looking at the various doorways that led to this chamber. Wait, Kalmethis interrupted, the voice spoke in your native language, I did not sense your communication buffs activate. The members of Alpha Team looked at Kalmethis in confusion before realization slowly dawned on them, the alert was given in English. Aliens speak English? Oppenheimer wondered. Homo magus sapiens. Jones muttered, as if he was lost in thought. What? Ancient humans built this place. Omnis told me that he was created by a precursor race of humans known as Homo magus sapiens. Why they speak English, he does not know. How interesting. Donager thought for a moment, distracted by the possible reasons why these precursor humans spoke English, before giving his orders. Brian, have your team stay here with the scientists and keep them safe. Got it, sir. Owens. Kalmethis, Jones, you're with me. We're going to investigate Section 4. What? Bring me to Section 2. Section 2 in such facilities are control centers. I can bring up the map of the facility. Greater than. Okay. Captain, my scepter wishes to visit Section 2. We can get a layout of this place. Okay, Jones. Lead the way. Receiving directions from Omnis. Jones navigated toward a different corridor where the entrance to Section 2 was located. There, he was given an override code by Omnis in order to open the door. Why did such an advanced civilization have manual controls? He wondered. He realized that it must have been for emergencies such as this, and pushed aside the thought. When prompted for the code, a holographic keyboard appeared, allowing Jones to input the code. When the door opened, the team reacted in surprise, 
Amazed by the devices that were scattered throughout the room, wheelchairs that looked extremely comfortable were gathered around a circular table that had a dome in the center, most likely a hologram projector, the three America S theorized. To the left was a set of tables and chairs, arranged for dining purposes. Behind these tables and chairs were some silvery machines placed on a counter, plates and other dishware and cabinets below. Huh. They look an awful lot like Star Trek replicators don't they? Donager muttered, rubbing his short beard while his other hand held his rifle. Owens, who preferred not to speak much, simply nodded in agreement, his eyes scanning for any lurking threats. That device to your right, yes that one. Bring me to it. Greater than. Heating Omnis Command, Jones walked over to a box-shaped device. With Omnis now in close proximity to it, he began to glow in a particular pattern. Considering the pattern that the device was also displaying, Jones and his teammates all deduced that Omnis establishes some sort of wireless connection to the device, similar to how Bluetooth pairing works. Surely Tesla and Oppenheimer would be ecstatic about this, seeing an artificial intelligence interface with another network. After a minute, Omnis stopped his communication with the device. I have completed downloads of this facility's data. You can now use your projection ability to show the map. It will appear in front of you as a hologram. Greater than. Testing his ability out, Jones projected a three-dimensional holographic map of the facility, denoted as Site Beta 1. With a mental command, Section 4 became highlighted in yellow contrasting it from the blue light that formed the rest of the hologram. Their current floor was magnified, hiding the additional floors above and below. A red line marks directions for Jones's party. With the path clear, the party of four continued their mission. While walking, Jones studied the map, ignoring the blaring sirens going off around him. Section 3 was apparently an armory, so he let Donager know. Interested in seeing some advanced weaponry. Donager allowed a quick detour to the armory. Once they arrived at the armory, Jones opened the door using an access code provided by Omnis. Section 3 more closely resembled a hangar, with empty vehicle bays. Calmethus, experiencing an even more potent culture shock, remained silent, closely following the other members of the team. Jones, on the other hand, was excited to be exploring such mysterious ruins, or rather, sites. Considering that the facilities were merely abandoned, where would the firearms be kept? Donager asked Jones, pointing. Jones replied, probably in one of these smaller rooms. There were a dozen other doors in this section of the building, and the team split up in groups of two to search the rooms. Kalmethus went with Owens to search the left side of the chamber, while Jones went with Donager to search the right side. Some of the rooms appeared to be offices, used for meetings. Only four of the other rooms were armories and two of these were empty aside from random pieces of unidentifiable equipment. Of the two that weren't empty, one had a stash of what appeared to be explosives, while the other had a small stash of sleek-looking guns. The sleek-looking guns were comfortable to hold, weighed little, but had no visible magazine compartment. Donager picked up a large rifle, most likely for anti-material or sniping purposes, and analyzed it. Engravings on the weapon identified it as an N109. It was not a bolt-action rifle, and had two circles on the side of the weapon with etchings on each and sticks in the centers. The first circle had etchings for semi-automatic and fully automatic, while the second circle had number values, counting from 0 to 100 with increments of 10. Interesting, Donager thought. He placed the weapon down and picked up what looked like a sidearm. It looked quite small, especially around the grip, but when he picked it up, the grip molded into his bomb, adjusting itself for maximum comfort. As this happened, Donager initially became surprised, before smiling, impressed at the technological feat displayed. Viewing the engravings on the weapon, he identified it as an N25. The sidearm had only one circle, depicting the power output of the weapon, from 0 to 100%. Currently, the stick was moved down below zero. He assumed that this acted as the gun's safety mechanism. Hey Jones, take this. Donager gave Jones his standard issue sidearm, the M9 Beretta. Jones accepted, placing it in his empty holster, as Donager took the futuristic sidearm from the armory and stowed it in his own holster. Owens did the same with another N25. Scree e. An inhuman screech rang out, almost deafening Donager and his team. It came from the direction of Section 4 and appeared to be coming this way. Hey Jones, 
Section 3 is the armory. What's Section 4? Doniger asked. Section 4. Let's see here. Um, it is the... Jones's heart sunk, aghast at what he discovered. Spit it out, Jones. We don't have all day, Owens ordered. Section 4 is the biological research section. Shit. I told you there was gonna be some flood type shit. Quick, establish a perimeter. Use the entrance as a choke point, Ryan ordered. Sir, what if they get through the other doors? Alex asked. Well, I'm hoping that those other doors are still locked, and that whatever's out there doesn't know how to unlock it, Ryan replied. Sarah, what do the scientists see in the security office? Sir, they saw the captain's group booking it back here, and the holograms showing four hostiles trying to catch up to them. Do we know what the four hostiles look like? Just what are we facing here? It's too dark in that section of the facility. The lights were on there earlier, I think, but whatever happened knocked them out. We have to wait until the hostiles reach section 3 to identify them. All right, Alex, meet up with the captain's team and bring them back here. Yes, sir. Scree e shit. It's getting louder. Doniger managed in between huffs. Despite Kalmatha's speed magic, it appeared that whatever was behind them was gaining on them, almost halfway to Section 3 now, while they were still running to Section 2. All members of Doniger's team were sprinting as fast as they could, hoping to get to the rest of Alpha Team in time to fortify their position and engage the threat. They reached Section 2 in an additional minute, where they saw Sergeant Alex Gutierrez. Quickly. We need to hurry back to Section 1, he yelled. The five men were nearly back to Section 1 when they heard another petrifying screech. Hearts pounding and hair raised, they looked back to see four giant spiders rounding the corner, back where Section 2 was. These spiders were the size of horses, and were currently scuttling at ridiculous speeds toward the running humans. Holy hell, run. As they ran, they attempted to slow down the incoming beasts using weapons and magic. None wanted to sacrifice mobility for accuracy, so all personnel who had firearms sprayed behind them while running, hoping to get lucky. Jones and Kalmathus casted fireballs at the spiders and used wind magic to slow them down as much as possible. Scree ee -e. One of the spiders screeched in pain as bullets and fireballs made impact with its carapace. Recognizing the threat posed by the fleeing humans, the spiders began to weave and dodge, doing their best to avoid the projectiles launched at them. Two of the spiders began running along the walls, and one began running along the tall ceiling. Damn it, I'm out of bullets with this mag. I can't grab my spare mags. Owens yelled. Just run, Doniger ordered. Kalmethus began to lag behind the group, his old wizard bones not used to such strain. Seeing this. Doniger grabbed a flashbang from his utility belt and primed it. Kalmethus, I'm gonna blind them. Kalmethus had no time to reply as he saw the flashbang leave the captain's hands, landing somewhere behind him. Bang. The spiders slowed down, disoriented from the blinding concussive blast from the grenade, and taking advantage of this, Kalmethus created a flame wall in order to secure their escape. Almost there. Jones yelled as they were 100 meters from the door to section 1. In front of the doorway, he saw Sergeant Ryan Williams' group, their rifles ready. The five men running for their lives were sprinting at such a speed that they might have been able to compete in the Olympics, even with all the gear they were carrying. Just 10 seconds later, they covered a distance of 50 meters. Unfortunately, the flame wall dissipated, the spiders quickly rushing to close the 50 meter gap. However, the spiders encountered stiff resistance the moment the flame wall vanished with 7.62 mm rounds from Ryan's team penetrating their carapaces. They were able to cut down the rushing monsters, allowing Doniger's team to retreat safely. Just as Doniger's team reached them, though, additional spiders rounded the corner. This time, there were 12 of them. Now having regrouped, Alpha team began laying down coordinated fire upon the approaching spiders each only capable of sustaining about 10 rifle rounds to the main body before perishing with an ear-splitting cry. Aim for the face. Try to conserve ammo, we don't know how many more are out there. Tesla, get back to the security room and let us know how many are out here. Doniger gave his orders, reloading after gunning down two of the spiders. Kalmethus and Jones attacked the monsters with lightning instantly frying spiders with each blast. The spiders were eliminated just as Tesla returned. Green fluids splattered all over the walls of the hallway. Oh my, Tesla muttered, witnessing the carnage of battle. Remembering his duty, 
he informed Doniger of the situation. Captain, there are 20 more coming this way. Aside from these, there were no more hostiles according to this facility's computer. They'll be arriving shortly, they've just passed Section 3. Ammo count? Doniger asked. Two mags, sir. Three mags. Just my sidearm. I'm getting quite tired from all this spell casting. If only I was a tad bit younger. Alright. We kill as many as we can before retreating into Section 1. Then we figure it out from there. After everyone finished reloading their weapons and readjusting their gear, Kalmethus popped up saying that he had a way to kill all of the spiders. Jones, I have a plan, Kalmethus said. I've been working on a new spell, a beam of light that can incinerate those upon which it gazes. With your permission, Captain, I would like to try this. If Kalmethus and Jones succeeded, then Alpha Team would not have to worry about being trapped in Section 1. Unless they got lucky somehow, the only way out of this facility would be to eliminate the monsters. It was possible that the security system on site determined the spiders a threat, and thus initiated a lockdown. With the spiders dead, the lockdown would be lifted. Damn it. Okay, be quick, Doniger conceded. We need you to cover us while we charge our photonic magic. With this, Kalmethus and Jones began preparing their spell. Author's note, if you enjoy my story. Please remember to vote and or submit a rating. Please join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 22, New Opportunities Month 6, Day 18 1 11 p.m. There was silence, only the sounds of hearts beating and hard breathing could be heard by Alpha Team. Tired from their Olympic tear sprint, Doniger's party and Alex were given some water in order to recuperate. In less than two minutes, more spiders would round the corner from Section 2. Distance from here to the end of this hallway is about 150 meters. Assuming the spiders can travel twice as fast as us, then we will have about 30 seconds before the spiders reach our position. Maybe longer if we can harass them with stun grenades. Doniger trailed. Thinking about the situation, the 40mm underbarrel grenade launchers of their primary weapons generally have effective ranges of about 300 meters, if launched at a 45 degree angle. That would be impossible in this scenario because of the height of the ceiling, which was about 10 meters. His men would therefore be required to launch at lower angles, thus reducing the effective distance of the launcher. The maximum throwing distance of handheld grenades would be even shorter maybe at about 20 to 40 meters. Considering this, Doniger began formulating a plan. Owens, I remember you used to play baseball as a pitcher. How far can you throw? Sir, maybe around 30 meters on a good day. Okay. Everyone give your handheld grenades to Owens. Frags and stuns. Owens, you'll be using your rifle until the spiders get close enough for the grenades. Remember to conserve your bullets. Once the spiders round the corner, you're cleared to engage. Once they reach the third set of columns, they'll be about 90 meters from our position. At that point, I want everyone to switch to their grenade launchers. Make sure your angle is low so you don't hit the ceiling. Doniger paused, seeing confirmation from his team. Jones, Kel, progress on your spell? About 60 seconds, Kalmethus answered. Gotta be faster. We don't have much. Scree ee -e. Four red-eyed giant spiders rounded the corner and instantly fell as a hail of lead ripped them to shreds. D -d 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 Stagger your shots. We need continuous fire on these bastards. The professionally trained specialists coordinated their assault in such a way that at least one person was shooting at all times, providing cover fire for the rest to reload. The spiders, hindered by the corpses of their brethren, spent precious milliseconds navigating around and over the bodies providing ample time for Alpha Team to cut them down. The front lines of the spiders were decimated, but the Americans were starting to deplete the ammunition for their main weapons. Just as the spiders crossed the third set of columns, grenade launchers, 30 seconds, loud pops echoed throughout the chamber as Alpha Team rained down consistent fire upon the hideous crawlers, who died to every two blasts they were hit with. Unfortunately, the rangers only had one shot with their launchers, and thus were only able to kill three more of the spiders before having to switch to their sidearms. At this point eight spiders remained. Focus fire on the closest target. Doniger yelled as he pulled out his new N25 pistol, switching the power setting to 100%. Taking aim, he pulled the trigger, surprised that nothing happened after half a second. Luckily, 
he realized that it was charging up before he took aim again and allowed the charged bolt to annihilate the closest target. Blue plasma exploded as it came into contact with the beast, turning its exoskeleton into an oven as the spider heated up to unsustainable temperatures and burst open from the expanding fluids and gases within. The rest of his team looked at the burning husk of a spider before they quickly returned to their work. 10 seconds. The spiders were 30 meters away. Nine of them left. Alpha team would be cutting it extremely close. Owens, grenades. Concussive forces from his grenades slowed down the oncoming spiders, allowing the team to take down two more before they began to reorganize and resume their assault. Just as the spiders were 10 meters away, though, a yell rang throughout the hallway. Get down. Bzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
Mr. President, think of this region like the region controlled by the criminal huts in Star Wars. These bandits apparently became so powerful that the Sonarans were forced to sign some sort of treaty with them. But, with recent events, these bandits might consider the disappearance of one of their groups as an act of aggression from the Sonarans, since the fight occurred on Sonaran territory. Ambassador Perry is currently in talks with his Sonaran counterpart trying to get information on this group of criminals. So far, we know that they have an army numbering at most 200,000, and that they might start a war against the Sonarans. Should such an event occur, we won't be able to properly secure the facility. Another pause from President Keener intensified the tense feeling General Harding was overcome with. Why the hell did those bandits have to attack us out of nowhere? Harding thought. I see. Well General. I am giving you the authority to do whatever you need to do in order to secure that facility. You may request additional reinforcements from our bases in the Southwest Defense Complex, should you need them. Securing access to all of the advanced technology in that facility is a top priority, and the same goes for any other facilities you might find. Good luck General, I expect to see some results. The President ended the call, leaving General Harding alone in his office. He sighed frustrated that he now had to deal with two fronts and multiple operations. He decided that the plan to take key locations as a bargaining chip for Nabian negotiations would still commence, but he would need to clear out the bandits first. His original plan against the Nabians, codenamed Operation Upper Hand, was scheduled to be carried out on June 23, which gave him six more days, excluding today, to eliminate the bandit threat. Fortunately, Lady Sindas from the Sonaran Foreign Affairs Department reported that the bandits tend to use their entire army during engagements, as a show of force. Well, looks like it's time for some shock and awe. Somewhere in Meccan. Damir President, here is the report you asked for. Thank you. Dismissed. The assistant bowed before leaving the room. Now alone, President Duke Relius scanned the report, slightly displeased due to its extreme length of 69 pages. He read the title of the report known as the analysis of otherworld or presences, before flipping to the contents. The first section of the report detailed the portal in the North Grendon Plains, in the continent of Yenif. This section was split into multiple subsections, preceded by a short summary that described the circumstance that led to the appearance of the portal, all of the information obtained from the observer sent about a month ago. The first subsection focused on the general details about the otherworlders who came from this portal. They called themselves Americans, hailing from the United States of America. Evidently, they claimed to be the most powerful country on their world. Duke Relius stroked his elegant mustache, deep in thought. He then skimmed over the rest of the subsection glossing over the details about American demographics and items from their world. He would read these later, perhaps when he got up tomorrow morning. For now though, another subsection garnered his attention, the second one, which examined the technology of the Americans. Indeed, their capabilities piqued his interest. They were reported to have cars and planes, except with greater functionality than those of McKinney's design. That must mean that their scientific civilization, just like us. Duke Relius muttered to himself, a smile forming on his face from the excitement of encountering another magically inept society. He then read up on the examples provided by some observers and Sonaran witnesses. His good friend Celia's was given a telephone, much like the ones in Meccan. Others have witnessed seeing the American soldiers talking into handheld black boxes, seemingly holding conversations alongside giving and receiving orders. He thought about what this could have meant and what such a capability would imply about military coordination and commerce. These black boxes must be some sort of radio technology, he deduced, and apparently they were much more advanced than bulky Mechanese radios, which were large boxes about the size of a small luggage. The black boxes were distributed amongst all the soldiers, so their military at the very least was potentially extremely coordinated and effective. Other contraptions that caught his attention were those of American warplanes and tanks. McKinney's warplanes were a mixture of biplanes and monoplanes, with biplanes currently being phased out as more monoplanes were contracted. The best McKinney's monoplane could probably field a speed of about 380 miles per hour with a lot of theorized room for growth. The American planes were purportedly faster than sound, and had no propellers. They relied on a different method of propulsion that Mechanese engineers were just beginning to experiment with, 
jet engines. He also noted the swept wing design of the planes, muttering to himself, interesting. Aside from the jets, which could be used for quick strikes, the Z-Anish Otherworlders had rotary-winged aircraft, also in the early stages of experiment here in Meccan. They effectively filled the role of a flying tank, ripping apart enemy armor and troop formations. Speaking of tanks, the main battle tank of the Americans would be classified as a heavy tank by their standards. They were used in the so-called Battle of Fort Washington, but details of the tank's role in battle are hazy. The night obscured many details about it, and the only information that could be determined from observation was its accuracy at night. Then, he heard a knock on the door. Come in, President Ducrelius said, still studying the report. You requested my presence, Damier President? Ah, Diplomat Benaparius, yes. I commissioned this report here, he said, gesturing toward the large packet on his desk. Because of the stories I heard about the exploits of these Americans, did you know that the standard firearm for one of their soldiers is an automatic rifle? Our people are barely beginning to switch to automatic weapons, and even then some of these weapons are prone to failure and ineffective at longer ranges. This report here states that they can hit targets at a distance of up to 400 meters, even in nighttime with their standard rifle. That is indeed worrisome, Damier President, Diplomat Benaparius replied unsure what type of answer the president was expecting. Not if there are friends, Ducrelius noted, getting up from his desk. Seeing the look of realization on the diplomat's face, he continued, getting straight to the point. I need you to lead a diplomatic team to this. Fort Washington. You'll have a convoy ready for you once you land at our eastern colonies. What about the other visitors? What did they call themselves? They called themselves Erdens. Hailing from the planet of Erda. The Aurelian portal is a bit far from our jurisdiction, and seems to be closer to the Quad. I don't want to cause an international scuffle due to this. The ships they've sent through the portal in the Aurelian Ocean appear to be emitting radio waves, so we can just establish communication that way. Very wise, Damir President. Thank you. You'll be leaving by first light tomorrow morning. Dismissed. The diplomat bowed before exiting the room. Ducrelius returned to his desk and analyzed the second section of the packet, which detailed the Erdens and their capabilities. The Quad Republic had apparently opened up a portal, after seeing that it was possible thanks to Kelmetha's efforts in the North Grandin Plains. The reason why, he could only assume. The Quad Republic in recent years has been antagonistic toward its former allies, demanding more for its role as the guard against the Orc Horde. Their leaders probably felt like they weren't being rewarded enough, and thus sought to conquer new lands for the riches they were denied of. It seems that they grew too complacent after their victories against the orcs, and opened a portal with the intention of conquest. Their pride and greed led to their downfall, dealt in the form of thundering booms from floating steel fortresses. Two nations came through two different portals last month. One of them was the United States of America, hailing from Earth. The other, Ducrelius thought, also had an interesting name, The Eternal Reich. Authors note, if you enjoy my story, please remember to vote and or submit a rating. Please join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ps. I'm going to begin rewriting chapter 1, so chapter 23rd of may be delayed slightly. Chapter 23, Divide and Conquer. Month 6, Day 20, 1050 AM. General, it'll be an intensive psychological warfare operation, on a much larger scale than what we've done back in Nam against the Viet Cong or in the Philippines with those swaying superstitions. If we want to ensure that these criminals for lack of a better word did not attack the Sonarans or us, then we need to make them believe that resistance is futile. General Harding replied after a moment of silence allowing the gears to click and the plans to formulate before providing insight. Demonstrate a show of force. Let them know what will happen to them should they resist. Back them into a corner, but not too far in the sense that they'll become desperate and lash out. Instead, offer them salvation before it comes to that. Yes, that'll be good. What do you propose, Colonel? Colonel Sanders thought for a moment, a smile growing on his face as he responded. Preemptive strike. Sir, currently we know that about half of their total forces are gathering at a camp north of a city known as Chunum. We can let their army build up until they have reached their desired numbers, then strike. Unfortunately, 
This means we will have to abandon your goal to eliminate the threat within a week. We will have to requisition some more forces for this operation, sir. No need for that, Colonel. The President has given me full authority to neutralize the threat by any means necessary. I've already requisitioned two GBU-43B units for this mission alongside some white phosphorus munitions. I've been informed by the Sonarans on what these criminals have done to their people, and can do to ours should they remain a threat. The general had a dark look on his eyes before continuing. The security of Site Beta-1 is top priority for this assignment. You'll have access to two B-2 bombers, one B-52, and a squadron of fighters for escort. We will have a small battalion from the 75th Ranger Regiment on site as an additional precaution. Most of our forces will be busy participating in Operation Upper Hand, so you'll need to make do with what you have, Sanders. What about the negotiations? The negotiations have been cancelled, unfortunately for the Nubian Emperor. Understood, sir. I'll make sure they're deep fried before they even get near our guys on the ground. Thank you. Colonel. Dismissed. Colonel Sanders stood up from his seat and exited the room. After he left, General Harding heard a knock at the door. Come in, he said. Looking up, he saw the man who walked in, Captain Henry Doniger. General Harding, the captain said. Captain, what can I do for you today? Sir, I request permission to use the new weapon we found at Site Beta-1, the N-25, as my personal sidearm. And why should I give away such a valuable technological discovery? The captain, anticipating this question, maintained his expressionless face. For one, sir, the native wildlife of this planet are a force to be reckoned fault with, and given my most recent objectives, I find it to be imperative that I acquire the best equipment possible in order to protect our valuable scientific assets and to continue securing high-value assets for our country. Also, there were a lot of N25 units back at the site, I'm sure the nerds in the labs have enough to experiment with. I will make sure to submit my field test findings to them, he said. Generals Harding, satisfied with Captain Doniger's reasoning, smiled amusingly. Very well. Captain. But be warned, we still don't know how to reload that thing, nor do we know how to check its ammo or energy capacity. Noted, sir. Thank you. No, thank you, Captain, for helping discover this cache of equipment. Oh, and be sure to report to me tomorrow at 0800 hours for your team's debriefing. I've got a special assignment for your team. 2.43 PM. Here are the most recent satellite pictures we've taken. Sir, it seems that the Nibians are transferring some of their troops to a secure facility southwest of the city here, an intelligence officer said, pointing toward a city on a picture on the desk. Making a trail with his finger, he traced the troop movements caught from the satellite until his finger stopped near a dense forest. I see. What do you think, Sergeant? The man replied, unsure if his general was testing him. I think that the Nibians have a hidden base somewhere in the forest. Sir. And what do you think they have in this here hidden base? What is the purpose of this? Well, sir, I think it may be a fob or staging area for a surprise attack, given its proximity to the Sonaran city of Solsus. Acute observation. Let me know if you fellas find anything else, and be sure to coordinate with the Sonarans. So far, they're instructed to perform simultaneous attacks on the Nabian forts of Nilamir and Normanton once we commence Operation Upper Hand. Make sure their pride doesn't get in the way, their melee prowess will do us no good if they're right next to our targets. Of course, sir, the officer said before leaving the room. 3.23 PM, Doniger watched the target in the distance, aiming through the streamlined sights of a foreign weapon. Taking a breath, he shifted his stance and aligned the target with his sights. Pip pee pee. Doniger fired three shots on the lowest setting, meant for stunning targets. The blue bolts all landed on the center of the designated target, slightly charring its surface. Off to the side, men in white lab coats recorded the results. No recoil on the lower settings. Let's try moving it up a notch, he said to himself, turning the dial to 50% which the scientists determined was meant for lethal use. Pew pew. Two blue lights raced toward the target, each separated by a distinct delay, placing the fire rate for the 50% power option at 450 rounds per minute. Again, the bolts hit dead center. Doniger inspected his weapon, impressed at the advanced recoil control mechanisms built into the gun which, combined with his trained hand, had nearly perfect accuracy, 
even at longer ranges. The gun apparently was developed with a built-in rangefinder and an adjustable sight that zoomed appropriately in accordance with the distance of the target. Lastly, he tested out the maximum power option. The scientists who experimented with the weapon yesterday recorded an energy equivalent of a quarter of a ton of TNT when the bolt collided with the test object. The larger unknown rifles had maximum power levels in the tens of tons of TNT. With these considerations in mind, he pushed the target further back and ensured that he was using a steel target rather than a wooden one. He held his breath, then exhaled as he pulled the trigger. Once again, there was a slight delay as the weapon charged up, this time, Doniger was aware of this and thus maintained his aim. The crackle of thunder resonated throughout the firing range, piquing the curiosities of nearby people. Doniger looked ahead, a smile growing on his face. The weapon was capable of punching through three inches of solid steel and deforming a good portion of the steel target, melting the front of it. Some of Doniger's teammates were nearby testing their own weapons before the captain had even arrived, although they had since stopped to watch a demonstration of the advanced energy weapon. Seeing what happened to the steel target Ryan walked up to Doniger. Sure is a hell of a gun there, sir. You should know sir that most of us here on the base are jealous that you get to run around with one of those alien blasters. Well I'd say I'm a hell of a captain. Maybe in a few months you'll get one of your own blasters once R&D figures the stuff out. Hell. We haven't even explored the lower levels of a facility yet. There's a chance they'll find some more good stuff down there. Yeah, maybe, Ryan replied. Hey, why don't we go visit Jones? Here he's practicing his magic with Kelmethus. Having said that, Doniger turned his sidearm down to zero and stowed it away before gesturing toward the door. After you, Jones and Kelmethus were in the next room over practicing in a converted firing range. The rest of Alpha Team was there, with Tesla, Oppenheimer, and Darwin all eagerly watching the unfolding events. Darwin in particular had long ago relinquished her status as a field operative, and instead remained at the base in order to conduct laboratory experiments and tests. Over the past month, she spent most of her time at the base working on studying magic. She discovered that humans from Earth had a vestigial structure located in the brain that is apparently active amongst the people of Gay Era. It looks like Dr. Jones here found a way to activate this vestigial cerebral node. With the help of that staff, Darwin surmised. Hey, the staff has a name you know, his name is Omnis. Jones interrupted. Right, well anyway. These tests here alongside boosting his combat capabilities will help us analyze how magic works in the realms of physics and biology. Understanding this region of the brain can prove insightful into our knowledge of evolution, especially considering the things found in that advanced facility. English in a high-tech place like that, thousands of light years from Earth. I can't even begin to comprehend the implications of something like this. Well Darwin. Looks like humanity's been around far longer than we've ever thought, Tesla replied. Right, Doniger said. My head's all tangled up just thinking about that. Jones, you discover any new spells? Oh, I sure have. Thanks to our grasp of physics, I can basically combine spells and cast magic on a deeper level, like turning fireballs into plasma bolts, and generating EMPs and stuff. As Jones said this, he pointed a scepter at a nearby target which promptly became engulfed in burning plasma. Before the room became uncomfortably warm, Kelmethus put out the fire with some ice magic. Amused by the interaction, Doniger raised an eyebrow before asking, Think you'll be able to go on missions with us? I feel like the DARPA guys are gonna want you on site so they can. Experiment. Oh don't worry about that, I'm probably the best individual assets that anyone on Earth has access to. Top Brass wants me to participate in more missions, since I'm the most powerful weapon in our arsenal. Not counting nukes though, right? Oppenheimer interjected, well, for now, we are not including nuclear weapons in this comparison. However, we've tested the power output of Omnis and theoretically, let's just say Jones has potential. So far, the most powerful spell he has casted can create a blast equivalent to a hundred tons of TNT. This doesn't even include what he's capable of when he casts other types of spells. I theorize that his defensive shields could probably withstand an energy threshold similar to his offensive limit. As for summoning spells, environmental magic, and telepathic capabilities, 
We don't know yet what his limits are. It is hard to translate the abilities of a man in one type of magic to his ability in another. Each practice of magic requires different standards and environments of learning. Although I am considered a master wizard, there are still some magical subjects with which I falter, such as that of healing magic. It appears your friend is learning very quickly in the field of environmental magic, or as you may call it, physical magic due to its relation to physics. Of this type, the spells you've already encountered include explosive, reality distortion, and elemental, Kalmethis popped up. Additionally, I believe the teachers of the Divinion Empire may be of greater assistance. Their magical proficiency far surpasses mine, despite my title. A Sonaran Master Wizard has perhaps half the capabilities of a Divinion Holy Mage, their highest rank aside from their leader. Interesting. Well, I see you're teaching him well Master Kalmethis. I take it you're also experimenting with new spells? Doniger asked. Indeed I am. Captain Doniger, I'll be reporting my findings to the Sonaran Society of Magic soon. If I may, will it be possible to bring my students from my academy here to learn? Ah, deciding that is not part of my jurisdiction, but I'll forward your request to Ambassador Perry. You guys can probably have some sort of exchange program with some universities back in the U.S. Thank you very much, Captain. Now, if you'll excuse me, we must return to our lesson. Month 6. Day 21, 8 a.m. Ah, Captain Doniger, please take a seat. Nodding towards General Harding, Doniger sat at the empty seat by the door. Now that everyone is here, let us get on with this meeting. I know what you all are probably wondering. Who is this man? Harding asked, gesturing toward a man dressed in civilian clothing. He is Director Tempos, and he's the Nibian insider who provided us with the intel on Prince Lonad Novus, the imprisoned son of Emperor Novus. Tempos. If you can elaborate. Of course, General. Prince Lonad is the next in line for the Emperor's throne, but he's been imprisoned due to ideological differences between himself and the Emperor. Your CIA is very interested in breaking him out in order to install him as the new leader. Thus, your leader wishes you to seek the chained prince and free him from his prison. I have been working closely with loyalists and your intelligence officers to develop a plan. General, he said signaling that he was complete with his portion of the debriefing. Nodding his head, General Harding began, Alpha Team is to extract Prince Lonad from a dungeon located in the Nabian capital city of Nock. Sergeant Miller, the intelligence reports. Sergeant Miller from the intelligence department brought over pictures of the building that Alpha Team needed to infiltrate. Obviously, the civilians will have to sit this one out, but I'd like Dr. Jones and Master Kelmethus on the team. If possible, Jones and Kelmethus agreed and allowed General Harding to continue. We're going to be encountering enemy magic users based on intel provided by Director Tempos, and because of our limited knowledge on such matters, it is imperative that we fight back with our own magic. Stealth is a priority in this mission. The dungeon in which the prince is kept is incredibly near the royal barracks, so the enemy will be able to call for many reinforcements if they get the chance. Luna and Terra squads will be conducting other missions around the capital. Luna squad will rescue other political prisoners, while Terra squad will orchestrate several jailbreaks in order to overwhelm the guards with Enoch and so chaos. In the meantime, a contingent of our forces will engage the defenses along the walls luring the majority of the stationed army outside to defend. Sergeant Miller will inform you regarding the details, including enemy personnel count, layouts of the prison and city, and extraction point. Any questions? Yeah, Doniger popped up. Will we be getting any air support in the event that we get overrun by Nubians? Harding answered. We'll have one Apache from the army and one Viper from the USMC ready for your tasking. While you're not in need of them, They'll be providing support for the main force. Only call upon them if it is absolutely necessary. Lieutenant Colonel Keyes, call sign for the Apache is going to be Seeker 3 to 1, and for the Viper it'll be Firefly 1 to 1. My forces will secure the extraction site by the Nosh courtyard near the city's outer walls. Our objective is to hold the courtyard until the extraction is complete, but we will begin the assault at 0100 hours. 30 minutes after your team is dropped off at the designated LZ. I've made sure that the lieutenant colonel has enough firepower to ensure a complete victory over any Nabian forces they may encounter at the city, but it is your duty to ensure that the package is secured. Upon seeing several heads nod, 
The general continued, In two days we are going to have our first major offensive operation on an alien planet. I don't have to remind you all what's at stake here. The future of our country and perhaps the entirety of Earth will depend on what we do in this world, and we need to make damn sure that we make this planet safe for colonists. Am I clear? Sir yes sir. Author's note, if you enjoy my story. Please remember to vote and or submit a rating. Please join my Discord if you wish to discuss more about my story. HTTPS colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ntbnw Chapter 24, Operation Upper Hand Part 1 Nabian Capital City, Knock Month 6, Day 23, 12.30 a.m. A slight fluttering was the only sound that could be heard in the dead of night. Aside from occasional chatter and idle noise from within the city, half a mile from the outer walls, a UH-60 Black Hawk landed in a clearing, positioned conveniently behind dense foliage. The machine slowly descended as a carefully crafted wind barrier redirected the sound of the helicopter blades away from the city. As the Black Hawk touched down, the wall of wind dissipated and the occupants exited. Wow, that's a pretty neat trick. Doniger remarked as he checked his equipment. Kelmethus nodded at this, his action barely visible under the faint moonlight. I concur. How did you accomplish such a magical feat? Alpha team, geared up with dark, tactical equipment began their journey toward the wall, moving quickly and quietly. As they walked, Jones replied, Well, it's quite simple really. Oppenheimer and Tesla have been helping me combine magic and science. Omnis also helped out a lot. With his matrix brain powers, I basically just use the principles of sound waves. Sound needs a medium to travel through. So, I just make a vacuum in front of the chopper to make it quiet. But, I do have to make sure not to interfere with the rotors, since they're needed to create lift in order for the craft to fly. Shit, we could combine that with cloaking magic and incorporate it into our stealth tech. Maybe we can get the Comanche program back again, Ryan said his thoughts leading away from the task at hand. Cut the chatter, we're almost there, Doniger ordered. If General Nash truly believes an event is going to transpire tonight, then why is our section guarded so lightly? Guardsman Rana looked over to his fellow guard, slightly annoyed by this question. What do you mean? Must you ask so many questions? He scoffed, I grow weary of this pestilence. I mean nothing of it, I simply wish to know. Besides, conversation would be fruitful in staving away the desires of sleep. Speak no further of this. You're annoying. And anyway, you should feel no drowsiness during the night. We are Nubians. This is our domain. Nrano, you are too tense. It is not as if we will be experiencing an enemy attack at such an hour. After all, only we maintain such strategies. As you have said, the night is our domain. So relax. Enjoy an easy job in a conversation with one of your brothers in arms. Nerano loosened up a little, relaxing his muscles as he thought of a reply. Just as he was about to respond though, a gloved hand was suddenly placed over his mouth. Eyes wide, he looked over to his fellow guardsman, who was also under a similar attack. The attackers were dressed in all black, as if they were assassins from the Dark Shadow. Could they be rogue members from the organization? He did recall hearing a rumor of Director Tempo's disappearance and whispers of a coup attempt. Unfortunately for Nrano, his thoughts drifted as he became unconscious, his lungs unable to access the sustenance required due to an arm blocking his airways. Alpha Team silently crept up along the wall, finding the auxiliary gateway through which they were supposed to enter. Only two guards were stationed by this area and they were easily taken out by Doniger and Owens, who had snuck up on the unsuspecting guards. Wouldn't it have been easier to just slice their throats? Kelmethus whispered. Well yes, but they're just gate guards. Most likely their fathers or husbands who have taken up a job to support their families. Besides, they won't be able to get out of that room we just shoved them into. Come on, let's keep moving, Doniger answered. Emerging on the other side of the wall. Alpha Team began moving toward their designated target. The holding facility which housed Prince Lonad appeared to be heavily guarded, posing a significant challenge for Alpha Team's objective. Director Tempos never mentioned this many guards. Ryan said, Someone must have tipped off the Nabians, Owens deduced. How are we gonna get in? Alex asked. Kelmethus and Jones have been experimenting with cloaking magic. We thought something like this could happen so we prepared in advance. Remember? This is the first field test so we need to maintain our cover and remain hidden, 
as if we were conducting this operation normally, Doniger explained. Then, Jones and Kalmathus finished their incantations, rendering Alpha Team invisible, only detectable by their IFF tags which displayed each invisible member on the heads-up display present within their helmets. Wow! It was difficult to determine who spoke, since none of the team could see each other, but everyone recognized the voice as Sarah Hayes. The next voice that spoke was distinctly Doniger's. We don't know how long this spell will last so let's get moving. Try not to bump into anything. Holding Facility Dungeon. 12.55 AM. End of Block 1.